control the virus and save lives. Battling coronavirus. Stay inside. Stay inside. Live events can resume behind closed doors. We'll uncover the history and technology behind McLaren. We bring to life the impact car designers had on popular culture. And we'll be looking at some of the famous faces that have been here at Goodwood and the special connection this event has with ZZ Top's Billy Gibbons. What exactly it might be that makes cars and music uh, such uh, strange bedfellows. Lovely, dare I say it, your Saturday morning starts right here. Uh, so, guys, what do we think? What are, our, what are we looking forward to today? Uh, Mark, what are you up to? Well, we, um, Rory and I have done a little piece. They've, they've, they've measured our brains, can you believe it, when we're driving cars. So they're looking at stimulation, how aroused we are, how our, our Easy. attention span is. Very spans, aroused. Yes. <laughs> yes, so, and, and it was in a Porsche Taycan. It was in one of those. So um, I'm fascinating to find the findings on that. What? And also 72, uh, Jackie Stewart and Emerson Fittipaldi, a great rival they had, uh, the rivalry they had in 1972 for the Formula One World Championship. So we're looking forward to that. What's that rivalry like? Do you, when you're on the circuit and you're going through the year and like you're winning one and then your rival's winning another, is it something that the media and, and fans just kind of lap up or is it something, do you feel that too or like when, you, when you're going through it? No question about it. The fans definitely love it and the press crank it up where they can because they want that, the, the villains yeah. at play, right? You know, every Sunday tune in and find out who's going to fail and who's going to deliver. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I went through a little bit of that in my own career. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, but you, mate, that's what you want. You want, you know, I don't get excited, I don't know about you, mate, but I don't get excited going to, to get the groceries. Mm -hmm. you, you want to go out there and do something that's going to push you beyond your limits and push the boundaries and learn more about yourself. So when you go at that level of the excellence of your own professional career, I enjoyed it. Uh, but the press, you know, well, they're yeah. always going to hype it up, but yeah. I always. But then when they do, I mean, I'm a sucker because when they do, I'm the one going. <laughs> I really want to see the Grand Prix this weekend because <laughs> I know there's going to be a little bit of, you know, I know there's a little bit of niggle and, and absolutely, you know, and you always want to see a race. You don't know who's going to win. You need that. You yeah. need that little bit of tension, of course, because uh, and you want the fireworks. So yeah. we, we 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 have that often, and we're going to touch on some of that today with some of the great rivalries. Right, Rory, what are you up to today? I'm going to be hanging out with a shiny stuff, mate. So it's what, you're, you're, it's what you do every day. <laughs> it's an obvious question, an obvious answer. So I'm going to be in a supercar paddock, um, checking out, you know, all the all the greatest and latest cars. One of the kind of common questions when you're a petrol head amongst your mates is, what's your ideal three car garage? And that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to walk around and pick my top three cars that I think will fit every single category. So you got to have a car for. I don't know, showing off, mm -hmm. one for the family. Mark says he doesn't like, you know, driving to the, to the shops because it's boring, but there are some cars out there that yeah. I guarantee will put a smile on your face. Convertibles, mate? Why you like convertibles? Grocery. You've got to have a convertible in the, in the garage, absolutely. So hang on, let me talk you through the garage. The garage uh, that sounds like four, mate, didn't it? Yeah, the, the garage kind of dinner party <laughs> guest date. So you've got to have a family car. Yep, yep, uh, probably an SUV. You've got to have a drop top. And yep. then you've got to have something that you can just take out on a, on a, on a wild B road somewhere and just have fun. But so, that's not the drop top. No, no, I mean, it can be, but it, horses for courses. So we'll, we'll see, we'll see. I'm gonna, I'll probably, it might end up being six cars, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I take it this is a conversation you have with yourself on a daily basis as well. You know, if, you, if, you, if you see my Instagram, then yeah, it changes. I did, I followed you yesterday. I was like, this is what he does every day. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, you, I'm quite jealous of you because you're, uh, you're looking back at Land, uh, Range Rover today. Range Rover, yeah, 50th birthday. 50th I'm birth. hoping someone's got him a cake, I don't know. I don't know if anyone's sorted that out, but it's gonna be a good day. Also, Smith and Sniff, Johnny and Richard, they've been let loose in the Bonhams car auction. And I think that's going to be quite a lot of fun today, watching what they go up to, because uh, there's some very expensive cars in there. Yeah. Who's bidding on them? I do not know. Amazing. I think, just going back to the Range Rover, though, I think for me, I, one of the things I love about Goodwood is you're driving here on some country road, 
and you know you, there's beautiful South Downs, and then uh, you, out, you'll turn a corner, and then suddenly 50 of a certain car <laughs> will be coming towards you. Apropos of nothing, you're like, well, hang on, it's Wednesday. <laughs> like, what are you even doing here? And the other day it was Range Rovers. I turned a corner, and suddenly 50 Range Rovers are coming towards me. Um, there's a real nostalgia towards those old Range Rovers, right, guys? There is, mate. It wasn't the Queen, was it? Oh, she definitely had a few, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there is. They're going for a fortune now, aren't they? Those little uh, little short wheelbase ranges that they, yeah. that they love. Um, I know there's a couple of really good examples down in Australia, and I've got buddies that have them. And, they, and yeah, they go for big coin now. So There's a, there's a couple um, of yeah. armoured ones as well, totally armoured. And there's a rolling chassis, which is just the shell of the Range Rover, and a seat and a steering wheel, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact they've taken everything out and everyone's like, that's the one I want. <laughs> the one with nothing in it. That's the one I want. All right, thank you, guys. Great day in Prospect. Uh, before we accelerate into it, here's the voice of Goodwood, Nimi, with a look back at the very beginnings of motoring and the democratization of the mass mo uh, mobilization that the cars have brought to the world. The countdown had reached its zero climax. In the story of humankind, we have passed many life-changing landmarks. but nothing has altered the face of the world as significantly as this, the car. I am a car. I am more than a machine on four wheels. I become part of your life. I share your working days and your leisure hours. I am your home on wheels. For centuries, human mobility moved at a pedestrian pace or a trot. All were quite slow and had other shortcomings. Early cars were slow too and not very dependable. It said drivers of broken down cars would be taunted with cries of, get a horse. To change the world, the car needed to become accessible and that meant becoming affordable. Enter this man, Henry Ford, and the brilliant idea he got from this. Meat. Ford studied the efficient workings of the Chicago meatpacking industry and realized that he could bring similar thinking to car making by introducing a moving production line in 1913. As a result, his existing Model T of 1908 could be made quickly, consistently, and most importantly, cheaply the mobilization of the masses had begun. Ford's idea was good, but it earned him some admirers who were not. Adolf Hitler saw the car as something that could cross and unite social boundaries. So he came up with a people's car for Germany, the KDF Wagen, which, despite its origins, emerged post-war as the popular VW Beetle. But the Beetle wasn't the only people's car of the 20th century. In France, André Citroën improved life for rural folk with the simple 2CV. In Italy, Dante Giacosa created the Fiat 500, a car packed with clever ideas to make it truly affordable, such as a big sunroof, not as a luxury feature, but because canvas was cheaper than steel. In Britain, the Mini was designed to cram as many people into a tiny space as possible, to save on petrol and spare ordinary people cold, wet commutes. No wonder that in a decade from 1951, car ownership in the UK rose by 250% as the car became an object of the people. And once that happened, it became part of the fabric of life. Now more people could reach the suburbs, and now the houses there started to look different as they sprouted motor houses, or as we now call them, garages. Because of the mobility options that the car gave to millions, entire towns and cities sprung up and connected by new roads, people had the freedom to find jobs and enjoy leisure time further afield. Of course, not everything that mass car ownership has brought us is good, but we remain enthralled with the romance of the road, its promise of a world of adventure and possibilities, of independent travel, of speed and freedom. And for the moment, one thing is clear. The car was, is, and will continue to be the most democratized mobility solution 
humankind has created. That was great. Um, and just, I guess, look, we've all got our relationships with, uh, with cars and the reason why we love them. Let's go back and just look. I mean, I want to look at sort of just a quick chat about, you know, where your first love of automobiles came from, be it movies, car stunts, the road trips you've been on and, and, and music. First of all, yours, Rory, what? Uh, do you know what? Back in the day when I was like, when I just got my driver's license, I was the only one in my friendship group who had a car. Yeah. I, Designated I, driver, that's a yeah, killer. Exactly, and it made me so popular. Yeah. It was brilliant. Literally everybody was my friend. I, I think they were my friend anyway, I, but, but I was very popular. And it meant that I was just co college, um, to the cinema. What are you driving? What was the first? What was I, the first I, had, I had three. So I had, my first car was a Ford Fiesta. Yeah. In, um, in Rust, finished in Rust, mostly Lovely. Rust and yeah. in a bit of blue. Um, I also had a Yugo, terrible car, but <laughs> modified. Uh, and I had two Vauxhall Astras, the GTE 16 valve and the GTE 8 valve. And they all broke down at different times. Mm -hmm. So I always had a car that worked. Three that didn't, and then one that worked. Well, you owned four at the same time. They were all terrible. No, don't, that, that wasn't like p big pimping. They were just, <laughs> they were all like horrible, <laughs> horrible things. But it meant that I was always able to go on road trips and pick up my friends and hang out with people. Yeah. And that's the thing with a car, like it gives you freedom. That's where the to, love, to, that's where the love came from. Absolutely. What yeah. about popular culture for you? What are your, what are your, your foot of early signposts? So, um, uh, I don't know, man. M movies are always a big thing for me. So like gone in 60 seconds, all those classics, um, Italian job, yeah. Um, but also just posters on my wall. I was a big Max Power reader back in the uh -huh. day, so like magazines were a huge part of that as well. Picking up a magazine and seeing what people were doing, modifying their cars, and also giving me inspiration for what I wanted to do with my cars as yeah. well. So yeah, mags and, um, and movies. Mark, we always talk about the great American road trip, but I imagine in Australia, cars are just they're such a fabric of society because they have to be because you have to drive four hours to see your friends. You know, the, for us it would be a trip around the corner, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that, with that comes a lot of mysticism and obviously the, you know, the infamous Holden brand. And so yeah. where did where'd the love come from for you? Wait, for me, I actually started on two wheels uh -huh. originally because my dad had a motorbike shop, but we had a small farm and small farms in Australia are quite big. So this is, it's not an estate like here, mate, which is yeah. pretty swanky as we know. Yeah. But the farms in Australia are a bit more rugged and robust. So I was lucky enough to drive utes and, and commodores and old valiants on oh, the property know, flat out you know doing you know drifts and dad say there's a jerry can son look after yourself and i'll be back and i'll come back <laughs> which was absolutely amazing it was extraordinary i still talk to him now and say dad are you totally bonkers me do this? <laughs> i could hardly see over the steering wheel then we chopped some wood and put that on the back of the ute and i'd drive back and i remember how light the steering was because the ute was like this yeah so it was all that stuff that i just learned which i which I didn't realize how fortunate I was to have that exposure at such a young age, which was cool. And another quick story was I grew up in a place called Canberra, which is extremely on the, on the, on the east side and on the west is Perth. Mm -hmm. And when I raced Formula Ford, we drove the, with the trailer on the back of the car, which is 58 hours one way. And I was illegal. I couldn't drive with a trailer on the back. So dad would sleep. I was driving, hitting the odd emu, hitting the odd kangaroo. <laughs> and how are you going, son? Not too bad, dad. I'm absolutely bricking it here. But, Dad's uh, a legend. Yeah, so great memories. Yeah. Great memories. Sean? Oh, uh, I remember being embarrassed. My mum had a, a Reliant Robin and a three-wheeler. And I was like going to school in it. Wow, that down. was you. Yeah, <laughs> that was so embarrassing. One in every school. Like, like, yeah, yeah, that was me hiding. Um, and then, so I couldn't wait to get my own car. I had a Citroen Saxo. I remember there was an electric problem with it, so you could either have the headlights on or the radio, but not both. Not both. So sometimes I made the wrong choice, That's not going to lie. For me, my parents got me a, a garage, a Matchbox garage when I was five years old. And I can't remember if it was my birthday or Christmas. And it's still to this day the best present anyone's ever bought me. It was yeah. just, it was, I, 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 my mum and dad still say I would just while away hours upon hours of playing with my cars. And then I grew up kind of late 70s, early 80s. So, so many of the TV shows I'm watching and the American shows come, which is why I fell in love with muscle cars, because I'm watching like the Rockford Files and it's like driving like a Trans Am <laughs> or something. And uh, you're Dukes just hazard, mate. Exactly. Dukes you're just mesmerized <laughs> by all this stuff. And that's where, I mean, it's, it, it's so ingrained, isn't it? On, on, on all generations, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, cars and music share a long history. In fact, the first car radios date back to 1930 when they were rocking out to the likes of a little kiss each morning by the Guy, Guy Lombard Orchestra. Snazzy stuff. <laughs> uh, nowadays, fast cars and rock and roll are great bedfellows and never more than this guy, Billy Gibbons, the lead singer of ZZ Top. <laughs> A 
think I must have been about five years old, and uh, I, I would I had taken a drive into into the city with my dad, and on the way back, uh, there was a uh, a small side street, and uh, he kind of put me in his lap and uh, let me grab a hold of the wheel, and uh, my. <laughs> He was operating the pedals. I was just doing the steering, and, and that that pretty much started it off. <laughs> well, there was several. Uh, one of the favorite ones came from a Saturday morning uh, a television uh, show called Jungle Theater, in which the Tarzan series films were shown on Saturday morning, and the program was actually. Uh, advertised by a local car dealer. Uh, he had been run out of California and wound up in Texas, but uh, he was not to be uh, ignored. Uh, at an unannounced portion of the film, he would break in and uh, the camera would swing to the, the what, what he called the Westheimer special. And uh, the, uh, the first five individuals that got to race over to the car lot were allowed to put a number in the hat and uh, there were it was limited to 10 people and uh, when the winning number was pulled uh, well lo and behold one saturday morning we wound up with a 1954 packard clipper <laughs> amazing uh, complete with sawdust in the transmission no back window no hubcaps no exhaust <laughs> and uh off we went. It was uh, it was straight to the Mexican border. I was quite, yeah. quite fond of that particular trip. It was the release of that record that allowed ZZ Top to gain attention throughout the world, and it also uh, forever married us with our love of, of the automobile, particularly uh, the Little Red Thirty Four Three Window Coupe, which. Uh, became dubbed as the Eliminator Coupe. And it's, it's, been, uh, it's been straight ahead since then. That's 38 years ago. And uh, it was funny, the, uh, the beginning of that project, that car project actually started five years earlier, 1976. And uh, we waited patiently. We, ju we just wanted a hot rod and uh, we thought, okay, well, this won't take long. Well, five long years later, uh, it finally came to fruition. And I believe uh, if someone were to step forward and peel the onion for us and just reveal what exactly it might be that makes cars and music uh, such uh, strange bedfellows. They have been, they've been together since the invention of rock and roll. Uh, Rocket 88, Maybelline, I mean, going back from the early 50s till the present day. It's fascinating. Well, I look forward to uh, joining you in this uh, forward vision. Uh, sooner or later, uh, we can't wait to see uh, the Goodwood Festival of Speed uh, uh, lift the curtain and we'll, uh, we'll have a big old time and just keep, dry, keep your pedal to the metal. <laughs>Good on you, Billy. Come on, the ZZ. Uh, okay, there's a brand new Aston Martin out, the DBX. It's the first foray into the world of the SUV, the mysterious world of the SUV. So we sent Becky Evans to put it through its paces. One of the amazing cars being showcased here at Goodwood Speed Week is this, the Aston Martin DBX. Now, when the producers asked me to review the latest Aston Martin, this was not quite what I had in mind. The DBX is the brand's first foray into the luxury SUV market. Now the car has to be comfortable, sporty, and it's got to be able to go off-road. She has some big shoes to fill. The first thing that you notice about the car is this, the unmistakable five-veined grille modeled after the DB11s, except this one is the biggest that they've ever produced. Just like the badge, biggest ever. The styling cues are familiar all the way down the side of the car. And then we get to the rear where it has this ducktail rear spoiler, which is very much like the Vantage. Finally, coming down to the doors, beautifully frameless, just like the sports cars, except now they have this clever technology that they are wrap around. So when you take the car out off-roading, you don't get mud on the back of your legs. 
Speaking of off-roading, the producers asked me to put this car to the test earlier in the week. OK, let's go. For a big car, it certainly moves fast. It's now that we can really start to appreciate all of the anti-roll technology that Aston's engineers have come up with with the DBX. The ride is firm and stable, but still very comfortable, giving you loads of confidence behind the wheel. That roaring V8 really comes alive when it's not shackled by speed limits. Coming into Molkham now, flat up the hill, Coming up here through the pheasant trees, round by the flint wall. Watch out, Mr. Pheasant, coming in quick. The four-wheel drive technology really allows the car to grip on and handle through the corners without getting that body roll experience that you sometimes can get. Flat all the way down to the end. So that was the climb course. The DBX had no problem whatsoever. But let's see how it tackles the rally course now. Looking it into terrain plus. You can feel the suspension change and let's see how she gets on with this. You have so much power under your right foot. Oh, she's getting a little bit loose. It's a car that makes you feel like you can drive it anywhere and I think that's the beauty of the DBX. It doesn't feel like any terrain is too hard for it to tackle. Loads of grip. It's actually really fun. It, it, it shouldn't feel like you're driving a rally car when you're in a big, expensive SUV. But that's exactly how it feels right now. It's playful. I think that's one of the beauties of this. Well, I have had a great day putting the DBX through its paces. The producers asked me if it could go on the hill climb and the rally course, and I think we've definitely proved that. It's a car that really does what it says on the tin. It's spacious, luxurious, comfortable, and best of all, it doesn't lose any of that character that Aston Martin has. Now, I'm gonna go run and hide before someone asks me to clean it. Well, I don't know about you, I think it's time for a little tea break, but while you pop the kettle on, here's a little brain teaser. Get thinking about that, and I'll see you in a mo. Open on a kitchen table, Cobble Hill. There's a kid. His mother says, you always have to be 10 times better. So he keeps writing and does not stop. He writes about the heat, about the game, about the block and home. And it keeps writing and writing and writing until it all cuts to black. Title appears. This is a story of a storyteller from Brooklyn.
desire. Yours. Ghost. Sebastian's personality shines bright, just not as bright as his coat. Someone's had their Omega-3 and 6 oils. James Wellbeloved. Okay, welcome back. Well, I'm here with Mark Webber. He's very busy today, but I've collared him <laughs> uh, to try and work out ooh, what's Ball. going on today. As you can see, it's all kicking Tricky up. Tricky times. <laughs> so what have we got coming up today? Well, we've got the um, 70 years of Formula One, which yep. is extraordinary. I think there are over 25 cars in that from the Lotus. I think it's the Lotus 25, the first one of the first Formula One cars, clearly a long 70 years ago, through to the current day Mercedes Formula One cars. So that's going to be a demonstration. They're going to go around doing that, which is extraordinary. Wow. Um, and then we've got uh, the shootouts, which oh. is extraordinary. So the first time ever at Goodwood, they're going to try and break the outlap, outright lap record because it's a bit of a flip to this because there's no crowds. Yeah. They're happy to let the cars loose for one lap and try and break the out outright lap record today. So there is some, some cars today that are going to do some extraordinary efforts in terms of putting it all on the table, Sean. They're going to go for it and wow. see what sort of lap times they can do. That is one that's going to be the highlight of the day, I think, looking, for many. Yeah, we are. We're all looking forward to that one. It's a cracker because it's just unique, you know, with no fans here and sort of finding that sort of balance between risk and reward. So they're going to go for it. Oh, that's pretty cool. At least yep. there's some upside to all of this happening in a slightly different way, isn't there? That's right. Yeah, there is. OK, what else have we got? Let's have a look. We've got all the um, the new cars, the future yes. cars. Yes, I think they've got uh, around 20 cars in that, and that's the, the future models coming. You know, again, it's another demonstration. It's all the, the leading uh, OEMs and manufacturers, you name it, they're all in there. Spectacular vehicles. Um, and that's really the future. So as we know, we're bookending, we're bookending stuff really well here with really the old stuff and the modern street cars, which will be a nice display as well. Are you a more of a classic car person or do you like looking at all the modern stuff? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty retro. I don't mind the classic stuff, to be honest, especially the race cars. They're just magnificent. Seeing yeah. these old Lotuses and those cars, it's, it's amazing. Um, so, and, and seeing the names on the side of them, Sterling Moss, yeah. Jackie Stewart, all those things for me, you know, my heroes are sensational. Oh, no, it's amazing. And also we do, talking of Sir Sterling Moss, we have the Sir Sterling Moss Memorial Trophy. Yeah, and that's really like cars that are pretty much like priceless you know they are you know extraordinary value um and the, the way you know again the generations of cars through that are going to be amazing and link back to Sir sterling obviously he would have driven a lot of those cars which is amazing so i think just a magnificent selection of pretty much priceless cars it's hard to put a value on these incredible pieces of machinery i saw a lot of press around this because people were getting excited that you know it, we're talking in the millions Hundreds of millions. Tens of, yeah. yeah, tens, maybe a hundred million. In, in, in a, yeah, complete terms, absolutely hundreds of millions, no question about it. So, um, and this is only happening in Goodwood, Chant. You don't find this uh, array of cars and collections at any other event in the world. The passion, the enthusiasm, the pull that this event has is absolutely world class. And obviously, just a touch on Sir Sterling Moss, you know, what a legend of a man. Well, you know, I spent, I was fortunate enough to spend quite a bit of time with Sir Sterling. You know, I met him when I first came to Europe in the mid 90s. Yeah. Um, and what a character, you know, for, for one of my biggest heroes, which was Sir Jackie Stewart, and for Jackie to, you know, uh, nearly be sort of, you know, welling up when he sort of talks about Sir Sterling, how much of a hero he was to him. So that's yeah. the sort of the gravitas that that guy had. He was, he's a very special guy. Um, and just a, you know, <laughs> He was F1, you yeah. know, and he, he, as Jackie says, he walked like a racing driver. He had that charisma. He was a very, very unique a British icon of motor racing. And, you know, he's sadly not with us anymore, but what a life he had. Oh, 100%. And I think, you know, he will be sorely missed. And, he, he, you know, this is what Goodwood is about. Today will be about remembering him and celebrating him as well. That's right, and, and they're brilliant at that. They they, they really have a, have a a good chance to reflect really well in, in a positive way. The people that had a huge impact on our industry, whether it's from engineering, through great you know engineering, pioneering, uh, executing some great race cars, which the English are very famous for, and also the drivers, the characters. You know those people that you know won world championships, that nearly won world championships, like Sir Sterling and all these incredible individuals. So Goodwood never fails to disappoint on that one. Oh, 100 percent. It's it's quite hard to describe it if you've not been. I mean, I'm struggling to hear you, Mark, because it's getting so noisy now. Yes. But that's part of it, isn't it? The noise, the the smells. I'm sending photos to my friends back in Australia or to New Zealand or all around the world. The Americans love it. So, and it's just, you know, I walked in here yesterday, and it is it is difficult, you know, conditions as we know in terms of the the viruses around at the moment, and 
brand new fences up. Yeah. You know, the lawns are cut. You know, everything is just, it's like a, it's like a mini Wimbledon. You know, yes. it's got a, a splash of a golf course, Wimbledon, and it's motor racing. This track has been the same since, you know, well, the 40s and 50s. It's, it's an incredible, incredible venue. And, and, and the Duke of Richmond, it's, he's, he's, he's toil and graft to make sure that he can continue to give back um, on the global stage so people really get pulled to this event and do it. And, and, and it's not really an effort to come here. You know, that's why you see the people that, that, that want to attend this event, whether it's through the vehicles, whether it's you know, at, the, at the revival or the, the Festival of Speed. If you get the chance next year, people, yeah. and it's back on, I, you will love it. All ages, generations, get down here. It is a really special, special event. 100%, I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Mark. And I think we're gonna now find out what on earth Rory is up to. Where are you, Rory? <laughs> Rory okay. What's up, guys? Time to play a little game. I know all petrol heads play this, but I'm back in the supercar paddock and I wanna play it with myself today. Dream garages, all right? I'm surrounded by, by a bunch of very exotic, expensive metal. And the aim is to choose my favorite cars that I would have in my ideal garage. And you've got to have all bases covered. So let's start with a family car. What I've identified right here is the brand new Rolls-Royce Ghost. And I think this has got to be the one for me because you've got to have room for everyone, right? Not only yourself, but your missus maybe, a couple of kids in the back and you want to be able to ride around in absolute comfort. So is this open? Yeah, look at this, look at this. Just have a look inside. I mean, how lucky would the children be to ride around in that? In the middle of that, you've got a champagne fridge. So if you and the missus want to go out on a little date night by yourself, then um, that's ideal. Curtains too, for extra privacy. So I'd have that. Let's check the price. Have a look. It's not going to be cheap, is it? 301,000 pounds, but that is definitely going in my garage. Right, that's the family car cupboard. Let's move along. Nice little rounder, the 911 Turbo S, but I don't know, no, no, I've seen a lot of that. I need something a bit more sporty. Looking at the 765 LT, amazing car on the track. Not so sure about how ideal it would be as a daily. So let's move along to this Ferrari 812 GTS based on the 812 Superfast. And what's really cool about this is that it's convertible, right? It's got a drop top, which means you can actually get the feeling of the open air rushing over you as you drive. And that's an essential component in my dream garage. You gotta have a drop top in there, you know, just to, just to show off, just to stunt. All right, so look at this uh, price tag, 356,000 pounds, nice and cheap. So that's two. All right, we need something a bit more mental now. Should I have the 765 LT? Would, would I, I think I would, I think I would, but there's so much more to choose from. So much fun. There's this Mustang. I've already got a Mustang Mark 1. Um, well, I've got the standard Mustang. This is the Mark 1. That's probably going to be about 40 grand. I need something more expensive. I've spotted something over here, though. All right, look at this. <laughs> yes. Right, so we've got a few Lambos. The Eurus would have been a contender for a family car. Nice and subtle in that yellow. We've got the Hurricane Evo rear wheel drive over here. Mm, no, needs to be more mad than that. So I think it's got to be the Lamborghini Aventador SVJ. This is an absolute maniac of a car. Total is 1.2 million for my garage. I have some of that. Rory was absolutely in his element there. A lot of very exciting, exotic and very expensive cars. Now, we're going to move on to the quiet countryside life now of driving because Range Rover are celebrating their 50th birthday. Can you believe it? Happy half century, guys. So the total might have been wrong then. The Range Rover is celebrating its half century. So to mark the occasion, we've gathered together 50 of the best examples for a little celebration. With help from someone calling himself a driving wizard and slightly less help from ex-England legends Jason Robinson, Lewis Moody and David Flatman, the cars will try and create a giant number 50. So, if you've got your playbook to hand, you've got your playbooks. The first thing that we're going to do is what's on page six, which is cars number 26, 31, 36, 30, 35 and 40, doing the top part of the five. So, we start at the end and then begin on six. Exactly that. Okay, then the next section is for cars number 38, 33 and 28. So 30, 
eight, 33 and 28, you'll be forming the very bottom of the five. That's not the same page that he's on. <laughs> you are literally on the no, different no, page. Yeah. No, no, so, like there's 50, isn't there? I'm yeah. pretty... <laughs> Do you understand what we're trying to achieve? Of course it does. 100 percent We need to get into formation. Yeah. The next section is the, the middle part of the five. So that's the next section. So pass number 27, 32 and 37. And 39, 34 and 29 will be doing the middle pass. So what? Fair play to you guys. You've had all this time and you've made something potentially really complicated seem unbelievably complicated. So good on you. That's good stuff. <laughs> OK, group A. So 26, 31 and 36. You move out, guys. You know something? I don't even think Mudos is going to be able to go 40 metres in his car. I've got his keys. Flats you, Judas. Where's my car key? <laughs> <laughs> Too easy, <laughs> Moodle. Too easy. <laughs> Actually innocent. So this is all on you, mate, and your odd sponge brain. Oh, there it is. Oh, it seems to have fallen out of Jason's car. That's just dropped out of his pocket <laughs> out of order. That is bang out of order. <laughs> that is bang out of order. <laughs> the, the chances of this working before it goes dark. Guys, can you pick up the speed, please? Don't, no, don't do that. No, it's Flatman, isn't it? He's got no idea. I've got no idea. And if we've got no idea, Moodos has got absolutely no idea what's going on. He doesn't know where he is. You know. Fair, they've stopped. They've stopped. OK. Um, Are they making them do that on foot now? Yes, because it was going so badly frankly in the cars they've they're making them do it on foot just to get a feel for it seriously is that what they do yeah oh my god it's turned into a team building exercise oh what where offices go and yeah do. yeah he's just said ask, he's to get to know the person next to you and ask them three questions about themselves it's clock's not, ticking look at the rugby dude not he's on his phone they're not even part of the orchestrated <sighs> chat i'm not actually going to go over and tell them off though because they are bigger than us. They're twice the size of us. Yes. There's not, there's not quite the sense of urgency that I was looking for at the moment. But eventually things did start moving and the zero finally came together. That's much better. Maybe a circle a bit smaller, a bit smaller, a bit smaller, and I think we're going to be there. Then it was a case of positioning the five. That's the cross bit of the five there, and the straight up, and then we need a cross there, so, right? So, top, down, then like a semicircle, right? Yeah. And they're yeah. doing that or that? Well, that's what I can't, can't actually figure it's out. Real. It's like the five the long way around. And then 30, 35 and 40, if you move along. Then we require 42. Yeah, oh, Lewis is all in gone. the SVR. Yeah, so then. Lewis is there. He's concentrating now. I can he see is. because he had a concentrated expression on his face. He did. And now we've got these three, four coming in here, and that should complete it. You've got to be careful with the five, because it could easily just say so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. That looks good. Annoyingly, though, the chief wizard had bad news. They were um, really so well. we're, we're stopping, because I think they've got circles. OK, so you now. think they've got it now. Good. So what we're going to do is then do this section of leading into this because there's more to this than just driving around in a circle. Oh, is there? Well, yeah, because they're going to drive in in a straight line. Then they've got to form up I'll side by form side. the pattern. And then form into the circle. And that meant only one thing, more walking. I actually think it was a, a joke between them amongst the, the, car, the driving wizards guys. But can we make these guys walk around in a field in circles, even though they're all grown-ups, these adult men and women, and then can we make them jog? Because some of the people here, not me, I'm very mobile, some of the people here are quite old and they shouldn't be running on sort of a sheep paddock. And they made us run and I honestly, I'm sure I turned around and saw them laughing to each other, they couldn't believe we were doing it. With the formation nailed, albeit outside of the cars, it was time for the final run. OK, guys, this is the real deal this time, so no more rehearsals, this is our one shot to get this right. So when you're ready, we're going to crack on. In three, two, one, action. Right, let's have it. This is the real deal now. 
we go. Come on. What are you thinking? Come what are you on. Thinking? It's good. It's looking good so far. That's neat. That's neat. It's working. It, it seems to <laughs> it's be. It's only flipping working. Coming in. Come on, come on, come on, come on. There's the evoke. Oh, there we in. go. The final piece. There we go. It's done. It really says. It works. It says 5 0. It actually does. That deserves a golf now. Oh, yeah. Well, happy birthday, Range Rover. We've done this. Yeah. I vote that we get out of here before those rugby lads come over and do some celebratory rugby stuff, weirdness. Because you know what they're like. <laughs> right, let's get out of here. Now, it goes without saying that the Duke of Richmond has done a phenomenal job getting this event together despite the circumstances. And that's because he knows there's such a loyal fan base. You know, maybe for you, it's the first year you've missed Goodwood. So I really hope that you're managing to enjoy it just the same from the comfort of your sofa. And the Duke himself has actually been uh, meeting all sorts of people this weekend, some of the leading minds of the automotive industry and actually the most recent guest he caught up with was the CEO of Ford Motor Company, Jim Farley. How are you doing, Jim? Good. Uh, just very busy. Um, the demand is so strong right now for automobiles. We are plumb out of stock. Um, we cannot make the vehicles fast enough and um, we have very high absenteeism in our plants. Some of our plants are running at 20% of the people not showing up every morning. So um, a lot of operational disruption, supplier issues. Uh, yeah, but, but anyways, high class problems when you have high demand. <laughs> sounds hard. It sounds pretty hardcore, I gotta say. So what are your thoughts on the pandemic? And I mean, has it had a, has it had a huge impact both on Ford and the industry? I mean, how, how's, it, how's it changing things for the future, do you think? Uh, Fundamentally, I mean, I, I, I don't think most of our knowledge workers will ever go back to work permanently. Uh, I think most people will come into the office maybe once or twice a week. Your own history at Ford's an, an amazing one. Obviously, you've had a fantastic, a fantastic career and huge success. But um, last time we spoke, you told me that your grandfather had worked on the shop floor. Uh, that, that's an amazing story. You must feel that must really that must really kind of, you know, mean something very very powerful to you it does it's a reason why i came to ford my grandfather was a 389 ninth employee at ford oh um he he carried his lunch box into highland park in 1916 for the first time uh he was just 15 years old uh he had absolutely nothing uh and all of our education all of our family everything we have is due to ford and his job. He worked at the Rouge plant, which was the first integrated manufacturing plant in the uh, foundry, lost a couple fingers, became a dealer then after he retired and a supplier for Ford. So our whole family's education was paid for through Ford. And uh, he was a very simple man. And he was one of my closest friends. We restored it a, a 1932 Packard for my grandmother when he was 70 to together and it was one of my chairs projects I, I did. And um, I think about him every day because he he was so humble. Well, he'd be very proud, I'm sure. It's, 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 uh, it's, 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 uh, that's a really, really br brilliant thing. And, and your passion for motorsport, Jim, I'm obviously we all, we all, uh, we, we all feel very connected through that. And yep. obviously you're, you're, you're the proud owner of a GT40, which I'm extremely, yep, yep. extremely jealous of. And of course, all the, the testing for the original GT40s was done here at Goodwood in the 60s. So, you know, special connection. Uh, another exciting thing to talk about today is the Mac 1. Um, yes, yeah. And what that means to you and what, it means to, and what it means to Ford. We're pretty excited about it. And we're very excited to have it coming to, to, to Speed Week and for it to have its U U European launch. But to tell, us, tell me a bit about it, Jim. Well, you know, uh, that there's a kind of story, bigger story behind uh, the Mach 1. Obviously, it was kind of an iconic uh, version of the Mustang in the U.S. when we went to a big block uh, engine. So it was, uh, the Mach 1 was the first Mustang we ever made, you know, in, in high numbers for average people for, you know, a seven liter uh, engine. The Mach, the, Mach -E, uh, the Mach 1 has a really special connection for us to Mustang and actually in a way, globalizing it and bringing it to the UK um, 
has a connection back to the GT40 and back to Le Mans, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. And then, of course, you touched on the Mac E there as well. And is that a is that a whole new new way forward for Ford? Are you excited excited about that? Yeah, you know, um, when we have design reviews at Ford, just because we're Ford, there are certain vehicles that you can hear a pin drop, and that often we will raise our voices uh, with each other. Uh, vehicles like Bronco and Mustang. Uh, you can only imagine when we came up with the idea of let's make an electric vehicle of Mustang version, <laughs> what happened in that design studio. It was really emotionally charged. And uh, we had lots of meetings with Bill Ford. We have, our, ours is a family company. And Bill's the biggest Mustang fanatic you'll meet. And uh, he said, well, can't be, a, can't be called a Mustang unless it, it smells like a Mustang, sounds like a Mustang, and goes like a Mustang. And uh, so we had to make a lot of changes to make Maki a true performance vehicle, and we're there. What's exciting to me as an old school car guy is that we're embracing our iconic models and the future at the same time. We're not getting them mixed up. We're not living in the past. We're living in the future. And I think um, this is a kind of paradox when you're working in a wonderful company like Ford, you have to solve for. I think we got it right on the Mach-E. Everyone's been brilliant. Your team have been fantastic. Okay. And we'll see you soon. Good. All Cheers. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Now, you might have been thinking, Goodwood, Goodwood Speed Week, it's at home. I can relax, sit on the sofa and just chill out during it. But no, I wanted to get involved with all of our competitions. And some of them are going to require you being quite creative. So uh, go and find the Pritt Stick and the Sticky Back Plastic because we have our central structure competition. And so far, some of these models have been amazing. Now, if you haven't got involved, why not? Do it because we have none other than Kevin McLeod judging them. So yes, he's got a very keen eye. We're looking for a lot of attention to detail. Also coming up after the break, we're going to be talking about Goodwood Speed Week snacks, which uh, is a bit of me actually. I'm feeling quite peckish. Uh, and we'll also, of course, be checking out what you've been doing at home. So I'll see you in just a moment.
open on a kitchen table, Cobble Hill. There's a kid. His mother says, you always have to be 10 times better. So he keeps writing and does not stop. He writes about the heat, about the game, about the block and home. And it keeps writing and writing and writing until it all cuts to black. Title appears. This is a story of a storyteller from Brooklyn. Hello everybody. Well, I tell you what, we've had a lot going on today. So I thought now was a good time to get the kettle on, grab a cup of tea and get to know each other a little bit better. So uh, oh, let's all get comfy. Now, throughout the weekend, we've been asking you to get involved and share what you're up to on social media with the hashtag GW Speed Week. And we've got so much happening online. We've got to get stuck into it. I'm well impressed with everything you've been doing. Now, one of our key themes actually this weekend is food because you've definitely got to keep snacks close by when you've got this much racing to see it's a big place goodwood and uh, because we'd hate for you to go without we've got some very special guests to talk speed week snacks i'm joined here by darren bunn goodwood group executive chef darren you're obviously <laughs> a, a very busy man normally at this time of year and you're overseeing sometimes over 200,000 people's food aren't you yes pretty yeah, yeah that's it yeah <laughs> what, so. what what is that like it's slightly different at the moment, but generally, I mean, it, it sounds pretty intimidating, but it's when it's broken down into smaller categories, each area, chefs in each area, the planning really, far out. The actual event is just the guys doing what they do. It's the planning that's the real secret to it. It sounds much more intimidating than what it actually is. And what are you like? Are you like a mean chef? Are you a bit Gordon Ramsay when someone does something wrong? Not so much now. Back no. in the day, maybe. <laughs> Not so much now. And um, how do you choose the menus? Um, Farm, Goodwood Farm, sits yep. at the heart of all of that, really. Um, so it has to re be reflective across, whether it's from, you know, just our bacon all the way up to our prime cuts. So that sits at the heart of it. And obviously, the you know, the go-to seasonality sort of, you know, has to be. We buy a lot, a lot of local fruit and vegetables, a lot of local fish. And it just comes around on like that, depending on what the area is, what sort of hospitality they're buying into. Ah, oh, so nice that you keep a lot of it local then. Oh, yeah, it has to be. Yeah, That's yeah. It's really good. And yeah. I'm, I'm sure it can be quite stressful at times, but what is the best thing about cooking a Goodwood? Um, really, really, it has to be the farm and the diversity of everything. We've got restaurants, you know, that, that use uh, secondary cuts, the, the less known cuts. We've got things that we do prime cuts. We've got cafes. We've got, you know, a house that serves, you know, weddings. And, you know, so we're doing when we were, when we were allowed to before all, all of the uh, COVID were, you know, glorious buffets and afternoon teas. And so it's the whole diversity with the farm just sat at the heart of it. You know, that's really the, the joy for me. Oh, you're making me hungry. <laughs> oh, I say. Now, look, this is where you guys come in because we want you to share your Speed Week snacks with us. Make me feel really hungry. Use the hashtag Speed Week Snacks. And you don't actually even have to wonder what to cook because Darren here has already posted some really great recipes, some cookery demos as well. Uh, all you need to do is check out goodwood.com for you to get cooking and get posting. And I'm sure you'll be very harshly judging any photos we get. Definitely. Sent in. We'll be having a close look at them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> They've got to follow the rules and it'll be all right. <laughs> now, uh, a mate of yours, we've just seen pop up here, another very special foodie guest joining us virtually. It's the one and only Mr. Tom Kerridge. Hello, sir. Hello, mate. How are you? Very well, thank you. How are you doing? Now, I'm hoping that with your wondrous expertise, uh, you could tell us maybe what your <laughs> ideal Speed Week snack would be. 
do you know what the, the beautiful thing about um, motorsport um, is the energy levels that it creates and you don't want to take your eyes off it because it's so such a fast moving um, sport and event and there's so many things going on particularly at Goodwood when you're there for things like Festival of Speed or Revival there's there's just so much to see so you don't really necessarily need one of those sit down meals it's something that you can snack sausage rolls cornish pasties bowl food like chili stuff that you can have in your hands and you walk around and see so much that 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 for me is perfect motorsport Oh, 100% snacking on the go. Do you agree with that, Darren? Yeah, Darren? totally agree. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and uh, Tom, we hear you're quite the car enthusiast. Where did that passion come from? I, do, do you know, I don't know, really. I think I think it's like boys and toys, isn't it? I think yeah. it's, you know, when, when, when you spend your life growing up in kitchens as a chef and you, you spend, um, you, you, you normally spend a, a lot of it mates and talking about cars and football and it's one of those environments that just uh, breed it and then when you're fortunate enough to get you've been in the industry long enough and you know people like Darren and I've known for a long long time who, who ends up who, who, who've got this fantastic job working at Goodwood that you know not only is he is he there with the, all that amazing project that he can have that you know this right on his doorstep Goodwood there's more to Goodwood than just the racetrack and, and the horse racing it's oh, the yeah. whole estate, and that makes it so special for Darren as a chef. And then, and, and, and then to hang out with Darren and see the food that goes there, you're then, you're then able to come get, get invited along and see some of the cars and what's going on. And, and my little man, I've got a son who's absolutely adores most of So, you know, to be involved in any way is amazing. Oh, lovely. Hopefully next year, yeah, if it's all going ahead, definitely. we'll have to get him down, yeah, we'll won't we? Yeah, we'll meet up again. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, can't wait. Yeah. Here's a random question for you, Tom. If you had to cook for any driver of any era, who would it be and what would you make him? Well, do, do you know what? I, I mean, that very, Lewis Hamilton for me is a, an all-time superhero and I've been very fortunate. I've met him a couple of times and he's an absolute... Uh, he's the closest I think you can get to a superhuman. When he walks in the door, he's got this amazing aura of somebody that's... You know, he's the best driver that's ever lived, you know, and it, from my point of view, cooking something for Lewis would be amazing. Um, we, we, you know, it would have to be something that's vegan. Which goes oh, yes. Sausage, <laughs> which goes against the sausage roll theory that I went with earlier. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll just eat up a Greg's vegan sausage roll for it and yeah. see what happens. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're not like one of those, please. Um, do you think there's any synergies between your passion for food and the Duke of Richmond's passion for cars? Yeah, I, you know what? I think any, any any kind of anybody that has passion for stuff, the most beautiful thing about the food industry is when you meet people that are involved in it, whether it's cheesemakers or butchers or whether it's people that brew beer or, you know, the guys that... And grow vegetables, and then chefs at the, 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 the end of it. It's all led by passion, and it's people who end up in the industry. And when you're in it for such a long time, you're you're not in it because it's a job. You're in it because it's it's a way of life. And we're all very fortunate. And Darren, the same with same thing. We've been in the industry for so long because we get something from it that we absolutely love. And it's it's very similar to sport or or, or motorsport. And, and, and there's so many new there's so many new trends or cookery things that happen um, that are very similar to motorsport, you know, development in the way the engines work or the cars are, you know, move into electric motors. But also there's the passion for the for the classics. You know, we we look at classics like French and in Super is is looking at, at like almost Goodwood revival. You know, those classic cars, the way that they work, those basic simple V8 engines are very similar to a beautiful braised stew. So there are those kind of like old school dishes, like old school cars, and then moving forward, you know, new techniques and new ways and new fashion. Very, it's, it's very similar. There are lots of synergies, but it is all led by passion. I didn't think we'd be comparing V8 engines to a bowl of stew, yeah. but this is where this show takes you. Who knew? Me either. <laughs> um, Darren, of, how did you two meet just quickly? I've like said on a morning, that's yeah. got to be the best. Yeah. <laughs> how did you two meet? Through the industry and Goodwood, really. Yeah. Our paths cross like that. It's a very, it's a big industry, but very small world. You Always know, is, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that, that's it, really. Do you work well together or do you clash? Not at all. We work very well together. Oh, you do? Very I thought you said well not together. at all, as no, in, no, I hate him. No, he's a great, <laughs> he's a great mate, a great fella, really top guy. It's great when he's down yeah, at Goodwood. I, again, the, the beautiful thing that Darren's got is, that, like I mentioned before, Goodwood's got that fantastic um, produce on his doorstep. And like Darren says, the, the pub there that uses those kind of secondary cuts is something that we're a big fan of and the way that we use it over in Marlow. And we've done a couple of things that have been together where, where synergy together 
it's a celebration and that's where you know the environments they made we've gone to the same sort of kitchen the same experience so it, you know, we, have a, we have a lot in common and, 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 but all of it is found in that passion for yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. Well, look, you've both made me feel so hungry right now. I don't know whether to thank you or hate you both. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, Tom. Uh, thank you as well, Darren. Pleasure. It was lovely to chat a bit of food. Cheers, Tom. Um, and I'm hopefully going to have time to have this cup of tea in a minute because that is it for this PG Tips tea break. But for those who missed yesterday's shows, we actually launched our revival best dress competition with none other than Twiggy judging. I repeat, Twiggy. Uh, so we also, this was actually brilliant as well. We asked you to design your very own central feature. Now this competition is up and running. We've got the incredible Kevin McLeod picking the winner. So if you want to get creative, send us your entries, pop over to goodwood.com and you can see all the other prizes on offer as well. Uh, if you want to get cooking your snacks, we've got all sorts going off this week. We just want you to enjoy Speed Week at home in any way you can. So we've got all your social posts to come in our afternoon tea break. That's a little bit later. But that's all from us for now. I think we're over to Becky. Okie dokie. Yes, here we are with Becky. We're down here. And this is Goodwood. This is what Goodwood's all about. We've got actually five cars that we want to run through here, haven't we, Becky? So we've got the 2017 W08 Mercedes F1 car. This is the most purest form of motorsport, isn't it? This Absolutely. is where the biggest budgets are. This is where the highest profile drivers are. Yep. And it's got the most aggressive regulations on sporting. It's the real, it's the top of the game really. If you're in F1, you've kind of made it to the top of the tree. And there's lots of other types of motorsport, but honestly, I think this is the one that everybody kind of looks at and goes, this is it. The biggest team personnel, biggest budgets, and, and we can see that with the sheer performance. They've got most of the lap records around the world, as we know, it's the, it's, the, it's the quickest category. And then we move on to more endurance. Now, this is a car that I personally love because yeah. I did drive this car. It's the Porsche 919 Hybrid. It's more endurance focused, as we know. This car will race between six and 24 hours. It also has three drivers, but it's a beautiful piece of machinery, isn't it? It's wonderful, and obviously the big races, the Daytona, Le Mans, 24 hour, you see these cars flying around, and they're unbelievable. The technology that goes into them. And it's often the most purest form of what gets transferred onto the road as well. That's right, yes. In this particular car, like a lot of the e-motors and these things, in terms of the, the battery technologies in the current Porsches that we speak today with the, with the Taycan, so that is a beautiful piece of machine. The lights on this thing, yeah, they will nearly melt trees they're that bright when you go to Mulsanne Street it's amazing how how amazing those bright those, uh, bright those lights were now rally I rally, love yes. rally I absolutely love these cars my hero was Colin McRae yeah absolutely Colin McRae is always the one yes. that Subaru is imprinted in everybody's mind as that one car that you look at and go what a hero what a hero I mean the current R5 rally cars they are so advanced compared to the to the cars in that day I was watching the rally cars yesterday and saw the old RS 200s and I was like oh they were so fast at the time but now when you compare it to something like this which is flying through the stages they're just so advanced and you know what it's such an exciting sport to watch yes and it's quite interesting isn't it why I suppose rally really exists because it's you know it's, it's it's a big departure from the other cars that are here that race on on, on Asheville obviously but it's also got the co-driver component right so the concentration of you know the the Monte Carlo rally and, and all those types of Beautiful. Mike's Peak is extraordinary as well. So there's a lot of legends that have been born out of rally racing, isn't it? That's the thing, Mark. Would you trust somebody with your life doing <laughs> 90 miles an hour towards a tree and a blind left? That's the thing. And that's what rally drivers are doing every time they're trusting and trusting their life into their co-pilot. I just think it's incredible. Yes, it's pretty extraordinary trust, isn't it? And then we move on to this big baby. Look yes. at this. This is an absolute tank. See, I love these because it's just the ultimate American machine. It's just big engines, big horsepower, 200 mile an hour, going around the track. And crosses are just expected. It's just <laughs> part, of, part of the furniture of that sport, which is NASCAR. That's right, yeah, in the 40s, I think it was really done for, um, you know, they were, they were moving alcohol around. Some of the, the, the teams yes. were set up to move alcohol they around were. illegally within the US. And then in the 50s, it really came professional. And, you know, as you say, the 20, 200 mile an hour on super speedways, on yes. oval racing, but they also do some, some road course racing. And the Dale Earnhardt seniors in this yeah. world, you know, Richard Petty, the king, the, 40, the 43 car. So it's always good to see these cars. I at, love having them here. At Goodwood here. as well. 
And um, finally, we're going to talk about the British Touring Cars here, the yes, BTCC, which BTCC. is 62 years they've been racing saloon cars in this country on some amazing tracks around the UK. A uh, really tough little circus. Again, the characters yeah. that have been born out of this, but mixture of professionals and amateurs racing this category for the last you know, few decades. Yeah, we've got privateers and we've got big teams, but the thing about BTCC, it's incredibly competitive. And when you're watching it on the screen, you're seeing everybody rum rubbing bumpers, rubbing wing mirrors. As I say, they are going all in on the corners. You see like 10 cars abreast sometimes. And it's, I'm like, is this BTCC or is it Rallycross? Who knows? It kind of takes on a different, it gives a different uh, style when you get into those corners. It's a mixture of two, two wheel, you know, front wheel drive and rear wheel drive. So yep. uh, that's Goodwood. That's a taste of Goodwood. All these amazing cars, the big variation. Thanks very much, Becky. Thank you so much. See you later, guys. Well, as you're probably aware, it's been really hard this year because we can't get everyone together. We're, we're actually really missing our Goodwood family because maybe it's once, twice or even three times a year we see some very familiar faces. But we are doing the best we can to connect with as many people as possible, even if it's virtually. And right now we have a very special message from the president of Toyota. Hello, it's me, Akio Toyota. For car lovers like us, there's no better place to be than Goodwood. It's a feast for all the senses, and even though we may not be able to smell the gasoline this year, thanks to the imagination of the Duke of Richmond, we still get to see and hear many fantastic new cars, including a favorite of mine, this new Toyota GR Yaris. This is the production version of a WRC Yaris race car, which we drove straight to the winter circle in 2019, making us the current WRC champion. My passion for racing is well known. In fact, I'd rather be in a car driving class than just about anywhere else. But in truth, we participate in motorsports like WRC because we learn so much about how to make our cars more dynamic and fun to drive. At least, that's what I tell Toyota's accountants. In my role as master driver for Toyota, I was personally involved in the creation and tuning of this new GR Yaris. Alongside a Gazoo team member, the great Tommy Makinen. Unfortunately, I can take you on a real test drive. But here's a little taste of what it feels like. Enjoy! Win on Sunday, learn on Monday. That isn't the way motorsport is usually described, but then Toyota's Gazoo Racing Division isn't your typical race outfit, but it certainly gets results. The incredible Gazoo Racing TS050 Hybrid secured its third Le Mans victory in a row in 2020 and brought the Drivers' and Teams' World Endurance Championship titles to Toyota. Add to this recent Drivers' and Manufacturers' titles in the World Rally Championship, plus a 40-year history in the Dakar Rally, and Gazoo Racing might be the greatest motorsport outfit you've never heard of. That, in a way, is because of the philosophy behind the team. For Gazoo Racing, the podium places, the prizes, and the plaudits aren't the point. Nor is it the traditional win on Sunday, sell on Monday approach of marketing via motorsport. Instead, in the words of founder Kichiro Toyoda, car racing is more than just entertainment. Automakers use racing as an opportunity to push a vehicle's performance to the limits and compete for supremacy, enabling them to discover new ways of advancing automotive technology. Nearly 70 years on, and Kichiro's grandson, Akio, echoes the sentiment. We will continue to make ever better cars by traversing the wide variety of roads and terrains across the world. But for terrain, read gravel, snow, sand, 
ice, mud, and everything in between. And for roads, read racetracks, and in particular, the Nürburgring. Most manufacturers test out the green hell, but not many of their CEOs race there. Unlike Akio Toyoda, or Maurizio Konoshita, to give him his race pseudonym. Konoshita led the Toyota factory team at the Nürburgring 24 hours on a number of occasions, getting behind the wheel himself for extended stints in the brutal race. The event sees over 200 cars and 800 drivers battle each other and the 15.5 mile course with its dozens of corners. And again, unlike most works teams, Gazoo Racing, which competed there for the first time in 2007, treats the 24 hours as an extended, exciting, but extra punishing test session for its road cars. Production models are modified and pounded round the track for day and the night, providing thousands of miles of development data for now legendary cars, such as the Lexus LFA, Toyota GT86, and Lexus RC. It was preparation like this that helped a race-prepared GR Supra finish third in class at the 2019 24-hour race. And let's not forget the rough stuff, where Toyota had a longer track record, first competing in the World Rally Championship in 1973. In the 1990s, the forerunner of Gazoo Racing would win four drivers and three manufacturers' championships with Carlos Sainz, Yuha Kankinen, and Didier Oriol driving the Toyota Celica and Corolla. Since returning to the WRC in 2017, Gazoo has won the 2018 manufacturers' title and 2019 driver's title with Ott Tanak. Kinoshita's passion can be detected here as well, with the hands-on CEO as happy behind the wheel on a forest stage as a German racetrack. His business alter ego, of course, was the one to sign off on the new GR Yaris, the road car developed directly from the Gazoo WRC program. We'll give you three guesses who was behind the wheel for many of the crazy little hot hatches development miles. here in the paddock and here at Speed Week we're trying to share the love between all the different categories of racing and actually we're about to hear from one of the most charismatic guys in the game it's only Ken Block Hi I'm Ken Block I uh, am a rally driver that also uh, does rally cross and this thing called Gymkhana I've been a fan of motorsports and car design since I was a, a young kid, from the youngest I can remember. Uh, and on top of that, I, I raced motocross as a kid, like young teenager. Um, but in the worlds of motorsport, I, the thing I related to the most was rally. So I paid attention to rally through the 80s and 90, 90s and early 2000s. And, you know, guys like Colin McRae and Ari Vatten and even Michelle Mouton, those were people that I looked up to and wished I could do what they did. And even as I, you know, got the keys to my own car, like I wanted to mimic the way that rally drivers drove down the road. And ignoring the the dotted line that goes to the middle of the, the corners and using the, the road how I wanted to use it, you know? And I dreamt of being a rally driver, but I never got a chance to do it until I was actually in my late 30s. Just that feeling of flat out. I, I grew up riding dirt bikes and it's the same thing. You go around a corner and you open up the throttle as, and go as fast as you can until you have to slow down again for a turn or a jump or whatever the obstacle is. And it's the same in a rally car. I go from, you know, the, the, the start of a stage with, you know, the throttle to the floor uh, with launch control. And once you take off, then you're hearing the co-drivers notes and you're driving as fast as you can to those notes so but the aggression level of driving a race car like that on normal roads is just an incredible feeling for, for me it's it, you know racing isn't just you see the driver in the car turning the wheel there's so much more that goes into it uh, than that and and with that you try and have the best team around you I have an incredible um, crew around me that helps me go out and race around the world. Um, and so at the end of the day though, it's 
me with the steering wheel and, and pedals that has to operate this vehicle and get down the stage or a circuit or gym kind of course as quick as possible. But uh, I really love it. I love the challenge of it. Um, I love succeeding with it. I hate the failures, but I try and learn from the failures. I live in a state where we have a lot of uh, land that's available to use, not only for, uh, you know, general use, mountain biking, that sort of thing, snowboarding, snowmobiling, but we also have off-road areas where we can go take, you know, like my Ford Raptor or Can-Am X3 and drive them very aggressively and jump and do all this stuff. But it looks like beautiful national park land. So it's really cool to be able to go do this stuff. So I, I, I'm just lucky that I actually moved to Utah to enjoy the snow, but I actually enjoy all the summertime activities of being able to go enjoy these fun places too with not only my cars, but also dirt bikes, cams, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know what, I actually listened to more stuff when I was younger. Um, and as I've gotten older, I've actually enjoyed more for sort of listening to the, the thing I'm driving. I don't know about you, I am gasping for a brew. Shall we have a little break? And when I come back, I'll give you the answer to this little brain teaser. Once upon a time in beautiful England, Mr. Martin meets a hill called Aston, and could be the universe was created, handmade, self-built, with sports running through our veins, baptized in the flames of adventure. That's what makes these wings fly. Welcome to the pack, DBX. Sebastian's personality shines bright, just not as bright as his coat. Someone's had their Omega-3 and 6 oils. James Wellbeloved. Introducing the new Defender. Just the thing for those little everyday trips. Good in heavy traffic. Perfect for catching up with the relatives and dropping into the car wash en route. Giving someone a helping hand. Or beating the commute. And putting your feet up after a long day.
Hello, welcome back. Um, uh, this is nice. We're in the supercar paddock, but this obviously isn't supercar. It's a Citroen Mahari. It's a 2CV underneath with um, a plastic body. body. And it's nice and it's fun and it makes you feel like you might be on holiday somewhere. It's the, which, uh, in it's a way, the we least kind of supercar are. related vehicle that we could have picked, actually. It is, though, a supercar. And, and I and learned about this quite recently with you. Yeah. Uh, the sound at the beginning of that wham hit, Club Tropicana, is the sound of this car. Is it? It's the engine sound of a Mahari, apparently. Well, I didn't know that. There's a bit of George Michael trivia for you. Yeah, anyway, on to more interesting, faster things. On to more interesting things, like, what have we got here? We've got some Aston Martins. I've, a I've couple not... of DBXs. Yeah, see, the DBX, actually, I didn't think it was going to look as good as it does in that red, which is the colour it was launched in. I actually quite like that red colour. This is the car that Aston's hoping that's going to really kind of bring in the money actually yeah SUVs do if what it they doesn't do. where does that leave Aston Martin they they don't have any money no. and that might no. be a problem no. made in uh, Wales and that huge new investment that they've got but anyway let's yeah, move down in Wales all of that so if it doesn't pay off then then they've, they've I don't know they've got to think yeah. of something else if they can 100, 180 mile an hour SUV though I mean the things are going crackers for them DB11 that's a nice car You've just driven one. I've of these, just right? driven That's pretty much DBS this Super DBX um, Volante uh, Superleggera. What a weapon! Honestly, 715 brake horsepower. Um, so much carbon artistry. When you pop the bonnet, you realise the build quality of this sort of huge carbon um, clamshell and these gills in the side. Uh, even if you, even if it didn't drive as well as it does, to look at, it's incredible. You know, I've really been quite taken by this car. The thing about this car is it's got um, a, a metric shed load of power and that seems to be a sort of trend in supercars. There's a power war going on. Yeah. We look down here and we've got... There is in there. ...the latest um, Lamborghini Aventador, which has got more and more power than it had when it first came out because it has to keep pace with everything that's also got more power. Well, have you and noticed how where fast, does it end? Well, 500 horsepower used to be colossal. Yeah. Uh, but you're getting super saloons regularly over 500 horsepower. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, it's like you just go out and buy a Golf R and it's got sort of 300 yeah. horsepower, something like yeah. that. Whereas once that was, well, I mean, a Ferrari 308 didn't even have that. But now we're into sort of realms of 700, 800. And then you look over there and we've oh, got yeah. the Lotus EVR. Yeah. <laughs> which has got 2,000 horsepower because it's electric. So it's almost like electric power, which clearly is going to be a new frontier of yeah. supercars. Yeah. It's giving us even more power. Well, Where does it more, end? More torque than any turbos, pistons could really deliver. Yeah. Well, that's it. It's also, it all happens from nothing, doesn't it? It's like you could get yourself into uh, quite a lot of bother if they didn't have <laughs> so much quite computer a lot of power bother. to try and save your sorry bottom when you unleash 2,000 horsepower yeah. in a straight line or worse still around a corner but what I'm wondering is actually does the Mahari there it's not a completely irrelevant prop that we just pretended to arrive in it's actually something that teaches us maybe what the other future could be as well uh, electric power is hard to make light because yes. of the batteries but lightness generally might be some way in which supercars now have to sort of go and they do in a way because they're made of carbon and what they've the always had of the lotus the lotus model of, of going less power but you don't need it because your power to weight's high but how that's the thing do supercar manufacturers start selling cars on power to weight rather than outright power because if they just keep going with power it will only spiral upwards into some kind of deranged top trumps fantasy yeah and really all the pressure on the what? car industry, even supercars at the top, is about trying to be a little bit more efficient and, and lightweight, yeah. like a Mahari, which weighs, you know, probably... 600 kilos, yeah, maybe less, actually. Nothing, it's a shoe, isn't it? It's just a, <laughs> it's a big shoe. It weighs the same engine. amount as my right shoe. And that might be the model that we, we start having to follow. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just sort of speculating that... Well, I think, personally, I think the future will hold is stuff like that, like the DBX, yeah. That's what probably should be electric. And I think the stuff that you use less and less, as in it's a special, you know, very rarely do you use a supercar on a regular basis. Yeah. Even if you can afford to, those are the cars which I think almost should stay piston perhaps. Okay. Yeah. And this stuff, which that's designed to be a 365 day Aston Martin that's family orientated or whatever, that's the stuff which maybe should be battery. Um, just while we're here, 
also we were going to sort of talk about what's what, you know what have supercars ever given us yeah um which is a good question but stuff does trickle down doesn't it stuff very much and if you look down. over there you've got the latest porsche 911 turbo i was just looking at that that I was all at manner that. of things on it um and they will start to come into normal cars. They already have four-wheel steering, four-wheel drive, all that kind of malarkey. Yeah. Um, before yeah. we go, we do have to mention the socials. Yes. Uh, well. Hashtag GW Speed Week. Uh, that's the hashtag to use Goodwood Speed Week. Um, and also, you can watch this either on the, if you're watching this on the website, but you can also watch it on ITV4. There's going to be highlights of it being televised. Um, and there's a 360-degree binaural experience on goodwood.com so uh, go and enjoy that please wash your hands afterwards with <laughs> now those two smith and sniff i mean it goes without saying two of the biggest fashion icons in the motor industry however we're now going to take a trip down memory lane to the glitz and the glamour of the 1950s <laughs> You can see the influence of certain fashions in cars of the era. Nowhere more so than the pointy bumper extensions first seen on Cadillacs in 1953. Officially, they were inspired by the tops of artillery shells, but no one was fooled. From the moment they appeared, Americans associated them with the actress Virginia Ruth Egner, known by her stage name Dagmar, and specifically her trademark conical bra cups. Forevermore, these bumpers were known as Dagmars. It's little wonder this audacious design feature first appeared on a caddy, because in the 50s, nothing else could match their flamboyant design nor their cutting edge features. Power windows, power brakes, power steering, automatic lights, climate control. 50s Cadillacs had features lesser cars could only dream of. Now, the dream car a magnificent El Dorado town car by Cadillac. Ensemble by Christian Dior of Paris. The only thing to match the sophistication of a Cadillac car in the 50s is a Cadillac advert in the 50s. Their advertising was filled with beautiful people in beautiful places, dressed in designer fashions and decked in fine jewelry, poised to let their Cadillac take them to the most exclusive society events of the season. And these elegant images didn't happen by accident. The clothes were one-off designs by Jacques Fath, Hattie Carnegie and others, made exclusively for the ads and carefully colour matched to the cars. Men might have dreamed of a Cadillac for the bragging rights of its overhead valve V8 engine, but women were drawn in by the sheer elegance of these ads. In the 50s, Cadillac saw record sales and cemented their reputation as the gold standard of American cars, thanks in no small part to these gorgeous adverts. In the early 1950s, the Chinon, a simple bun, was the height of sophistication. The bun could be placed anywhere from the crown of the head to the nape of the neck. It easily moved from day wear to evening wear, making it very versatile and fairly easy to create. Lots of famous movie actresses donned elegant, sleek chinons for their roles. In tribute to those glamorous ads, we've recreated one here. Rosie is wearing a beautiful ball gown that perfectly matches this stunning 1958 Cadillac Eldorado. This dress is the classic 1950s hourglass silhouette. The decade from 1947 to 57 has become known as the golden age of couture because of the huge influence Paris fashions had on the clothes we wore here in Britain. What's interesting to note is that this dress is made of a synthetic fabric, nylon, not cotton or silk. So we're starting to see the rise of man-made fabrics. Balls are a really important part of the social season at this time. It's only in 1958 that we see the last debutante ball, where young, aristocratic women are presented to the Queen. With the end of this tradition, we're starting to see the dawn of a new era. And that's how, in the 1950s, fashion was the ultimate weapon with which to sell cars.
Now, when you're wandering around Goodwood, you never know who you're going to meet. And I happen to bump into British touring car legend, Gordon Shedden. Gordon, thank you for joining me for a little chat. Oh, no worries. It's, uh, it's lovely to be here. It just feels like this year has been so weird and so strange that to be kind of let loose at a racing circuit is just fantastic. So yeah, loving every minute it, it of it. It already feels like a bit of escapism, doesn't it? It does, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's just... The fact that this event's even been able to put together, I think, is just huge testimony to the team at Goodwood and, you know, fantastic. If you can't have a smile on your face driving a race car around Goodwood, what chance have you got? Have you jumped in a car yet? I have. I've got uh, from the sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> so I've got a, a Mini in the St Mary's, a GT40 in the Whitson, a Cobra in the TT, I had a Camaro last night and also... <laughs> Uh, set the outright lap record in the Audi GT3 car here yesterday oh. in the in the shootout. So uh, casually yeah, dropping it, that it, one in. It really is <laughs> kind of weird. I'm jumping from one thing to the next, but it's good fun. What have you got coming up today? Okay, so next out to race in the GT40. I've then got to absolutely run from the holding area in the GT40 to jump in the Mini, which is just crazy. <laughs> and then from the Mini to the the Audi R8 GT3 for the shootout. So three back to back uh, over the lunchtime period. Um, yeah. We'll, go, we'll, have, we'll have some fun, I'm sure. Oh, I can't wait. And also, like, you're a bit of a Goodwood veteran. What's, have you got any memories or, or anything that stands out for you that you could mention? Uh, it's just so many, and I, I think it's... I, I often say to people, you know, if, you, if you've never been to Goodwood, you have to come because it's like Disney World for adults. You know, when you come through these gates and you see such amazing cars, you know, obviously normally for revival, you've got the bikes, and if you've got any kind of interest in anything through whatever period, there's definitely something for everybody. So, yeah, I don't think I've ever been here and failed to ever be completely blown away by the, the hardware of machinery that's here. Oh, I totally agree. Well, I'm very excited to see you in action, but um, actually right now we have the Glover Trophy, which um, I'm very excited to see. A little bit of race action for you now, so I'm going to head on over to our commentators. So next up, it is the Glover Trophy, a 20 minute race for one and a half litre Grand Prix cars from 1961 to 1965. It was a non-championship race here at Goodwood back in period, but we've got some period racing cars and right here we have our pole sitter for this race, Mike O'Brien. He's in a Brabham Ford. Um, well done yesterday, half the job done so far. First of all, how's the car? Yeah, the car is fabulous. Um, a real pleasure to drive and uh, when it, since I jumped in for the first time yesterday, it was just uh, everything was on song. So really enjoying it so far and uh, hopefully we'll convert that into the win in the race. I love the fact that you only drove it for the first time yesterday. <laughs> sorry, I, I can't hear you very well, sorry. Well, I was just saying, I love the fact you only drove it for the first time yesterday. Yeah, no, um, I, I've driven cars similar to this in the past, uh, so I did have a, an idea of what it was going to behave like, but even so, you're always a bit apprehensive, so uh, yeah, chuffed with yesterday. Okay, uh, good luck with that. It's going to be a classic battle, this, between Brabham and Lotus, Andy Middlehurst here the Lotus 25 lining up on the front row of the grid as well. It's going to be a brilliant race. Sure is, Tom. Thank you very much. And Michael O'Brien then, the man on pole position. So uh, his father, a very accomplished racer in things like single seaters and in the British Touring Car Championship in the late 80s, Mike O'Brien had a Holden Commodore run by Alan Docking. Michael, his son, came from uh, initially historic Formula Ford, was picked up by McLaren as part of its driver development program for GT4 cars, and he's been racing in GT3 this year, part of Bob Neville's Jensen Button uh, team, uh, Jensen Team Rocket RJM, and uh, will be in action, as will Jensen himself at Silverstone, uh, 7th, 8th November weekend. So the cars come up to the grid. There is Michael O'Brien on pole position then in the uh, Brabham BT14, the car owned by Alan Bailey. And with him at the front of the grid is the Andy Middlehurst driven John Bower's own ex Jim Clark Lotus 25. There it is, with the right uh, number on the side of it. The car that Jim won the World Championship with in 1963. And then number 17, John Milicevic, on the outside of that row with the, uh, again, Alan Bailey owned LDS Climax. LDS, the South African constructor of Louis Douglas Sururier, hence LDS. There is John Milicevic, who is on the outside of row one, the second row of the grid, uh, Sam Wilson there with the blue and green crash helmet you can see who uh, stopped in qualifying yesterday part of this ex-Dave Charlton Lotus 2022 trackside but the good news is that it's there on the grid uh, next to him number 29 Nick Fennell another great uh, Jim Clark fan it's another ex-Jim Clark chassis that uh, there 29 Nick Fennell drives uh, then on the third row number eight Mark Shaw 
one-time Formula 3000 racer with his Lotus 21. There it is, number eight, Mark Shaw. Uh, this car built for Jim Clark for the South African series at the end of 1961, in which Jim had four race wins. Next to Mark Shaw, 91, is Chris Drake with the ex Bob Gerrard Team Cooper T7173 that Piers Courage raced. And number 14, lining up alongside him, uh, Richard Wilson with the Bruce McLaren uh, Cooper T60 with its Climax engine that Bruce McLaren won the 1962 uh, Monaco Grand Prix with. So the grid being cleared, they'll get the formation lap underway very shortly, and then we will be in business for 20 minutes of the Glover Trophy. David Addison and Sam Hancock trackside. Five second board will be shown very shortly to release the cars. There is Michael O'Brien then on the pole position. And there's the green flag. So everybody sets off then. Last opportunity to get some warmth into the skinny rubber on which these cars run. The treaded tyre, of course, as was in period. And uh, is Michael O'Brien going to be able to hang on with the relatively underpowered uh, BT14? Ford engine Brabham against Andy Middlehurst in the Lotus. Number 44 there is another of the LDS chassis. That's Greg Thornton's car with the Alfa Romeo engine in it as against the Climax engine that John Milicevic has. So the Glover Trophy then, 20 minutes in prospect. Michael O'Brien, Andy Middlehurst and John Milicevic on the front row ahead of Sam Wilson and Nick Fennell. Mark Shaw on the third row with Chris Drake and Richard Wilson's Cooper for company then. Uh, Andy Willis and the Lotus 24 of Andrew Beaumont to round out the top 10 on the grid. Sid Hall's Ex Rob Walker uh, team Cooper T66 next with the Cooper of Chris Halliwell alongside, and then Bernardo Hartog's number 32 with the Lotus 1821 is next ahead of Alex Morton, and then Stuart Roach with his Brabham BT14. Greg Thornton lines up alongside another great Lotus enthusiast, uh, Dan Collins. He's 17th on the grid. John Clark comes next with Andrew Waring and Malcolm Cook with the ex Guy Ligier Joe Schlesser Brabham BT10 to complete the grid. So that is uh, how they line up and it's going to be interesting to see as i say whether michael o'brien can hang on in there but sam beauty of this again no wings they can slipstream they can overtake yeah nice little narrow cars they can get alongside each other they've got a lot of stability a lot of grip particularly in the high speed corners don't be surprised to see them running two abreast through corners like ford water and on the run up towards st mary's as well make great racing they will get a lot of slipstream effect down the back straight particularly so tucking in close behind the car ahead that's punching a hole in the air for you allows you just to gather a little extra speed and then use that momentum jinking out to the right out of the toe to get alongside into the braking zone down in Woodcut. so the cars heading into the chicane Michael O'Brien then slotting into place in a moment on that uh, pole position. And the rest of the field filing into position behind the Brabham BT14 then for pole. And the car slots into place. They're further back on the grid. You've got the Cooper of uh, Sid Hall. effectively a Formula Libra car in a sense, but uh, it is a car that would have uh, taken part in Grand Prix at the time. So there it is, set for pole position. Andy Middlehurst and John Milicevic to line up alongside. And as soon as the last car is in place, we'll get the green flag shown at the back to say that everybody has returned from that formation lap and we will be good to go then for our first race of day two of Goodwood Speed Week presented by Mastercard. There is the green flag that says that we are good to go racing. Drivers now look towards the flag, which will drop now. Race underway. Who makes the best start? Good getaway by John Milicevic, actually, from the outside of the front row. Can he get the LDS into the lead? No, he can't. Andy Middlehurst out drags him. Michael O'Brien drops back into second place around the outside. Tries to go Nick Fennell there, number 29 in his Lotus. He's going to get hung out to dry. But Andy Middlehurst has made an absolute peach of a start, hasn't he? He leads as they head up towards Fordwater for the first time. Yeah, Middlehurst enjoying a little bit of a car length cushion already because he managed to get the job done before the breaking point into Madgwick. That allowed him to regain the regular racing line as we see on the inside into, into uh, the first part of St Mary's as they all jostled for position now coming through. 
So that was Michael O'Brien, I think, wasn't it? Being a real yeah. hero, diving up the inside from a long way back, and he's done it. And actually, so surprised was Andy Middlehurst by that. He's dropped a length or so already to Michael O'Brien as they come through Lamb then. So O'Brien trying to get away on cold tyres, doing a great job. Middlehurst trying to go with him. Milicevic is third. It's Sam Wilson in fourth place, number seven, as they come through the kick down. Lamb and straight then heading towards Woodcut. Andy Middlehurst closing up, but Sam Wilson now comes up to have a go. Look for third place against Milicevic. The LDS just there, able to keep the Lotus 2022 at bay, but it's going to be Michael O'Brien in the lead at the end of lap one, heading into the chicane. Andy Middlehurst is there in second position, but look at it, nose to tail for third as they wriggle through at the end of lap one. Yeah, and that was the slipstream effect that I was talking about. We almost saw it coming to fruition for the third place battle there, but now single file. Peter O'Brien with a nice little cushion on the way into Madgwick. So at the end of that one, it's Michael O'Brien ahead, second Andy Middlehurst, John Milicevic third, fourth Sam Wilson, fifth Nick Fennell, Mark Shaw in sixth place, Andrew Beaumont there goes through down in 14th place. The gap between the race leaders was half a second and then one second between second and third. So uh, Milicevic and Wilson, if they can, need to try to work together to go after the leaders, but Sam Wilson dives through on the inside of Ford Walker into St Mary's and that is third place, used all of the road, but that was a bold move and it worked and a yellow flag zone with a car strapped it's Andrew Waring, I'm afraid, up the road ahead. Yep, so that eliminates one of the o o clean overtaking places down into Lavin, a 90 degree right hand, a lot of heavy braking. So normally we would expect plenty of lunging up the inside, but not with the yellow flags being waved. They will be removed just as soon as the stricken car is safely repositioned behind the barrier. Meanwhile, green flag racing up ahead on the run down into Woodcote. Now that Sam Wilson there has been released, can he go after the race leaders? That's Nick Fennell fifth, having a look on the inside of John Milicevic to try to get past the LDS, but the Lotus denied then as they come into Woodcut. The race leader, still Michael O'Brien, the hugely experienced in Lotus 25 terms, Andy Middlehurst. Never mind all these other racing exploits. He knows exactly how to behave with this car, what he can expect from it. Through he goes in second place. Now, is he biding his time, planning his move against Michael O'Brien? Well, Michael, in fairness, has done the fastest lap of the race thus far. Uh, Mark Shaw rounding out the top six as the cars come pouring over the line. But Michael O'Brien leading at the moment by one second from Andy Middlehurst. Sid Hull goes through there in ninth place. And on his tail is Andy Willis in tenth spot. Yeah, the fastest lap of the race so far is O'Brien out ahead on a 123-1. Remember these just little capacity engines, so not very much horsepower. All of that lap time performance out and just getting tied up. Oh, squeezed into the braking zone. Bit of a tank slapper, gathering it all up at first and then not at the end. Oh, wait, with that time, that's Collins. It was Dan Collins then, who's entered the drift car a little bit earlier on in the day than anticipated. That was a... Big, big moment. Now that all started because he was in the tow, having a little look up the inside, but the, the circuit is not straight on the straight. It jinks left and right, and he just ran out of road. It's ever so easy for the car in front to just wide and get the elbows out, just fade ever so slightly to the right when the car behind is already committed to that one car's width. They have nowhere to go but for the wheel on the grass. That is the result. So, while all that has been going on, has Michael O'Brien built the gap over Andy Middlehurst? He has. He's pulled another half a second over the Lotus 25. But Sam Wilson, in third place, is lapping quicker than Middlehurst. So the gap second to third now is coming down. In fourth, you've got John Milicevic there. Fifth, looking at the back of the Lotus 25 and Nick Fell. In sixth place, it's Mark Shaw. And then seventh, Chris Drake. Eighth, currently, is number 14, which is the Cooper of Richard Wilson. Uh, as the leaders go through for the fourth time, Michael O'Brien still in charge, and Andy Middlehurst, for the moment at least, seeming as though he does not have an answer. Glorious, isn't it? That lovely, lovely Lotus climax and Nick Bennell. These cars are so pretty, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. Love the wide track. Make some great proportions. All from the 1500cc era, the so-called Screamers. Uh, there, Nick Fennell goes through, but uh, up front, Michael O'Brien looks as though he's building this lead because on this lap he's pulled another tenth in the first sector alone over Andy Middlehurst. Now, what about Sam Wilson? He is catching uh, Andy Middlehurst, or at least he was on the previous lap. He can maintain that pace, he might have a chance of taking second position before the very end. So, this is the run down towards Woodcut. That out of the chicane is the race leader. Total concentration here, Michael O'Brien still learning about the car, but doing a very impressive job. One and a half seconds 
the advantage was. Let's just see what it is now. It's up to 2.6. Wow, that was some lap by Michael O'Brien. Yeah, 122.5 on that last lap for Michael O'Brien in the Brabham. See him just working away at steering. Little, little input, little output. Tiny little corrections, just manipulating the rotation of the car through the apex. They'll be easy flat down through forward water, easy flat over that crest. Maybe just a little lift, a little breath on the brake, perhaps, to contain the speed through the first part of St Mary's, keep the car to driver's right, so they've got a nice line into the left, using all the road on the exit. And now, hard brake. You can see the nose dive down a gear, maybe even two and then just boot the throttle, control the slide, use the power to direct the car through the second part of Lavin Corner and onto the straight. There is the first of the kinks, the main left hand in the middle of the straight. Now this is where it all went wrong a minute ago. You can see there the circuit goes left, then right. If you've already snuck your nose up the inside of the car ahead, you're going to run out of road very quickly if they defend. Very difficult to get alongside on the run up to Woodcut there. Jinking right and left through the chicane. Beautifully driven by O'Brien. See if he's uh, faster again on this lap. Previous best. Yeah, he's done it again, only by a few hundredths, but another 22.5. And nice, consistent pace from the race leader. Always an indication that he's very much on top of his car. What that now means also is that he's nearly four seconds ahead. So 3.9 is the margin between the top two. Andy Middlehurst's last lap was a 23.7. Sam Wilson, who is half a second back, is closing. So the battle is shaping up for second and third, isn't it? You can see the cars there in the background. Sam Wilson is not quite on the tail of uh, Andy Middlehurst, but he's not far adrift. For fourth and fifth, it's still John Milicevic and then Fennel tucked up behind him, Mark Shaw, best of the rest. In sixth, and Milicevic using all of the road there through the first element of St Mary's. Yeah, Mike O'Brien out front, loving life, isn't he? Yeah. Miles ahead, with nothing in front of him, just getting his head down, doing quality star laps. A bit of smoke coming out the back of Middlehurst car there. I don't think it's anything to worry about. It was just a little whiff. You can see it again there. Now maybe more. I am worried. Yeah, more common, isn't it? And he's also being caught. Now, does this explain why he's being caught and why they're dropping away from Michael O'Brien? Andy Middlehurst is being chased hard, being caught by Sam Wilson. And, of course, this could mean that Sam Wilson's visor is getting peppered with oil, reducing his visibility. Always very hard when you see smoke coming out of the car in front because not only can you get quite a lot of oil on your visor, but you worry about adhesion because, because of course, it might be oil being dropped on the road as well. Absolutely right. So Andy Middlehurst goes through. That last lap actually was his best of the race, so he's trying to persevere despite the smoke. Sam Wilson dropping back a little bit, actually, as they went over the line, possibly for all the reasons you say. Their trackside is Bernardo Hartog's Lotus 1821, trying to rejoin. But the second and third go through then, with this rather elasticated gap. So Andy Middlehurst trying to fend off Sam Wilson. And, yeah, the smoke is still there. And that clearly is affecting in some way, Sam, because the gap has stretched out from a lap ago. It has, but keep an eye on Sam Wilson. He's got a lovely karting style to his driving. He likes to flick the car in on the way out of the corner. You see the rear, maybe here, just the rear stepping out on the way into the corner, neutralising the steering input. Def little corrections, just an inch or two of steering to the right, an inch or two of steering to the left, using the throttle to neutralise it on the way out of the corner. So can that gap come down? Equally, John Milicevic still doing a very good job of keeping Nick Fennell at bay here as the two of them uh, ramp down now towards Woodkin. Except this is Nick Fennell's best chance yet, isn't it? He goes to the inside line, he's got the room and he's got the line and he goes through as Milicevic has to sort out a really vicious slide there. Very big tank slap, but probably just locked the rear axle on the downshift there. Need to execute a nice heel and toe blip to keep the rear stabilised matches the engine speed with the wheel speed as you release the clutch having selected a lower gear you get that wrong that's what happens the rear axle locks momentarily and you've got to have your wits about you to gather it all up luckily he did but he did lose a place then so Nick Fennell finally finds a way by uh, what about Sam Wilson versus Andy Middlehurst when they crossed the line the gap was only 0.2 of a second so it's still game on and it's not so much smoke, just a, a constant haze now, isn't it, behind the Lotus? It is, but I think it's getting gradually worse. Sam Wilson getting a little closer now. Forcing Middlehurst to take a defensive line into the left-hander at St Mary's. He comes out on the tighter line as well. 
reckon when we look back at, oh, I was going to say, I thought we'd see Sam Wilson taking a lunge up the inside into Lavin. He hasn't. He thought better of that, biding his time. So where does he make that move? Also just see Michael O'Brien having to cope with the traffic as Malcolm Cooks Bradham to negotiate as now down through the approach to Woodcut comes the Smoky Lotus. Andy Middlehurst comes into the breaking zone now. And then you've got right up behind Sam Wilson. Now this is it, isn't it? This is the start of the move because Sam Wilson is closer than ever before. Andy Middlehurst has to go defensive to sit in the middle of the road to cover off the line on the way into the chicane. Flick out of the left-handed element up towards the line. And so now Sam Wilson there in third place tries to line up to make this move going down towards the right-hander of Madwick. Is this going to be the opportunity for him? No, Andy Middlehurst knows exactly how to defend. And as long as that car has got pace, he's going to use every trick he can to hang on to position. Yeah, he's making that car as wide as possible, isn't he? Sam Wilson looking left and right, but he doesn't seem to quite have the power he needs. And particularly here, we're seeing it visibly, the gap widening through the long, flat-out section from Madwick through Fordwater. Wilson just getting a little tail happy as he tries to kill some speed on the way into the first part of St Mary's. Middlehurst, meanwhile, the hazy smoke coming out of the back end, still very much there. Wilson off yet, O'Brien out front. Battle here for those that have had dramas early on in the race. Dan Collins, remember, after his big, big spin, uh, he's uh, now lapped down on Michael O'Brien. There you've got the second place battle. Andy Middlehurst doing a, a very good job of hanging onto the place. Problem or no problem, he is still there, hanging onto the position. Well, watch for Wilson, because I think he's a bit stronger on the brakes here, down into Woodcourt, a bit quicker through the right-hand apex. Here is the traffic going to help Wilson. This is going to wrong foot Middlehurst. He can squeeze through. This could be terrible, though, for Wilson. He gets... He gets held back. I think that's Bernardo Hartog, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. So look at the gap there as they cross the line. A lap ago it was a tenth. Now as they cross the line, it is 1.2 seconds. All that hard work gone just by being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And there's just nothing you can do about that as a driver. You see those situations unfolding in your heart just sinks. Raging with frustration, he would have been through the chicane, but he'll have to get his head down now, refocus, concentrate, because he does seem to have a slight pace advantage over Middlehurst. Middlehurst maybe is nursing a little bit of an engine problem. Smoke not getting worse, but still visible. And the pace of Middlehurst's car is still good. His, his last lap was only uh, a second off his earlier best, but doesn't that look brilliant? It's a proper period shot Stunning. at Goodwood. Fantastic. Absolutely stunning. But for the full face helmet, you could be back in the 1960s, couldn't you? And Andy Middlehurst, great Jim Clark fan, absolutely adores driving this car, has had great success with it, and is determined to hang on to that second place. So we've got six more minutes to go, more traffic beckons, which might go either way for Andy Middlehurst or, of course, Sam Wilson. Well, I think this is exactly what Wilson will have hoped to see. He wants Middlehurst to get a little bit held up by the traffic. It's already happening as we look at O'Brien out front with a 6.7 second lead. He's comfortable. He's backed his pace off now by about a second per lap. Maybe a bit too much, actually, Mike. <laughs> Get back up a little, but again, just beautiful balance, isn't there? The Brabham, up in life out front, nobody ahead, nobody behind. Perfect. Meanwhile, the battle rages, doesn't it? For second place between Middlehurst and Wilson, who we can't see on our screen at the moment, but they were navigating their way through the back markers. That we think might give Sam Wilson a chance to launch another attack on Middlehurst. Seven seconds, Michael O'Brien is clear of everybody else, so. Mighty impressive, this has been. Comes now through the right-hander out of uh, Lavins onto the power once more. Andy Middlehurst, of course, still busy trying to keep Sam Wilson at bay. The gap had gone up even more last time from 1.2 to 1.7 seconds. So is Sam Wilson now thinking, I'm going to have to settle for third place? Down towards Woodcut comes Michael O'Brien, but he has just dominated this race. Another hat tip to Michael because this has been a standout performance, not put a wheel wrong in a car he doesn't know that well and a circuit he doesn't know very well at all. Well, his fastest lap is a full 1.1 seconds quicker than Middlehurst behind. But interestingly, we were speculating that Sam Wilson looked to have a slight pace advantage over Middlehurst. Timing screens back that up. Middlehurst fastest so far, 23.6. Sam Wilson two tenths faster on the 23.4. 
So I'm expecting to see this battle go to the flag, but it's going to need some help, isn't it? Yeah. It's going to need a few more back markers to impede the progress of Middlehurst now. Wilson to close back in and launch another attack to take advantage of that slight, and it is slight, pace advantage that he has. Yeah, Sam Wilson the last time was just under six tenths of a second quicker, so the gap second to third has come down once more, but is it coming down enough? Bearing in mind that we've only got four more minutes of the race to go. There's Andrew Beaumont in tenth place, wriggling his way into, and now out of the chicane, heading up towards the timing line once more, but Michael O'Brien now 8.7 seconds to the good up front. Uh, there is Sam Wilson. Now, where is Andy Middlehurst? He's catching again, isn't he? So, uh, oily visor or not, he is pushing as hard as he can, but he gets stuck, doesn't he? He drops back, catches, 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 and then can never quite find a way past the Lotus. Well, he's got at least two, probably three laps to do it, so all to play for still. Sam Wilson just doesn't quite have the legs, does he? But he does have it in the breaking zone. Huge advantage. Oh, it's right up there. Again, forcing Middlehurst into the defensive line, into the chicane. That will compromise his exit. But he has a slight power advantage, as we've seen on the previous laps. Wilson tucking into the slipstream. He's now got the benefit of a two-car tow ahead. It's not going to be enough down the short straight, especially when he's carrying a slight power disadvantage. And yet again, the back marker traffic doesn't fall his way. He gets stuck behind it. Great. Allowing Middlehurst through. Indeed, Greg Thornton in the LDS is the back marker. And Sam Wilson, as we have seen, good through the corners, really good on the brakes. And not so good where the power is counting. And look, Andy Middlehurst stretches the margin again. So over the line, it was three tenths of a second. And now the gap has really gone out once more as they charge through St Mary's. Two and a half minutes to go, two more laps then for the race leader potentially. Sam Wilson throwing everything at this. Now there is a back marker ahead of Andy Middlehurst as they come up towards Lavent. There is Sam Wilson then, the Lotus 2022 with a Ford engine running in that third place. But as he comes out of Lavent again, Middlehurst already clear of the back marker. Now Sam Wilson has to try to make his move in a straight line. He will clear the car that he's passing right now long before the braking zone. That's good because that will allow him to use the strengths of his particular car to their full advantage. We saw in the previous lap he can close at least a car length in that braking zone down at Woodcote. It's not enough for him to mount a challenge into the chicane, but the gap is closing. There doesn't seem to be anybody ahead, so perhaps finally now on this lap, tuck the car into the toe, can't he? He will lose a little bit on this power drag up to turn one, and then he will probably maintain the gap through the two apexes here at Madwick. Middlehurst just pulls out on the flat-out run up to and through Fordwater. So frustrating for Sam Wilson, isn't it? Because we know he's quick, he's proved that. I mean, he, in turn, is six seconds clear of anybody else, but he just can't stay close enough to Andy Middlehurst on the fast sections of the circuit to make a move. A tighter line through Ford Water, heading up to the first part of St Mary's. He's right there now, there's been a drama ahead, a car is off the road, so yellow flag zone was that Andy Middlehurst lifting a bit more for that incident zone. Either way, they are now nose to tail, and does this give Sam Wilson a chance maybe to dive up the inside into Lavard? He goes wider into the first part, can he get the undercut coming through the corner? Trouble is, they're heading for a straight now, aren't they, which might just favour. Andy Middlehurst then in the Lotus 25, the Climax engine car gets away once again. Look, the gap stretches out here. Yeah, but look out for Sam Wilson in the braking zone because this is the closest they've been, I think, down the straight for a few laps. No, I say that, it's, it's extended. There is the power yeah. difference between the two cars. Wilson can close up a little bit on the brakes. He can close up a little more through the apex, which he connects with better than Middlehurst up ahead. Middlehurst still taking a bit of a defensive line into the chicane, not so badly that it will compromise his exit, but time is running out. 18 seconds of the race to go. They do cross the line, they will get another lap. And there's a yellow flag being waved at Madgewick then, so the cars there, you just caught a glimpse of the yellow. Somebody's had a drama there. Meantime, there are plenty more battles ranging on lower down the order, including number eight, Mark Shaw, going through there uh, with his now fifth place to car because he had briefly got himself up past John Milicevic but then drops back behind him so uh, that's seesawing for fifth and sixth places so the leaders go through 10 seconds now Michael O'Brien is clear of the opposition this starting the last lap of the race is for fifth Milicevic back up ahead of Mark Shaw but Michael O'Brien is clear in the race lead and what a drive he's not put a wheel wrong it's been like a dummy qualifying session for him he's just done relentlessly quick laps all the way through to build the gap. He's on his way now down towards Woodcock Corner. 
and the Brabham BT14 then comes down towards Woodcut, but we're not done yet for second place because Andy Middlehurst has got Sam Wilson right up behind him. Can he stay with him to have another late break effort coming down towards Woodcut? We've got the race leader heading to the chequered flag, but again, that gap second to third just stretches on the run down towards Woodcut through the chicane up towards the chequered flag and a race win will come. Michael O'Brien, that's Dan Collins ahead of him, who is going to now go uh, just to start his last lap as Michael O'Brien lifts off, celebrates the race win. He'll be delighted with that, no question. But what about second? Is it going to be Andy Middlehurst who comes up towards the timing line ahead? Yes, it is. And Sam Wilson threw everything at that, but it just was not to be. Absolutely stunning race. Great driving from all of them. I do feel for Sam Wilson. He was absolutely driving the wheels off the little Lotus. He didn't have the legs on the straight. He couldn't close up close enough to take advantage of better handling and a great job by all mainly mike o'brien out yeah. ahead dominant performance oh, just beautifully fantastic. driven yeah i mean this is a guy that races a mclaren gt3 720s normally a british gt and again we've talked about it in the context of other drivers but you know he's a young guy parachuted into this not a car he knows a circuit he doesn't know particularly either and just a brilliant performance that very very impressive indeed well done michael o'brien will be a very proud dad bouncing around the paddock, I would have thought, and there, sadly, a car that was off the road, uh, John Clark, I think it was, that we've lost with the ex Yeoman Credit team Cooper T56. Hopefully, no real damage to that. So, quick look back at the best bits of the Glover Trophy as the cars head to the post-race area. The grid formed in the sunshine, Sam Wilson on the second row, the flag dropping, and as they accelerated away, better start of anybody by John Milicevic from the outside of the front row. Up through the gears, Andy Middlehurst managed to get himself into the race lead with Michael O'Brien in second. Perhaps the start was about the only thing he didn't get right. He dived through coming into St Mary's on the first lap and was then never headed away. He went. Problems, though, early on for Andrew Waring. That car retiring and then Dan Collins getting crowded on the way towards Wood could have this massive spin. One huge laundry bill later, he was able to rejoin the race, finishing in 17th spot as Michael O'Brien came home victorious in the end by eight seconds. Great battles, though, further down. We had John Milicevic battling with Nick Fennell for fourth place. Nick Fennell eventually finding a way through as Milicevic had that moment coming down towards Woodcut. Nick Fennell going through. Sam Wilson caught up to the back of Andy Middlehurst, still with that little haze of smoke out of the back of the Lotus 25. But no matter what Sam tried to do, Andy Middlehurst always had an answer. Great on the brakes was Sam Wilson, but just when you thought he might be in with a chance, there was always a back marker that was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that time and time again went against the challenge of Sam Wilson. Michael O'Brien, though, had no such garners because he was in splendid isolation for the bulk of 20 minutes of the Glamour Trophy to take the chequered flag to win and to give victory to the Alan Bailey-owned Brabham BT14 with its Ford engine, a winning margin of eight seconds. So let's have a look at the results of the Glover Trophy then. It's a race win for Michael O'Brien, eight seconds clear of Andy Middlehurst, Sam Wilson taking third place ahead of Nick Fennell and then John Milicevic. Mark Shaw sixth ahead of Chris Drake with Richard Wilson coming home in eighth spot. Ninth, Andrew Beaumont ahead of Alex Morton. Andrew Willis in 11th from Chris Halliwell and Greg Thornton. Bernardo Hartog's 14th, Ben Stewart Roach and uh, Malcolm Cook coming home in 16th place. Dan Collins, the last finisher. Right, it is uh, going to be our Formula One anniversary demonstration coming up next uh, and uh, we will have a chance to uh, hear from some of the drivers. Tom Clarkson is with Damon Hill. So what goes on in the mind of a racing driver during a race? Well to layman's like most of us we're guessing it's mainly let's go faster, let's go faster, let's go left, let's go right, let's go faster, brake, don't crash. But it turns out there's a whole swathe of other things as well. Take a look.
missing link. Cutting edge technologies are enabling us to understand more about the hidden brilliance of the human body than ever before. These advances mean we can capture, measure and visualise many of the previously invisible workings of the body and the mind, providing us with ever-increasing levels of informative data and intelligent insight, helping us live smarter and plan better for the future. Through pioneering companies such as Randolph's, new technologies are revolutionising diagnostics, offering predictive and preventative health management, while data streams from wearable technologies are being analysed in ever more complex ways. They are providing real-time actionable metrics that can contribute to shaping the ultimate quantified self. The beneficial impact of emerging technologies such as these is far-reaching. For this event, we are going to look at how the vaccination is an extreme sporting excellence. From monitoring stress and emotional responses to training, to focus, mental strength and well-being. Welcome to the future of advanced performance analytics. So what we do at Sensum, starting with regular people, we take them into a driving simulator like this behind me. We strap them up to all kinds of sensors, measuring heart rate, breathing rates, uh, facial expression from a camera, voice analysis from a microphone, and then we put them through various sort of emotional states which try to stimulate those, um, particularly stress. And we use all of that data together to try to understand how they're feeling so while they're in the simulated driving and context. And bringing that forward into a uh, racing environment. We can use things like this. This is our Synthesis Empathic AI engine running on a microcomputer that you can plug straight into your car. And then from that, we can then get this empathic feedback loop, which is basically where the vehicle is able to sense how you're feeling and then respond in an appropriate way. This is empathic technology. Now, while a vehicle such as a racing car has a huge amount of data that we can collect from it, there's not a lot we know about what's actually going on in the mind of the performer in that moment. And if we can understand that, then we can help them to get that optimal state where they get those marginal gains. It could be a fraction of a second. We don't yet know what the optimal user experience is yet, but ultimately, with Synthesis Empathic AI running inside the vehicle, we can use that human data from the occupants to provide an experience that is real-time, personalized, and reactive. Whilst wearable technologies and their data analysis provide immediate and actionable insights, long-term elite athletic performance is determined by a healthy and injury-free career. Dr. Danielle Vance from Randox Laboratories explains the science behind their leading-edge predictive and preventative health diagnostics. Almost 40 years of research and development has culminated in the creation of our disruptive and revolutionary biochip array technology. A unique property of the biochip array technology is that with just one single patient sample, you can receive up to hundreds of biomarker results simultaneously, allowing for a rapid and accurate diagnosis of disease. A vast amount of data is generated at one time from that single patient sample, and that combined with our complex algorithms allows you to help prevent and predict the onset of illness, even before symptoms arise. And a good example of this is our Alzheimer's disease risk test. Not only does this technology enable the rapid and accurate diagnosis of disease, but it is also used for the prevention and prediction of injury and illness. And if you think of the biochip really as a window into the status of one's health at that particular time point, you're receiving multiple biomarker results of that patient. Ready? It's important yep. not to look at those biomarkers individually, but to analyse the relationship of those biomarkers and how that relationship changes over the duration of a person's life, or for example, over the duration of an athlete's career or different time points in their career, for example, pre and post race. The World Health Organization estimates that 80% of all heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes and up to 50% of cancers could be prevented. By routinely tracking the relationship of biomarkers in the blood, it allows you to predict future illness. This way, you can stay in control and take action when appropriate 
to prevent or delay the onset of the illness. Dr. Tony Steffert is a specialist in EEG <laughs> interpretation and neurofeedback and has a degree in design engineering. Today, he is going to help us monitor and decode the brainwaves of Mark Webber. Does being a highly trained racing player lead to different physiological and psychological performance metrics? What we're interested in today in measuring is the electrical activity of the brain, EEG, the brainwaves. You've got somewhere in the region of 86 billion neurons in your brain. One of the things we're interested in is where Mark's brain is on the arousal curve. So what we're trying to do is find this sweet spot of arousal where your performance is best and your arousal matches the task performance. What we might actually see is although Mark is really aroused, his cortex, particularly his frontal cortex, is actually less aroused than usual. I think we'll find an expert racer will really be able to control his prefrontal cortex and decide what he needs to focus on and what he needs to exclude. Well, it doesn't get much better than this. This is Damon Hill with his father's car, Graham Hill's 1964 BRM at Goodwood. Damon, you're about to drive your father's car. I just heard the mechanics running through some of the details. What's it like? Well, it looks, doesn't it look beautiful? Yeah. I mean, it absolutely looks gorgeous. And I think this is the car that my dad was teammates with Jackie Stewart, the BRM. So my dad taught Jackie everything he knew. <laughs> yes, well. well I'm, I think Jackie taught my dad a few things as well. Oh, there's no question about that. And they were just asking about some of the demands that your father had with the gearbox and things. What were they talking about, the mechanics? Yeah, they just told me that my dad insisted on having the gear change on the left-hand side. So that's how you have it on a right-hand drive car in England, isn't it? That's a little bit bizarre. So how many times, mate, have you driven such vehicles around this, this particular track? Well, I, I've driven this before, but it was around Bourne. Uh, obviously, they were, they were made in Lincolnshire yeah. and Bourne. And I did a, a parade in that, so I think I've driven it somewhere before, but I have driven quite a few of the BRMs now. But it's, uh, this is one of the most beautiful ones. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, and, mate, you're fitting there okay? I mean, your dad was pretty tall, because we're, we're men of average height, aren't we, us two? And your dad was pretty tall, so it must be comfy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that they were okay in those days. The Lotuses were a little bit tighter. Uh, and uh, the Lotus 49 is very laid back, so these are they're starting to get towards this, you know, you have... Yeah, you're actually lying on your back looking up at the sky. Well, enjoy it, mate. We'll leave you to it. Okay, okay, cheers. Thank you very much, guys. And one of the things I love is the way Emmo refers to Jackie Stewart as Jack. Mm. Jack Stewart, Jack Stewart. So, so here they are, they're coming out on track and um, <laughs> now yesterday all of the cars were following a safety car and, and anyone who watches the Grand Prix on TV these days will be familiar with racing drivers complaining that the safety car is going too slowly and apparently <laughs> yesterday we're looking at Jonathan Canard in the brawn but apparently yesterday it was Esteban Gutierrez was struggling because the Mercedes kept going into tick over mode really so they're going to go a little bit quicker today which is it's fun for us to watch so uh, there you have the more recent cars within the uh, parade. We were talking about that brawl yesterday. It's the most astonishing story to rescue a team and win a world championship. And it was, we made the point yesterday, but to say it again, it was only on the grid for one season. Yeah, and he, he, he only came and blew the bloody doors off, really, didn't he? It was, it was an extraordinary yeah. event. And it's one of those things where, you know, that could have been the works Honda, couldn't it, of uh 2009 but honda yeah. pulled out in december of the previous year and it showed the confidence didn't it of ross Braun because he could have walked away from that he didn't have to go and pick up the pieces i mean okay there was perhaps that human side to him to try and keep people in a job but he was confident that the tools would be there to, to win a championship to win grand prix and he he was confident enough to go out and form that team or reform the team. david you're absolutely right he knew what they'd been working on the, the 2008 honda uh, wasn't a great car. In fact, I'm being generous to it. It, was a, <laughs> it really wasn't a great car. And so very early on that year, they started focusing on the 2009 car. If I say the words double diffuser to you, they, they reckon they'd found a loophole in the regulations. They knew that they had uh, an incredible car uh, on the pieces of paper in, in the, the CAD computers, and they just wanted to see it 
uh, see the light of day. And then, of course, they did a deal with um, Mercedes to get the power unit, and the rest, as they say, is history. I mean, they had the advantage at the start of the season, and then the opposition caught up. I mean, it wasn't a shoe in by the third quarter of the season. There was a bit of salvaging points and banking points rather than still being able to tip wins. If Jensen Button was a cricketer, he spent a lot of time in the nervous 90s. <laughs> yeah, he really did, yeah. Yeah. because, as you say, <clears throat> they hit the ground running at the start of the year. They didn't have the development budget of Red Bull in particular, who were gunning for them all the way through. And uh, yeah, so by mid-season, Red Bull were right with them, and it was a, it was um, yeah ner nervous 90s. And of course, Jensen then went and um, won the championship in Brazil that year. And I think that the sort of let off of steam was an extraordinary thing. Now go back to 1982. This is the car that Keke Rosberg won the world championship with. In 1983, that's the car that Nelson Piquet uh, won the championship with. The first turbocharged world championship the 1500 cc bmw turbo in that crossover point you have the turbos coming in and becoming better and better pioneered by renault in 77 against the cosworth dfes absolutely right and that is a cosworth deal we keep jumping from one to the other but so that's pedro Piquet, son of nelson Piquet. he's currently racing in formula two that's that's what he's doing uh, at the races, but just wonderful to see him. They are going a bit quicker, aren't they? They are absolutely than, right. Than yesterday, you can see them. You can see them not riding the bumps particularly well. Uh, this, the 2009 Ferrari, won the Belgian Grand Prix that year, but otherwise uh, didn't have a great year. It's been driven uh, this weekend by Mark Genet, who is a great friend of Goodwood. Loves uh, coming here, in fact. Although first time he's driven that car around this circuit um, but just he was really excited because of course he's driven this car up the hill at the festival of speed many times but to actually take it on the racetrack here is, um, is something special as we're now back with the brawn and um ross brawn was telling me in the assembly area actually when we were off camera that um <clears throat> he was not sure about the weather and was he going to come down and um watched the car and he was so excited to be here to see not only his car but to see all of the other cars uh, that were in the assembly area it's a great it's a wonderful collection of cars i have it in my mind that that's a late season livery because i think it, it, it sort of appeared in australia with barely a, a sticker on it you're showing your anorak colors there David. <laughs> but yes it is that's got the uh, a brazilian beer company that's on right it. That's so it. that that's actually it. is the car in the which, season. yeah, in it's which right. which crossed the line in Brazil, and, and they all started singing "We Are the Champions" uh, as he crossed the line. But there's Pedro Piquet in the old man's '83, and look at the flames flying out the back. Such a, an iconic image of that era with the turbos, isn't it? Um, and Pedro, again, for the pen of Gordon Murray, it was a, a simple shape, and it just worked. Now, David, were you listening to me yesterday? Whereabouts did Gordon come up with the idea of refueling? In the bath. Yep, all over it. There you go. I was paying attention, I promise. I promise. Yeah, because we made the point, we, we saw the car, in fact, earlier on in the BMW demonstration, but they happened upon the great idea of run light, go quicker, and then we could make a pit stop and put more fuel in because the time taken for a pit stop we'd have, we'd have gained in the first part of the race, and everyone thought, what on earth are they doing? And then it became Duragur. Well, it did, but it was amazingly um, how slow the other teams were to pick up on it. Yeah. One of the things Gordon says, he thought, oh, no, they're going to be all over this at the next race, but not at all. <laughs> everyone was just sort of, look at those nuts just pitting halfway through the race. Um, was that because they didn't think it was a good idea? They didn't really get the process, or they were a little bit concerned about partly the safety of refueling and maybe the cost of doing it? Uh, no, I don't think it was the latter. I don't think it was to do with safety. It was a different era back then, wasn't it? But True. I think they just thought the math didn't add up. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, they did all uh, follow suit in the end. That, that, was is... in, that was in a period long before safety cars were introduced into Formula One. So if there were an incident, it would only be covered by yellow flags. You wouldn't get the field all bunched up. There wasn't that risk. Absolutely right. Now, one car that didn't refuel is the one in the centre of our picture now. That is the Arrows A11 uh, of Derek Warwick, um, 1989. Uh, good car. His teammate, uh, Eddie Cheever, scored a podium uh, that year. In fact, we've got a lot of Warwick and Cheever cars here this weekend. Not only have we got this Arrows, but there's uh, a Tom Walkinshaw display coming up. And uh, we've got all sorts of... Uh, Le Mans, Jags and all sorts to, to look forward to there. Driven by Cheever and Warwick. There, the Lotus 77, the Antigua Nielsen 
car with the Swedish driver won the Belgian Grand Prix with before sadly he's come to cancer and uh, he's a lost talent and, and uh, achieved a very promising result for college Champions Lotus team and the 77 and then was superseded by the 78 79 which was the 1978 World Championship with the car but this if you like, starting the process to get to that dominant 78 season. Absolutely right. This is when ground effects were first realised by Colin Chapman. Um, so, yes, it started the whole process, but I think I think we're now following the middle car of this trio, the 1991. Yes, we have 1991 McLaren, um, Ayrton Senna's car. And uh, I'm going to repeat a story of yesterday. So anyone who was tuning in yesterday, time to go and get a cup of tea. But... Uh, Zach Brown, who is currently uh, the boss of McLaren Racing, he's in charge of the F1 team there. Fanatical uh, motorsport fan, really, and um, he says that every time he has a spare bit of cash, he buys another car. And as you do, yes. <laughs> as you and I do, David, of course. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and he's bought the uh, Monaco Grand Prix winner from um, 1991, Ayrton Senna's car from that year. Um, and it's an absolute beauty. And as, as Zach says, Ayrton was his man and McLaren is his team. And such an iconic livery, yeah. Yeah. that red and white, isn't yeah. it? Have you asked him how much he paid for it? <laughs> no. Did he tell you? <laughs> I don't think he'd tell me. True. And I think I know it would be an eye-watering sum. Well, like the telephone number. Yeah. Sadly, the chequered flag is out, which means that uh, the reminiscences will continue tomorrow. But uh, it's a brilliant display. And, and hats off to everybody involved in getting this collection of cars here. I know it's only a, a snapshot of Formula 1 over 70 years, but uh, it's massively impressive, isn't it? Awesome. That's the only word I can use, awesome. I love seeing these cars and, you know, I'm amazed, David, at how beefy 27W08 looks. Because they're so big, um, these modern Formula 1 cars. They're so long, they're very wide, they've got the wide front wing on them, they've got the wider uh, Pirelli tyres on them as well, and there's sort of 2009 Ferrari following it in there, and there's the Braun as well. Look tiny by comparison. Yeah. And unfortunately, the, what's happened in recent years is that the weight limit has just gone up and up and up. So that M23 that you've got on the screen there is probably near 500 kilos, whereas the, the modern cars, that, that W08 from 2017, is probably 250 kilos heavier. So um, it's a lot of technology, but heavier too. to be joined here in the studio with two so legends of the sport, five world championships between them. So Jackie Stewart, Emerson, lovely to see you both here. I want to talk about the 1972 season because you guys, you know, that early era of the 70s, you two were the dominant drivers. Um, so Jackie, I'm going to start with you. Emerson arrived in 1970. It was, you know, he, he showed up from Brazil. He's there at the British Grand Prix. Uh, do you remember your first impressions of him? No, not at all. <laughs> I don't remember. What's the name? <laughs> <laughs> no, Emerson arrived like a rocket ship, Watkins Glen, and uh, immediately was right on. Uh, so, unfortunately, I remember him very well. <laughs> <laughs> and Emerson, you, you know, you've mentioned to me before, it was for you a big deal coming racing in Europe. And people like Sir Jackie were your heroes, right? Well, it was, uh, to me, it was like a dream to come true because I remember when I was a teenager, you know, looking, Jack Stewart, they were my idols, uh, Jim Clark. Uh, Jackie went to Brazil three years before to give him a prize as the best driver of the year in Brazil. Oh, yeah. And a few years later, I was racing. Yeah. And I called the monsters of Formula One. You know, it was Jack Stewart, Jochen Rind, Jack Brabham. Danny Hume, I mean, Bruce McLaren. The, to me, they were incredible. And, and for me, it was a dream come true, coming out of Brazil. And, and Jack was very, very tough. Was he I nice mean, to you? Listen, he was he, an incredible driver. Listen, <laughs> he was a, baron, a ballerina then, <laughs> not just now, and not just when he won the World Championship. Walter Hayes of Ford Motor Company had me go down to Rio to present him with the Formula Formula 3, I think it was, Formula obviously. V. Formula V Championship. 
And Walter said, no, we're staying in the Coca-Cabana Hotel. You've got to be there 8 o'clock because Emerson Fittipaldi is coming and we're going to do the presentation. There's going to be television. Two hours later, <laughs> Fittipaldi arrives. <laughs> Typical Brazilian. But every race I was on time. <laughs> so 1971, Jacka, you win your second world championship, your first one driving a Tyrrell for Ken, Ken Tyrrell that year. Yeah. Um, can, what was that like for you to, you know, to, you've obviously got a great relationship with Ken by that stage, but to win the championship in his car for the first time, that must have been pretty special. Yes, I mean, he was a remarkable man. Uh, of course, he picked me up in Formula 3 here at Goodwood. He tested me and then bought me. <laughs> um, he was a terrific man to, to work with. Uh, terrific. And he always had the best mechanics. I mean, uh, you had more mechanical failures than I would have had because the team was so strong of real quality people. I mean, I put it that I'm here today because of them, because I didn't have wheels fall off and all the other things that happened at that time, because when we were racing, it was extremely dangerous. And Emerson, 71 was your first full season, but then you guys seemed to make a leap forward for 72. You won five races, you took three other podiums, obviously your first world championship. What, what was the difference between 71 and 72? Was it the team? Was it yourself? Was it another Colin Chapman magic wand coming across? Can you tell us through? You know, like uh, Jack say about Kentiro, I was so lucky to start racing with Colin Chapman, who to me was a genius of setting up a car. Uh, I remember when in the beginning of 1971 comes the slick tires. We had a, a, a tr tremendous amount of grip and then the suspension was moving. Uh, we lost like the first half of the year. Second half of the year, 71, the car was getting stronger. The suspension uh, with the slick tires. And then by the end of the year, I was very competitive. And then comes, the, you know, the famous John Play special, the, the, the car that was uh, incredible, perfect for 72. And to have a, a world championship year, everything has to be behind you. I had an incredible team. The car was reliable. The car was fast. Uh, one of the toughest races I had was to win was the Austrian Grand Prix in Zeltek. I was behind Jackie most of the time. His car was understeering, and he made me, and my car was oversteering, and he made me so much take a risk on the fast corner at the end of the street. Sometimes I was completely sideways and looking his understeering. I say, how this car is not pushing like Jackie, but <laughs> Jack was an incredible driver. I mean, so what, it was incredible. Was it extra special for you to become the youngest ever world champion at that time, ahead of, and, and to finish with Jackie in second place? Was that extra special for you? Very special, very special. It was a blessing for me. I thank God every day to, to be able to race you know, against Jackie, who was one of my idols, against all, I call always the monsters of Formula One before I come here, and they're incredible drivers. And, and like Jack say, we, there was a tough time because a lot of high risk. We knew that, and, but it was incredible, incredible racing. And Jackie, finally, you got your own back the following year, winning your third yeah. World Championship. Emerson finished second. I think it was an unusually amazing period that. I mean, these years, the 60s and 70s, well, the swinging 60s and 70s, the, the whole atmosphere of the world, you know, everything was just, it was a great time. I have just much. one story that when Jackie was very impressive, he never won, but the Brazilian Grand Prix, the Tiro was handling well at the Brazilian Grand Prix, 1973, the one he was world champion. And he carried his car on the back, he finished, I think, third or fourth, and the car was, able to finish 15 but there was jack stewart driving possible car bumpy track <laughs> that was incredible to watch him was he need, he never won but was incredible performance right listen guys we could literally spend all day but i think uh, we're gonna let let the action on track continue thank you thank, thank you, you.
coming up shortly, guys. A special treat for you. Yours truly will be hopping behind the wheel of the brand new 650 horsepower Porsche 911 Turbo S on the road and on the track. That's coming up after the break. So earlier, Mark and myself, we somehow got accosted and somebody asked us to strap some EEG brain measuring devices around our heads and ask us to drive around the racetrack in a Porsche Taycan Turbo S. Sounds like fun, but there was an element of stress involved. And the idea was to see exactly how stressed or aroused we got behind the wheel of that car to discover whether there were any differences between a normal driver like myself and a professional such as Mark <laughs> Webber. And um, yeah, Mark, I don't know how you felt about that. Were you, were you totally chilled behind the wheel? Well, it was quite interesting. I think some of the findings that we, we come across here, mate, because obviously it's a pretty stressful circuit. It's a really quick car. It's the fastest electric car, that, well, the only electric car that Porsche do, but it's a bit of a weapon, isn't it, in terms of speed and, and, and sort of G-forces that you can generate in the car. Acceleration is very, very aggressive. So look, I, I thoroughly enjoyed First of all, driving the car around there, but also then having this instrumentation and measuring, as you say, all the sort of uh, emotions that we go through in terms of what's in your cognitive function, what's easy to the decision making process and what's quite you know, un difficult in the underlying yeah. process of that. Absolutely. So we're going to bring in Tony now, who is the brain scientist involved with all of this. Tony, I mean, you, you were looking for some kind of brain activity in both of us. I, I, I hope you found some. Yes, we did find some brain activity in both of you. And what, 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 what were the findings behind this? Well, interestingly, with Mark, there wasn't such a difference between the baseline when we were just recording relaxed compared to when you were racing. And he, he remained quite on the positive side of arousal. <laughs> With yourself, you were a bit more anxious and it actually increased a, a lot more whilst you were doing the racing, <laughs> which is kind of obvious, really. So you were saying I was, I was terrified behind the wheel. I didn't want to put it that way. So we've got, we've got some images behind us right now. We've got the, um, uh, the, the racing mind, basically. And the idea is that, you know, that sportsmen and women can use this data that you, you generate in order to discover what it is that makes them feel more stressed out and then perhaps to work with those feelings rather than against them to, to exactly. perform better. Exactly. It's about matching your arousal with the demand of the task. If you've got a really difficult task, you don't want to be too excited, you'll miss lots of detail. Equally, if it's a boring task, you don't want to be too under aroused and then you're just going to make silly mistakes. So, Mark, behind you now on the screen, there's me in the, uh, in the Turbo S. Looking um, good, mate, looking good. Fully, fully in panic mode right now. <laughs> These are my brain cells going out of control. You can see the interleukin-6 and the, uh, the vascular nebula going crazy. And this is you, just relaxed, just chilled out behind the wheel, probably doing, doing your taxes. Getting some groceries, mate. I'm also <laughs> fascinated about, you know, when we take orders, right? Because when we race cars, we have uh, demands from the from the exactly. pits about you know d key strategy decisions. So, what about hearing when it comes to you know making decisions, but also on the background having you know exactly. uh, We've got a hearing. very narrow attention span. So actually, hearing other instructions whilst you're trying to drive will distract you. So potentially in the future, if you can measure EEG in real time, mm. then the the pit crew could see when they could give you yeah. instructions and not give yeah. you instructions and kind of control things that way. Yeah.
mean, it was it was fascinating. I always thought that I was quite relaxed on the wheel because in my job, I kind of have to talk to the camera and communicate with the viewer to let them know what the car's like. But I guess when you're elite like Mark, you're on another level entirely because when you're in F1, Mark, you're thinking about things like your diff settings um, and commu communicating back to the pits to let them know what's happening with, with the car, strategy mm. and all those yeah. things. Yeah. How difficult is that? Well, naturally, you stay very present still, Rory. You've got to stay with the job at hand. Obviously, we have this holistic approach of strategy and outright performance, but in general, we still have to stay very, very current with our own task at hand, which is generally the next corner or the scenario. Of course, you've got tyre tie wear, you've got managing the car and all those types of things. But it's an interesting point that, you know, having a radio communication on the straights, for example, like you can see where the stress is moving up and down in the corners. The brain is so, in essence, in its moment there that you don't want anyone opening the radio. And, look at you, mate. You look, look like you're, you've just done a bank job there. You're, you're, leaving, the, you're leaving the scene of the crime there, uh, that's mate. That's why I'm so stressed. Yeah, stress, stress, stress cool. so that's like two thirds, but you're, you're like flying. literally below a quarter there. So there is actually yeah. a notable difference. Um, the G-forces and the grip of the car literally make no difference to you whatsoever. <laughs> you've been in this situation a million times. So exactly. yeah, incredible that the, you can actually discover all of this simply from your, your, your head movements what's going on in your mind and also your, your pulse. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that was the interesting thing, the difference between what the body was showing. So you're both showing reactivity and, and kind of arousal, but you controlled your breathing, Mark, yeah. and kind of kept the, okay. your brain level, where obviously... <laughs> Look, Tony, what can I learn from this? Looking at all this data, how can I take that away and improve well, myself as a there's driver? There's a few things. In, in the moment, you can learn what's what's good about how to make good decisions but also what's the preparation coming up to it you know should you arouse yourself beforehand some people play loud music or drink lots of coffee other people will know to calm themselves down beforehand so it, it's over the day but also in the moment those are the kind of measurements we can get and also in the corporate world i imagine you could put this in a corporate setting or also you know Absolutely. other sports so Absolutely. so what are your other findings and where do you think this technology will be play its role I mean, just general peak performance training. I mean, sports people are using it a lot, obviously, but corporates are now starting to realize public speaking or just attention, maintaining attention on a task. If you've got a critical task, like uh, shift workers, night shift workers, yep. most industrial accidents yep. are done when people are not in their right when my, circadian phase. When my wife talks to me as well, I should wear one and see <laughs> how the attention span is made. <laughs> <laughs> That's where a lot of my stress comes from. All right, guys, fascinating stuff, Tony. And Mark, interesting to uh, see how we differ. Yep. Right now, I think we should probably throw across to a film I did earlier on the fabulous new Porsche 911 Turbo S. From its humble beginnings in the 60s, the 911 has evolved into the archetypal sports car. Hugely accomplished in all areas, it's the benchmark to which all other sports cars are measured. And today's 911 has inherited every ounce of that legendary status. And this is it. They say it's the fastest, most explosive 911 ever, thanks to an updated 3.7 litre twin turbocharged flat six that makes 650 metric horsepower. It'll do 0 to 62 in 2.7 seconds, 205 miles an hour flat out. And today, I'm gonna take it for a drive in its natural habitat. The thing with the 911 Turbo S is that even though it has a nuclear bomb for an engine, most people are going to be driving it out here on the open road. What you find out almost immediately is that it's so easy to drive. The engine now has bigger variable geometry turbos to reduce turbo lag. You get the exhaust manifold from a GT2 RS. You get bigger wheels and tyres, 20s on the front and 21s on the back an 8-speed PDK gearbox, as well as a few chassis tweaks, including Porsche dynamic chassis control and all-wheel steering. All in all, these are some pretty racy tweaks compared to the previous version and should make this car enormously exciting. But the question I want to ask is, have they made it a little bit too tame? Nope. As soon as you get onto a racetrack, you realize this 911 Turbo S is no joke. Those 650 horsepower, <laughs> it feels conservative, believe me, because the minute you put your foot down, oh, it just takes off. It just takes off. You can definitely feel that weight. 1,600 kilograms, it does struggle ever so slightly to hustle its body through the tighter turns. 
but the 911 Turbo does come with PDCC, Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control. It's got some anti-roll bars controlled by motors, and as you go around the bend, it forces the outside wheel down to help keep the body flat through the bends. What you also notice is that the rear wheel steering system really comes into its own, particularly during those slower corners. It helps the nose tuck itself in with much, much more alacrity than it otherwise might, which is a godsend on a car, quite frankly, as heavy as this. A minute ago, I was out on the public road and it felt like a gentleman's express. It was quiet, it was calm, and then you find yourself out here on the racetrack. It's Jekyll and Hyde, this thing. It genuinely is Jekyll and Hyde. Porsche have done a stunning job, they really have. The fastest ever 911 Turbo S, and also the best ever 911 Turbo S. Bravo. What a sensational piece of kit, Mark. This thing obviously impressed me. I think what I really, really found that it has this amazing duality of character. So on the road, it's tremendous to drive. On the track, it's tremendous to drive. Some cars are, are kind of good on the road, but terrible on track and vice versa. But this thing does it all, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks like you enjoy yourself, mate. Um, that's Porsche, isn't it? Porsche love to have that functionality, love to have the opportunity where people can trust it on the track. If you want to push it to the limits, it's there for you. If you want to, I mean, I wouldn't say my mum would like to drive it. She, she could drive this really, really cruisy, go and get the groceries if she wants. Yeah. Um, but it, it has that personality where you can, the zero to 100 is phenomenal. It's got all the aerodynamic devices on it now, which gives big stability at high speeds. If you do take it to Europe and want to drive really, really quick on the road. Um, so mate, yeah, eighth generation, they just continue to improve and make it absolutely, you know, piece of jewelry. And that's the thing, it's got so many new improvements to it. Um, but they package in things like Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control, where the anti-roll bars effectively keep the car completely flat as you go through corners. You've got the rear wheel steering system, and that adds a lot of weight to the car. I think it's over 1,600 kilos, mm. but generally speaking, you don't really feel it, do you? This car is still really agile. Yeah, it's something they, they really try and keep a big focus on, of course, that everything's got to earn its way on the car in terms of weight you know like i say it's always an offset in terms of the weight there the performance it brings the stability of the car it's got such a big envelope of performance we know that it's also got the rain sensor traction control so you know if the, if the in the wheel arches if it's getting damp on the road and, and the sensors feel that obviously then it'll uh, automatically change the software of the engine to help you have more stability so that's a really phenomenal device inside that and, uh, and the traction control is hard to get right on street cars it really is a challenge and i tell you what these guys have done such a phenomenal job just how smooth that is it's not too heavy on the cutting so yep very very special mate let's put it into context the red car over there jaguar f type r 575 horsepower gt car and then over here we've got the lambo hurricane evo rear wheel drive rear wheel drive was 600 horsepower very different cars i'm gonna ask you which one of the three you'd pick I don't see any other cars here, Rory. <laughs> I mean, the one that's in the middle. What are they? What are you know the Porsches in the middle, mate? You know, 650 horsepower. So you know, top of the pops on power. Unbelievable, zero to 60 or 62 mile an hour, 100 k an hour. So yeah, 2.7. Uh, yeah. the, uh, the 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 F type is like a second slower. That does skids all day long, though. So if I if I'm in the mood for a car that's getting a bit leery, I'm gonna go for the Lambo. But for a car that you drive every <laughs> single day, I'm afraid it has to be the Porsche 911 Turbo S. You're never fast enough. You're always searching for more. You are really addicted to racing. And especially you're not only racing, but you're thinking about the racing 24 hours a day. When it goes really well, ah, uh, I mean, that's a high, right? When you are racing against other drivers, you are confident. I love competition. I love trying to pull the absolute best out of yourself. Or once you reach at uh, a certain level, you know, you just want more and more. Other drivers, they can feel it. They can feel it that they start making mistakes. I remember when I hit my first competitor. I'm the best driver in the world. I'm the number one. I'm going to show to everybody. I mentally prepare for a race by switching off. I start to, to yaw. The nutrition, the sleep, the talking a lot or, or not talking. To bring your body and mind uh, down a little bit if, if you're too excited. I don't prepare at all. The first feeling on driving F1 car was, was a lot different than I'm used to. 
turning the throttle down and just feeling my body just go backwards. You know, I was sort of like, you know, bloody, this is, this is, <laughs> I've got a bit on here. I felt like, oh my God, you know. Yeah, first time driving a Formula One car is a memory I will keep forever as a standout moment. It absolutely blew my mind and completely ruined my neck as well because after about 10 laps, I couldn't hold my head up. It had so much grip. The car, you know, the power was incredible. The brake and the, the, the speed through the corners were probably the most uh, surprising thing. I was sitting on the grid and I thought, this is cool. I'm on the grid in a Formula One Grand Prix with only 26 people on the planet. And still now, every time I get back in on, on Friday morning, you jump in the car, you turn the perimeter off and you just feel that sudden sensation of speed and, and power every time. So. Uh, that's probably one of the, the coolest things. The fastest driver I ever raced against as a teammate was Mika Hakkinen. This guy, he is good. And I am good. Senna, I probably thought I was quick, and then I saw some of the things he did, and I just suddenly thought, crikey, if I don't pull my socks up, he's going to make a, a, an idiot of me. I think speed, just uh, the word itself, means excitement. It is like going into another dimension. When you put everything together, you know, the speed, the car, the best car in the world. Just an assault on your senses in terms of just how fast the car was. A kind of meditative experience. And Sterling Moss had a great phrase, which is, speed is tranquility. And I think I, any racing driver would, would be able to relate to that. Speed is the, the magic part of our business. The thing I love the most about being a racing driver is winning. <laughs> Probably the racing, otherwise I would have been doing it. I guess the main one being I get to drive a Formula One car and that's something I love doing, I love racing. For me, it's fulfilling my dream, living living my, my passion. It's nice being popular. Um, and you get paid to do something you love doing. Um, someone else pays for the repairs. <laughs> I don't know who paid for my repairs, but someone did. I never got a bill. the end of our Jaguar demonstration. Group C Jaguars and the uh, car spanning from 85 up to 1990. Peel off the circuit and uh, there the one that Davey Evans, the American driver, drove in the One Make series for the uh, XJR 16s. 15s I should say, XJR 15s. Uh, Davey Evans who'd gone through British Formula 3 drove for the Silkcat Jaguar team in Group C and uh, sports cars at Le Mans and of course also in IMSA when uh, of course TWR took Jaguar stateside with success as well. There was uh, a recreation of, of the XJR 15 grid almost here last year with uh, lots of the cars being found and the many of the original drivers coming out as well. Quick look back then at the Jaguars on the track. It is a bit like Big Cat Diary, isn't it? Spanning many years of the Jaguar Group C involvement, all the way from the early car from 1985 right up to 1990, heading towards the rule change, which is why as Group C in Europe switched to the more almost Formula One with the roof style Group C sports car. Uh, TWR and Jaguar looked to America for success. The XJR, XJR15, Valentine Lindsay being one of the prime movers behind getting all of these cars back out and uh, circulating once again. Good to see. And more to come shortly. Right, quick break next here at Goodwood.
weekend, it's time for Drift Kana. Now you're probably sat there thinking, what is Drift Kana? It's an all new segment for Goodwood Speed Week. We've been able to mix the disciplines of rally and also drift cars, and now we have this amazing lineup behind me about to take on a brand new course. Now, here's what you need to know about Drift Kana. We've got some rules. Now, you've got to start with your timings. You're going to be timed from when you start the course to the end of the course. But this is the tricky thing. We have sensors placed at different places all the way around the course, which our drivers have to get within a certain proximity of. And if you don't, you're going to get time add added on. Now, also, we have style points. Now, we want these guys to put on a big show for you guys at home. It's all about flamboyance. It's all about precision. It's all about putting on the best tire smoke, the best sideways, and everything to show that they are really king of the course. Well, that's your rules. I have here Dermot sat in the F-Type, who's about to be the first person to experience the Drift Carter course. I'm wondering how he's feeling. Dermot, you've been in a Spitfire. I didn't sign up for this. You didn't sign up for this. We had a nice event chat last night. This is not what it involves. <laughs> but, well, I explained to you last night, you're going to have a bit of a wild ride. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. But I want it like, it's like you said, it's those three principles, yeah? And yes. the speed, style. Speed, style. And the, well, it's, it's a sense of it? right? So you've got to make sure that you hit all of your sensors. What you've got to do is get your proximity. So Nikki, you're in good hands at least. He's going to take you as close to the wall ride as you possibly can. So you need to look out of your window because you're going to be one closest to the wall. I see. Okay. That's, like, that's great advice. Right, wonderful. Can't wait. All righty. Well, Dermot, have a great time. Well, there we go. He's going to be going out in the F-Type. I'm sure he's super excited. He's got that look on his face. You can't really tell with the masks at the moment. It's all in the eyes. Well, I can't wait to get this started. We have some incredible cars in our lineup. You can see here we've got Baxi's R35. Thank you much, very much, Becky. And yes, welcome to Drift Karna. A whole new um, mindset, a whole new design, and a, a brainchild <laughs> created by the guys here at Goodwood. I'm joined in the commentary booth by David Addison. David, you're very excited about this. I can see the anticipation on your face. It's anticipation and it's mystery. Because <laughs> mystery, the, the, I like that. The letters WTF leap to mind because this <laughs> is all new. And all of us, I think, are about to take right? a big step into the unknown. Well, let's take a listen to Dermot as he takes the first ride so, yeah, around uh, this drift kind of course. Well, there's the F-Type R Dynamic, so it should drift. <laughs> so, I am uh, basically... Oh, I'm using the throttle and using the rear-wheel drive of this car to slide it around the corner. Now we're doing the donut around the barrel to get the lights going. Where do I go now, Dermot? Do I go around here? All right, so I'm getting the hang of this. So there's there's a need for tire smoke and there's a need for it's precision. Not, it's so exactly what you're doing and when. Just as a layman, if they can't do that, what do you do right now? So I'm slowing it down. We get on the throttle and then slowing it around. We're trying to trigger the lights so we get extra stars, boys. And we get it for the speed as well. So theoretically. Can anyone do this with a rear-wheel drive car? Theoretically, yeah, with enough power and the rear-wheel drive, you can just use the throttle and it will turn the car for you. Incredible. I hope you enjoyed it. 
Right, so you've got to be sideways. You've got to get tar <laughs> smoke. So it's a bit almost like a rally stage. It's a bit of drifting. It's it's not quite auto testish, I guess, but it's most things all thrown into one, is it's, it? It's a whole host of, of things thrown together, just as you explained. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole dynamic to it. It is a lot of drifting. Uh, it takes up that uh, Jim Carner style. But uh, let's take a look at the map. And this is exactly what these guys have got to do. So here we go. They come off the start line, as we see, down and towards the chicane. Now, this isn't an easy obstacle to drift around because, as you know, David, it's a kidney shape. Yeah. So they pick up a lot of speed, but then they have to scrub a lot of speed to make their way back up the kidney again. So tactics will come into play with this. Do they slow the car down a grip race or do they drift it into the cathedral car park? Donut around the sensors, set the sensors off. That takes time off of their overall time by the gate entrance, do another donut, down into more sensors, and then across the finish line, drift the corner back onto the circuit. Seems easy enough, sounds easy enough for me and you to talk about <laughs> in the commentary booth. But there we go. So there we go, as you can see, our drivers down in the grid, ready to go. And first up is, of course, the mad monster himself, Steve Bagsy Biagione. Right, what are we talking about in terms of the ideal weapon for this? Do you need bags and bags of horsepower or is that a hindrance? No, I think bags and bags of horsepower are going to help you out here. Right, okay. There's a lot of tyre speed, a lot of wheel spin. As you can see, Bagsy straight into that one, no messing around. This is where it gets difficult because, as I explained, you have to slow the car down massively. Bagsy picks up a hell of a lot of wheel speed there as he steps back on the throttle. Now makes his way down. He's looking for a very narrow gate now, a very narrow exit. As you can see, it's not square to the chicane either as David covers his face. Right. <laughs> and then a nice big flick, as you can see, gets the front bumper right on those tire, uh, on those hay bales and then into the proximity sensors. Now, this is where the score starts to get affected. Look at Baxi, absolutely pinned to that wall. Precision from that young man as he now gets into the barrels where he has to set those lights off. Each light is a second off of your overall time. And of course, I am the third judge in all this. So I get to take up to 20 seconds off your overall time. Oh, right, OK. I wonder why you'd arrive with a bulging wallet. Now I know, <laughs> right, OK. Right, so, smoke hangs in the air. Uh, a set of tyres will last you for what? One, one run. One, a, one run. <laughs> silly me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, one run, and then you go into the entrance of Goodwood Motor Circuit here, around a barrel again. No sensor on this barrel. This is just for the show. And then into this. The final sensor pickup. Now there are two sensor proximity sensors. The closer you are, the lights will go off. They won't go off. You can see the lights not flashing. Now drivers have been told they can go around here as many times as they like to set the lights off, but obviously that will affect your overall time or not. So basically trying to set off all of those proximity sensors and across the finish line he goes. And uh, a spectacle finishes as he absolutely decimates the tyres on the back of that Nissan R35 GTR. Yeah, I was going to say, where we are based, we are not exactly a stone's throw from the finish, but I can smell the burning rubber <laughs> from here, can't you? Yeah, and it's a really good, uh, you know, a good atmosphere. It creates such a good, uh, you know, a sense in the area. It, it lights your senses, the smell of tyre smoke and uh, the smell of race fuel. Up next is the one and only James Dean in this 2008 BMW E92 Eurofighter, built by some guys in Latvia and then finished off in Ireland. James Dean doing a very good job of this. A three-time Formula Drift champion, a three-time Driftmasters European champion, makes his way around. And Dean looking very good. Look at that. On the foot brake, controlling the front of that car. Very nice job from James Dean as he makes his way through the gate. And perfectly balanced. And Dean not opting to go as close or as far around as Banksy, and op opted to go for a different route round. So there are options, as long as you set off the sensors, to take those precious seconds off your time. Look how close Dean is to the front of those barrels. That carbon Kevlar E92 BMW looking absolutely stunning as always as Dean fires through. Wow, incredible from James Dean. And this precision driving, look at the close proximity to that barrel as he upships now through in to the final bit. And as you can see at the bottom of the screen, the proximity sector lights. So as James Dean sets those proximity sensors off, they will light up on your screen so the more of those that are lit James Dean has hit and fulfilled <laughs> as our marshals get a face full of smoke there so James Dean finishes up his run in spectacular fashion and the multiple European championship driver joins the back of the grid and we go back to the front it is a Kevin Quinn up next Kevin Quinn in this incredible Nissan 200SX S15 Kevin Quinn known for his flamboyant driving style. 
and he'll be very eager to get off the line. So we're just waiting for my score. There we go. And a time miss sensors zero. Style points, 10 from me. Could have been a little bit more flamboyant. 57 seconds overall for James Dean in that BMW Eurofighter. As I say, Kevin Quinn now sits eagerly away in his first run. Now, he did say to me earlier on in the paddock that he was quite nervous about this because he said he might get lost. So who knows where Kevin Quinn may end up. But he will give it a shot nevertheless as the young Irishman now looks all around. Very, very eager is <laughs> Kevin Quinn to get off the line. He beggy in the background there, just admiring the drivers. Here we go, he gets the Union Jack dropped for Kevin Quinn. As he's going to go for a very good start, really, because he's in there on the foot brake, just trying to get some heat into those back tyres before he does a big flick on the rev limit. It goes Kevin Quinn, nice and wide. And tactical driving for Kevin Quinn. Not too much tyre smoke, looks like he's put quite a lot of grip into this 200SX S15 to try and get the quickest time possible. Almost over, it takes it very, very close to the gate as he comes through. Now, what way does he go? Oh, well, he's going to go the same way that James Dean went, went the opposite direction, but he's missed a few sensors there because you can see the proximity sector at the bottom. Lighting up and missed. Now he gets into the barrel section, throws a lot of angle at it. It's going to slow him down. Create a lot of time. He looks for the flashing lights on the drums of Kevin Quinn. Keep him going. He's just trying to get as many of those proximity sensors lit up. And uh, gets himself lost, almost hits the tyre bow as Kevin Quinn now gets himself into the donut at the motor circuit entrance. Not as close as James Dean, that's going to affect his time. It looks like Kevin Quinn's going for a show run here. More about the show is young Kevin Quinn than he is about winning overall or trying to uh, get the fastest time. As he flies into the final proximity sector. And Kevin Quinn foot to floor, you can hear him really working that three litre straight six turbo. So he's up to 20 is Kevin Quinn. And he's doing very, very well in this part. He just needs to exit before the clock. Picks up too much time and across the line goes Kevin Quinn. And that one very stylish from me. I enjoyed that no end. So where does Kevin Quinn end up after that first run? And one thing to note of these guys, they haven't had a practice on this track. So normally, drifting, you would have a practice session, uh, you would have qualifying. We have none of that here at Driftkarna. We've literally thrown these guys in at the deep end, so they've had no recce. They got a small track walk last night. They had a quick look at where the sensors were, how far away they worked. You can see James Dean still taking the lead on that one and a massive amount of time off of his score. So we move it back to the start line. So this young man is Martin Richards. Now, brief history on this car. This is, in fact, the oldest competing drift chassis in Europe as at the moment. Martin Richards, the former King of Riga, in 2019, comes off the line. We can see an onboard now of exactly what is going on inside the car. Martin Richards really working it. Oh, he throws in a 360. Martin Richards going for the complete show score then as he gets himself back into it. And the car and the cabin now beginning to fill with smoke as Martin Richards Absolutely flying very close to the front bumper to that chicane on the handbrake once again through the gate. You can see how narrow that gate is. We're barely wide enough to get the car through as Martin Richards also goes now into the proximity sector. You can see a light in those as he gets it absolutely pinpoint perfect as Martin Richards. Oh, and he's removed the rear bumper. It looks like Martin Richards shedding body panels off the back of this Nissan at Skyline. And Richards disposing of the rear bumper as he comes round now, down into the donut at the entrance. And now, can Richards beat James Dean as he fires into the final proximity sector? You can see 12 seconds already allotted on his time. Gets nice and close, gets the front one, but absolutely dialed. You can see him on a bit. Oh, and he takes him out. Oh, Martin Richards now starts to make a mess of the circuit as he looks for the exit. Only one he didn't get there. And Martin Richards finishes it off in spectacular style. And there we go. Martin Richards <laughs> rejoins the grid at the back. And our marshals will have to uh, take a brief moment 
to uh, <laughs> repair the circuit after uh, Martin Richards destroyed half of it. So we go one that sensor missing, he gets a time with my style points of 59.053. He will be just underneath second place at the moment for Martin Richards. As we take a brief moment to get our track repaired. There we go, James Dean still leading the time with a very flamboyant run as well. It wasn't, it wasn't um, tactical. He didn't grip the car up. I've, I assumed a lot of these guys um, to grip the car up and maybe put in uh, a, a more of a tactical run, more grip, more straight line. But this young man is so taking a look back at Martin Richards' run. Look at this 360. Perfectly executed. Absolutely perfectly executed. Martin Richards fulfilled all of those outside sensors, and that was where he lost the rear bumper. Just a little tap of that barrier disposed of the rear end of that Nissan Skyline. And Martin Richards, this is where it went wrong for Martin Richards. I'm going to say, if it wasn't for that collision with those proximity sensors, Martin Richards could have pipped James Dean to the top spot. Nevertheless, Martin Richards out there having fun and really getting to grips and enjoying this drift car. Let's take a close up as we see the sensor and the barrel go absolutely flying as Martin Richards rearranges the circuit. So back down on the grid. As soon as we get the all clear from our marshals, we'll be ready to send the next driver who looks like it will be Axel Hildebrand. So a quick repair, as you can see, and we are back up and running, I do believe. So no, it looks like it will be this man, Paul Smith, 2012 former British Drift champion. And Paul Smith in this incredibly well-prepared Toyota GT86, running a 2JZ under the bonnet, 3-litre straight six turbo from a Toyota Supra. Looks like we are getting the thumbs up. I'm just ready to get him off. And Paul Smith was talking tactics earlier with his team, trying to work out the best option. Again, were they going to go for the show or were they going to go for a critical overall time? Smith just awaiting the start line signal and here we go looks like Paul Smith will be off the line and ready to go for his first run at Drift Garner here Goodwood Speed Week 2020 through the sensor he goes oh and he's going to go for a tactical run this is very very clever of Paul Smith he would be watching the live stream on his phone wow very close to the front of that GTX 6 just drops a wheel on the grass that's Paul Smith Makes his way back down the chicane now, looking for that gate. Oh, this is very technical from Smith. He's stopped drifting. He's gripped the car up massively. You can see driving into this proximity centre area now. He's to fulfil all of those. You can see one metre away is how far the rear end of that car needs to be from those proximity sensors to set the light off. Straight in, he's missed one, but he goes back around for a second run to make sure he completely fulfils that sector. Flicks the back end. That GT86 out onto the road and now down into the donut. There's Paul Smith makes his way out into the second sector. This is very fast from Smith at the moment, looking very good. Not many style points. I'm going to be awarded by myself. But this run, nevertheless, technically looking very good. Smith going for the overall time here. Looks to be the overall winner, as you can see, almost. <laughs> straight lines through that barrel looks for the exit as Paul Smith makes his way down gets the checkered flag and across the line he goes and Paul Smith just missing one proximity sensor there and only five points taken off of his style score so where does Paul Smith end up after that run here we go whole time of one minute 14 miss sensors five off 110 for Paul Smith Puts him in third place at the moment. As we still have two more drift cars to go, and then we have some four-wheel drive that are going to make their way out. Up next, it will be Axel Hildbrand. 
as he starts the show straight from the pit lane as Axel in the Sunoco race fuels. Nissan 206S14 powered by Nissan Skyline 2.5 turbo engine. Oh, and Axel, you can see there a lot of steering put. Oh, damn it, the handbrake as he slows the back end of that car down at the top of the, the chicane and slows down massively there. Again, looks like another driver tactical going for a perfect time. Gets a big mistake there, though. Axel's way away from that wall. He's going to have to make his way back around if he wants to completely fulfill it. And you can see how many of those sensors weren't set off from Hildebrand now as he gets into those barrels and looks for the exit straight down into the Goodwood entrance. Makes the front way away, makes the way around that barrel, the front wheel locked up. Starts destroying the tyres on the back of that Nissan 200SX as he gets into the final sector. Hildebrand very fast through there, very close indeed. You can see the lights illuminate as Hildebrand fires that car sideways. He's going to look for the exit. He's going for a very quick time run now. Is Axel Hildebrand finishes up the run. And smokes out the rest of the circuit. So Axel Hildebrand finishing up his run. And again, going back over that one. Looked like a very technical run from Hildebrand. Two missed sensors. 10 style points, 57.46. It was a very fast run there. Second place, almost a contender with James Dean. As Axel kept his cards close to his chest earlier in the paddock, didn't really talk about tactics or setup, but he was going for it. Up next on the line it is George Barkley. Chevrolet 6.2 V8 powered descent. And his X arm out the window for George Barkley. He's going to go for a big show here as well. Oh, and he's completely messed it up. He's gone very, very wide. Almost went onto the grass. George Barkley holds on. Oh, and he's over rotated. Barkley getting a little bit too confident there. He's really going to have to work now to make this one happen. He comes down. You can see the time in the bottom corner of your screen. So he makes his way into the supercar paddock. And George Barkley, very wild driver. How is he going to fare with these proximity sensors, though? As you can see, gets into the drums. He's going to have to make his way back around again. He will know what ones haven't been illuminated by the flashing light on the top. Barkley misses one there as he makes his way out now into the entrance. Very nicely done there from George Barkley. Arm out the window, super confident is this young man. He's feeling very, very good as he comes through the centre circuit. Very nicely done there from George Barkley as he puts foot to floor. He gets the front bumper on there, you can see on the bottom of your screen. Just one miss, doesn't look like he's going to get it. As Barkley looks for the exit and makes his way out of the circuit. Very well done there to George Barkley. And what a show from that young man. So there we go, they are our drifters done and dusted. And it does look like we are going to be moving along to the four-wheel drive category. Once again, George Barkley, arm out the window, tapping the roof. He's very happy with that. Was it a contender for top spot? James Dean currently holding that. One minute 11, one minute 12 after the missed sensors. 57.9, puts George Barkley in third place at the moment. And we move it down to the start line to this young man. As I let David just catch his breath, but James Dean sits there confident, unfazed, unflustered by the rest of the competition. And it is, of course, Rhys Gates, who is the Reece. man that dominated the rally element over the last two nights. And he couldn't work out whether he was going to come here as a rally driver or as a drift car and a driver. And therefore, what did he do with the livery of the car? So he's done one side of each. So the blue and white is for the rally, and the sort of stealth grey there is for Drift Karma. Very good young British rally driver is Reese Gates. Yeah, incredible talent. He came over last night to the Drift Paddock and said, right. if you don't mind, I'm going to move all my setup to the Drift Paddock because I want to hang around with you guys because it looks like lots of fun. What's we want of you? I like you. <laughs> yeah, incredible talent. We've been watching him in the rally stages in the evening. Unbelievable driver. And look at this as he gets that Fiesta R5 absolutely slinging through the donut. And not doing such a bad job at the moment. He's no. going to be having a very quick time, but the proximity sensor is going to hurt his score. Yeah, I was going to say, this is where the, the, the real difference in the discipline comes, because going quickly against the clock, getting sideways, that's all, yeah, something he's very used to. But this, very different indeed. And of course, one of the things you have on rally stages sometimes is a donut. You do one loop around it. Well, 
to get close to it is a bad thing. <laughs> exactly. So this is a, a very different art altogether. So how do you score that? Good, bad, well, or indifferent? I've given him a halfway. I've given right, him a okay. minus 10 because, you know, yeah, there were sections of it that weren't amazing, but okay. it was good. It was it was entertaining for me. It was entertaining for me. So there we go. Miss Sensors, 10 Miss Sensors. He gets 10 star points just because of, you know, what he's doing in that car on this circuit. Not easy. Uh, I do believe someone told me, did Jim Carner grid as well? In 2019, yes, he has done. Yes, so, he has. So, so he knows the, the he knows the basis of it. So there we go. Reese Yates drops himself into fifth place, though not a bad run. Up next, oh, he's thrown in a 360. And this is Manfred Stoll yes. in the all electric rallycross car. I think I'm right in saying. So yep. Manfred Stoll, yeah, in the ERX Ford Fiesta. So four wheel drive and lightning acceleration, but almost <laughs> oh. too much power. Yeah, almost all, too much power, over-rotated massively. Now he's got himself in a bit of a pickle. Got himself lost there, had to work out where he was back on the circuit through the by road. He goes down, down into this. This is a hard part for these guys to fulfill. These outside sensors, you know, the car characteristically doesn't want to drift that wide. And then we go, destroys the outside sensors. Does Manfred Stroll right now. He makes his way round the barrels. You can At least see he missed the barrels. At least he missed the he barrels. He missed the barrels, yeah. He took the rest of the way. That car, his electric cars, David, sound just incredible. Yeah, it's a very different sound we're all having to get used to, isn't it? He certainly is. It's the future for sure. This man for Stroll now makes his way into the final proximity section. It's coming in very, very hot. Not bad job so far. You can see those illuminating, picking them up. It goes very wide. Doesn't look like an easy car to manoeuvre around these barrels, that's no. for sure. Comes from a good motorsport family. His father, Rudy Stoll, was a very successful rally driver. Manfred rallied, then rally crossed, and has been pioneering electric technology within rally cross. So there you go, 100% electric, but what about the score? Was that 100%? Not really, no. Oh, <laughs> Unfortunately, not for me. Manfred Stroll. <laughs> <laughs> I took some off because of just the flamboyancy and the fact that he went out there and gave it 110%. Nevertheless, 1 minute 13 overall. Miss Sensors bumped that up to 1 minute 19. And minus five for myself puts me in seventh place at the moment. But these guys, this is this is extra time for them, David, this weekend, out having some fun, putting on a show here at Goodwood Speed Absolutely. Week. This is the rebellious cousin, Jim uh, Drift Carner, as well. This is a, you know, the naughty cousin that comes around for Sunday dinner. Well, Manfred Stoll, we didn't even see within the rally stage. That's the first activity he has done all weekend. First oh, chance wow. we had a, 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 to see that to order that trick. Fiesta, but um, all that real estate to play with, and he absolutely demolished the course, didn't he? Yeah, he certainly did, yeah, and that's, uh, you can see some um, media guys there just uh, avoiding that. Now, let's uh, try and hear from one or two of the drivers. James Dean, uh, first of all, he's with Becky. Well, guys, that was an interesting start to the course. We've got some of our drivers down here just watching the competition and see how things are starting to stack up. And I thought I'd catch up with James Dean, who's busy watching the screen at the moment because he's trying to see what everyone's up to. James, it's a bit of a job swap. You've got rally car drivers, we've got drift car drivers. What, how are you judging the rally car drivers out there? Yeah, for me, it's really fun because that was our first actual run on the course this weekend. And uh, the car was absolutely really fun to drive. It's totally different to us. Usually we're not judged on time, but we are this weekend, so it's time versus your style points, getting all the proximity sensors, really enjoyable first run out, and uh, I'm excited to get back out there for the second run later. And how do you feel the E92 is reacting to having such close proximity to those sensors? Yeah, so our first run actually worked out better than expected. Uh, we just walked the course earlier this morning, so we never knew what the grip was going to be like, how it was going to feel, but it felt really good out there. I think we have the, I think we have the fastest time, so uh, in general, really enjoyed it. And I uh, can't wait to show some more, more flair in it at the next run and uh, just enjoy the whole experience. Top of the tree, lots of pressure, James. You've got to uh, keep it going. It's all good, we're enjoying it. Thanks so much, James. We're going to move on and have a chat with Bagsy. He's another one who's uh, keeping an eye on the competition. First time out, what did you think? First car up there as well. It's always yeah. hard. Yeah, of course. Yeah, first car out. Uh, yeah, walked the track, obviously, yesterday with James as well. Haven't had a run at it yet, so it's a lot looser out there than I kind of anticipated, but it's a lot of fun. I wasn't really fussed at the time, I just wanted to go out there and lay down a great show for everybody at home. Yeah, for all the people that are watching out there, it's a big car. How do you make it move around those barrels like with so much ease? Yeah, I mean, it's not too bad to you know figure it out once you're on the track, and uh, it was just a lot of fun to throw it around and uh, just make sure you bring it home across the line safely. Really. Brilliant, thanks, Bagsy. Now this is something very different indeed. Born Gittin Jr. in the Ford Mustang Mach-E, an all-electric Ford Mustang. Now, that's almost a contradiction in terms. For most people, Mustangs <laughs> you know, ought to be noisy and grunty and 
Brutal, well it's a brutal car, but it's all electric and Vaughan Gittin is all action. Yeah, it certainly is, and, and Vaughan Gittin Jr. Are, are natural to drift in, competes in the Formula Drift uh, Championship in America. This weekend, uh, got the invite over to drive the all-electric Mackie, and he goes very wide, yeah, has to back out of that one before he removes that front carbon splitter. Driving this car, he said it's absolutely terrifyingly fast. <laughs> <laughs> Which is rather the point, I suspect. Yeah, exactly that, and uh, yeah, as we was mentioning earlier, a quite unusual to see a very silent but yet deadly Mustang we expect one that's fire breathing it's, it's partly silent you've got the whine of the electric motor but also the tar squeal so it's playing habit with my ears I tell you, it's a very <laughs> odd noise indeed that but it's been spectacularly driven how did he score yeah well I took five off you know just for for, for how hard this car is to drive and the size of the slicks that it runs as well yeah. four slicks on their four-wheel drive 126 Gets bumped up and minus five and one a 21 from Vaughan Gittin Jr. was him in ninth place. I do believe, David, that is the end of a drift corner. That is all of our drivers. And there we go. There's the leaderboard. James Dean takes the top spot for the first ever Goodwood Drift Corner event here at Speed Week. We'll be back later on for part two. I'm impressed. I, I'm definitely impressed. Uh, drifting is something that we had last year at an event called the FIA Motorsport Games. That's correct, at, at yes. At and um, it, it's one of those things that uh, was tagged on at the end of the day. And actually, they, they came off really badly because they had the worst of the weather. So when it was dry, they could properly show what the cars were capable of. Then it became so wet in the evenings <laughs> yeah. that it, it, it wasn't about drifting. It was about just trying not to spin, not slide off the road. Um, but it was a real eye-opener for many of us as to exactly what goes on, partly in terms of the driving style that's required yes. and partly in terms of how it runs with when well, you've got the two cars together, one as the lead and one as the chase. Yeah, the tandem. Precision involved. Yeah. Tandem yeah. gets very, very involved, a whole different discipline from solo runs. And yeah, I tuned into that event and watched it live. And it was a, it was a, at the end, it became a strive of the survival. You know, yeah. if you could survive the track, you made it through and you could win the event. And I know a lot of guys struggled. It was very <laughs> difficult weather conditions. There we go. We make it official. James Dean tops the first round of Drift Garner here. Axel Hildbrand takes second. George Barkley takes third. Martin Richards in fourth. Reese Yates mixes the pack up in fifth place. Paul Smith takes sixth. 7th place, Manford Stroll, 8th, Kevin Quinn, and 9th, Vaughan Gittin Jr. in that all-electric Mustang. So as you know, there is an absolute ton going on here at Goodwood Speed Week, but it's not just restricted to the track. Right now, I'm outside the Bonhams Auction House, which is going to be hosting a very exclusive auction. And we got some cheeky early access. So of course, we sent two of our chief troublemakers to go and have a look. Welcome to the Goodwood Speed Week Bonhams Important Collectors Motor Cars and Automobilia Auction. Now, the only thing longer than the title is likely to be the auction itself because there are a lot of interesting things going through here, including over there, the speedboat. It gives the place a feeling of an upmarket edition of Bullseye. But of course, there are cars, lots of really, really nice cars, starting with uh, this. We've got, I've got the post-its out. I've been having a good look round. This really takes my eye. 1953 Bentley R-Type Continental. The thing that makes this car important is the back end, that fast bum there. This is an HJ Mulliner bodied car, and these were special because they were aluminium bodied, not steel. Oh, okay. Uh, and this particular car has extensively been used for historic rally, although you wouldn't know it. Uh, it's no, they've, um, they've buffed out the stone chips quite nicely, haven't they? What I like about this, actually, is that it's rocking a really good pair of steelies. It is. Some very classy uh, steel wheels. I that like is it's nice, steel. isn't it? That's lovely. Have you got a reserve on this or a, yeah, a, a guide? Yeah, 800,000 to a million. Oh, so my goodness. This is an expensive car. Crikey. You don't see the fastbacks very often. No. In the R-Type, so it's a nice thing. Yeah, good. Okay. okay. Um, I wanted to look at this because um, this is a Railton. Yeah. don't hear much about Relton because they don't exist anymore but no, uh, no. the thing that caught my eye about this is it's got a straight eight engine yeah yeah 1936 Railton what Railton did and I didn't know this until quite recently they're a the British company and what they effectively did is brought in um, Hudson cars so American cars and rebodied them and tweaked them around so you always got American chassis and drivetrain so a lot of power um, and talk the red line is at 4,200 revs. Yeah. I'm guessing this is quite a relaxed engine. Oh, this is incredibly low. The thing about a straight eight, it's a gorgeous engine. They don't really make straight eights anymore, but no. the crankshaft is there. 
The crankshaft is this long. The only it doesn't rev high, it's just a torque monster. Because the only thing that's going to have a crank that long apart from a straight eight is, I guess, a, w, a V60, not a W16, yeah. though, because they're you rigid. Anymore, yeah, ever. Unless you've got a BRM. Unless you've got a BRM. But yeah, this is a right hand drive X South African car, and it's a 30 to 50,000 quid. Well, so, you know, for a straight eight, yeah. I, yeah, I love that. Uh, I, also, this, now, you, you kind of, uh, this gives you a mark of what this auction's all about, in that you want to pass this, you go, okay, well, it's a, it's a Fraser Nash, right? Quite a sweet little racing car. Yeah, um, Le Mans replica. It's a Le Mans replica, and it, actually that's a sort of misnomer, because they were called that from the factory. It's not a replica of a Fraser Nash, it's a real deal. Um, but it was driven by Sir Sterling Moss. Yeah, ex Sterling Moss, ex Tony Brooks, ex Roy Salvadori, ex Ken Wharton. It's so been busy. It's been busy. Apparently, the number plate's fairly well known. Yeah, it was. It's been campaigned an awful lot in its time, and I think that's having that race pedigree is what makes these things collectible. Off of the yeah. time, three hundred um, to four hundred thousand pounds is the uh, estimate on this car, rebuilt in the in the two thousands. It looks so good. It's stubby. It's sweet, isn't it? It's ready for action. Uh, now, my friend Lou has got a birthday coming up, and I've been struggling with <laughs> what to buy her. Problem solved. Oh, that number well, plate, go. beautiful, happens to be attached to an Aston DB2 slash 4 from 1953. Um, what's nice about this, apart from that it's nice, is uh, this was one of the very first cars, some say the first, with a hatchback. With a hatchback. So, so it's actually a very practical sports very car. Very practical car, and, and in uh, popularising the hatchback, of course, it sort of it has a place in history. Without this car, there'd be no Austin Metro. So quite <laughs> significant, I suppose. Um, it's PB as well, pre-bond. Pre-bond, yeah. So it's yeah. sort of nice colour too. Yeah. Uh, we got we got Bentleys over here, um, which are all delightful. But I wanted to look at this uh, Lagonda. Yeah. Which has a Bentley connection because this is uh, 1939 Lagonda V12 drop head. V12. Designed by W O Bentley. Yeah. So all W O Bentley who founded the Bentley company uh, when Rolls-Royce sort of bought Bentley and fl apparently fleeced the company WO not very happy ran away um, very clever engineer guy ended up developing the V12 engine for this the biggest qu uh, claim that this car could do is it could be put into top gear at walking pace yeah. and could accelerate to um, terminal velocity without stalling with, with well that's, that's, a, that's a labour saving Function Which right I think there. it's really important, but other than that, it's actually a really pretty car. It's a pretty car, car, but what I like about it is the fact that Bentley left his own company in a fit of peak, went to a rival, the Gonda, designed this. It proves that in car design and motorsport, there is no greater driving force than spite. Oh, no. It won Ford Le Mans in 66, let's be honest. Yeah, spite yeah, yeah. is a very powerful thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another Lagonda there, also very lovely. And yeah. then there's a racing one here, also a V12. Yeah, I'm, I'm which really is nice. down with this car. You see, of course, Back in the 30s, when Lagonda made the V12, this was just before the war. When all of these cars were delivered, like that car was that car was delivered in World War II. Can you imagine taking delivery of that in World War II? And then they only made about 189 V12 Lagondas. This one was modified in the 50s, shorter wheelbase, different bodywork to race. Then We've the got 50s, your Lagonda, sir. Do you know, I've got some other things to worry about at the moment, but yes, leave it on the drive, it'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, that did put pay to Lagonda's V12 dreams, didn't it? Because the war broke out, yeah. so spoiled things. Um, I was going to mention that Rolls-Royce over there, only in as much as that is a pre-war Rolls-Royce. They're beautifully engineered, I think that's well known. Possibly the best engineered cars of their time. Yeah. But in the context of this auction, that is the bargain basement. That has got the low end of the, the, the guide price on it, it's £50,000. 50 where most things seem to be sort of six figures in this area, so that... Um, I'd hesitate yeah. to say cheap at the price, but it is certainly uh, one for the eagle-eyed bargain collector. I suspect cheaper because of the lack of racing pedigree, but anyway, come through here. Come here, cameraman. There's another, Follow me. There's another Rolls-Royce through here. Uh, this one <laughs> was... You love this. I like this because I'm from Cheshire and I like uh, gaudy gold things occasionally, and this is... Uh, it was, uh, they believe, ordered uh, for King Alfonso of Spain, and then was owned by a Maharaja. So it's got some provenance, uh, not racing provenance, so it's really interesting what you say about the, the, the lack of racing pedigree sort of yeah. makes Rolls's a little bit less sought after, or Royce's, and as course, people say. And everything was coach built, so that would have been made to spec oh, yeah. of the original owner. Yeah, you couldn't just get the doors from a scrapyard and put, put new ones on from a similar model. They wouldn't fit, it's no. all hand tailored. I love that. You love this though, don't Listen, you? Listen, we've got to go over to this, guys, because um, honestly, um, 
bizarre about this, and I'm going to, it's actually made in 2016. It's called a mirror oh, racing right. special recreation uh -huh. of an early, like 20s, 30s era Indianapolis car made by a company that makes custom bikes in Salisbury in the UK called Lamb Engineering. And it is so detailed and beautiful. I don't actually care if it even runs because I'd have it in my lounge next to a, <laughs> a comfortable chair and an espresso machine. I um, just think it's gorgeous. We've sort of got to wrap this up. But if you come over here, I just wanted to show you one thing. There's I'm coming, a, Richard. Uh, I'm someone coming. that's cleverer than me and better at maths added up the approximate value of all the cars in this room, and they reckon it's over 20 million pounds worth of cars. But the heavy lifting on that number is done by one single car, and it's this Ferrari 330, 330. which they reckon could go for 1.5 million pounds, which is a lot of money, but then it is it's the best looking Ferrari to jaw droppingly beautiful yeah. car. So, um, fair play if you've got one and a half million pounds, then get this because it's, it's lovely. Uh, on that note, the auction is happening tomorrow, Saturday. They're going to let us back in here to have a look at some slightly newer cars then. But if you want to register for the auction that's happening on Saturday, please remember you must be this rich to take part. <laughs> I want to show you something over here, by the way. Just come and have a look. I've got my post-its out, Rich, and I'm ready. <laughs> Lotus Elite. So, pick a winner out of all of this. Is it going to be all about the big backers here, Sam? Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that the, uh, the T70s seem to have the legs on the GT40s these days. They were a little more evenly matched in years past. Not so much now that the gradual development of all of these cars means the lap times tend to get a little quicker with every few years, and the T70s in particular are now very well driven, very well prepared, very well set up, so all of their potential is being extracted, whereas cars like the GT40 probably have a bit of a glass ceiling in terms of their outright pace potential. So, let us see how this race pans out there. James Cottingham's GT40 nestling on the outside of the second row of the grid. And it's going to be a very spectacular start to the race as well with the uh, Chevrolet Can-Am cars, the early Can-Am cars ready to blast away. Then in a moment, as soon as we get that green flag shown at the back of the grid, that'll be the indication to the officials at the front to get the countdown completed. The five-second board will be shown. Then the Union Jack will be raised when the flag falls. We go racing. Slow start by Sinclair from the middle of the front row. Lots of tires smoke from John Spears, who leaves 11s on the line. And the best go of all was from Mike Whittaker, who will grab the advantage. But round the outside, great recovery by John Spears in the McLaren. He goes ahead of the Lola as they round Magic Corner for the first time. So despite lots of tire smoke, right round the outside, a really brave move to put John Spears into the lead. Yeah, absolutely stunning start from John Spears, just chopped the front nose, didn't he, of Whitaker on the way into Madgwick. Sinclair getting left a little bit behind. Now John Spears going defensive into the first part of St Mary's. He'll be able to cover the left hand inside line into the second part now. That secures his lead, but he's got to do the same. This is the obvious overtaking point, isn't it? This is the run down into Lavin. Is he going to go defensive? No, he leaves the door a little bit open, but gets away with it. It's James Cottingham fourth heading the GT40 battle, as it were, as there to go to the outside line. Ed Thurston, that car had a spin. Oh, whoops, and there's a spin for the leader. It was a spinning qualifying for Thurston, but the leader spins. John Spears off the road. So that absolutely gifts the advantage now to Mike Whitaker. Cold tyres, bags of power. And then the GT40s run absolutely side by side. Gordon Shedden on the inside line. On the outside, James Cottingham. And Flash goes through then. So Gordon Shedden picks up the place, diving into Woodcut. And he gets himself onto the back of Tony Sinclair's T70, the GT40. 40 right into the tail of it virtually. Mike Whittaker getting away, but look at this great battle. Second, third and fourth through the chicane. Yeah, look out for Chris Goodwin behind. He had a very racy opening lap, came out on top. He's now got the job of chasing down James Cottingham, who is right in the slipstream of Shed's GT40. Our pack just fanning out a little bit as they start the first full proper lap. And John Spears then will be trying to get back into contention, but he's got a real fight on his hands. As now Gordon Shedden right onto the tail of Tony Sinclair, going for second place. Does he line up to have a go out of Ford Water, heading up towards the first part of St Mary's? Absolutely crawling all over the back of the Lola there, the GT40, with a slightly tighter line. Can Shedden dive up the inside into the right of St Mary's? A big, big slide from Sinclair that's going to put him off his stride. Oh, Shedden into the back touch. of it, they do touch, and he's done a puncture. The Lola looks as though it may have just gone low on one side. It's off the road, certainly. But just have a look at the right rear corner, that didn't look right to me. Well, the right rear wheel also looks like it's 
leaning outward at the top. So perhaps uh, some kind of suspension failure there causing that. I don't think the contact was the cause. No. I think that was the result. And that impeded the car's pace through the left-hander and out of it. That's St. Mary's as James Cottingham just has a little look up the inside, letting Gordon Shedden ahead know that he is there ready to take advantage of any mistake. Battle lower down as well, that first one on the outside. This was lap one, that was John Spears, the then leader, uh, rotating, trying to get back into the race. Now, now this, did something break to cause the car to go sideways yes. there? Either yep. a tyre went down or something broke. I still think the tyre looks low. Uh, well, you might be right, yeah, it could have been an instant puncture, but whatever it is, happened just in that direction change on the way out of the first part of St Mary's. Very lucky for that not to have happened 50 metres earlier, where the speed would have been much higher and he'd have struggled to keep the car on the black bit. And you can see the little bit of damage picked up on the front of the GT40. Uh, and before you say, oh, touring car drivers, there really wasn't anywhere that Gordon Shedden could no, go no, then. Absolutely not Gordon Shedden's fault at all, neither driver at fault at all. There was clearly some kind of failure, mechanical, mechan mechanical failure or a puncture that, uh, that triggered that. Now we've got the resulting yellow flags, whilst Tony Sinclair's car is just off the driver's right. Out of harm's way, but not so much so that it couldn't be collected by another car spinning through the grass. So yellow flags will remain in place for now. Now, John Spears did lead, remember, until here on the opening lap, lap corner. He is down in 17th place, trying to recover as Ed Thurston fends off Sean Lynn. Uh, this is for sixth place. Ed Thurston goes ahead, but then loses out to pure horsepower in a straight line, so the GT40 canters back ahead. Well, very different ways to achieve a lap time around Goodwood, either with horsepower or with handling. Thurston very much with the latter in his favour. Sean Lynn with horsepower in his. They just navigate their way by Rainer Becker in the Porsche, who was going slowly through Woodcut. We need to keep an eye on him, see if he's nursing problem. So the race leader, Mike Whitaker, is 4.1 seconds to the good now. Gordon Shedden has done the fastest lap of the race up into second position. So let's see what Sheds can do about him. James Cottingham is third. Chris Goodwin is fourth. Mick Fennell's Lotus fifth. Sixth is Sean Lynn. There through is number 72, Richard Cook's GT40, that is currently uh, in ninth place. And the recovering John Spears is in 11th. Now he's 25 seconds down on the leader, but he's carving his way back up through the order. Well, he's going to have to find some pace because the leader is already in to the 23s. But meanwhile, Gordon Shedden behind in the 22s, a 22.6, sorry, 22.7 on that last lap for Gordon Shedden in the GT40. I expect another second or so of pace to come from him. And drama here in replay coming down towards Woodcut Corner. That is Justin Mears who goes off the road, the rear bodywork deforms against the barrier, but uh, Justin Mears is OK, and uh, that car is out of the race. But as he clambers clear, of course, that's going to be another yellow flag zone for the drivers to contend with. So we have a safety car deployed, a safety car, and that's great news for John Spears, because everybody will now bunch up, and that's going to bring him closer in real terms to the race leader. Yeah, that's a sad turn of events for Mears. Just... We saw it earlier on, actually, David, didn't we? If you, if you stick the nose to the inside on the run up to Woodcut Corner, you have to remember that the circuit is about to kink left as some of the drivers, unaware that the safety car has been deployed. Huge lock up there from Chris Goodwin. And the safety car has not picked up the race leader. Now, uh, there is provision under regulations to allow, of course, the cars that should not be behind to go by. So that green light that comes on should be the indication that you can pass. And that is exactly what is happening. That's the new yeah. uh, rule that's been introduced and it's it's done properly when, when drivers know what to do and the lights suggest that you may go past. So that saves this age old problem of having to wait forever to, to, to let cars go by. Uh, so you have the lights flashing, the leader is behind. And so Gordon Shedden, who was four seconds behind, is now about four inches behind the leader. Well, this is where you really hope everybody has read the small print of the driver's briefing notes, because of course this year, this COVID year, we don't have a physical driver's briefing, a sort of classroom assembly as such. We don't have that. <laughs> it's in written notes that are handed out when the drivers sign on, on which they do give clear instructions for how to conduct yourself under a safety car. And mm. the key thing is that if you are waved by, if you're one of the tail enders and you're waved by, you have to carry on having been waved by the safety car. You have to gallop reasonably good speed yes. to navigate your way around the whole lap and catch the back of the train, albeit safely. Mm. The other key thing, and this drives me mad if you happen <laughs> to find yourself behind someone that hasn't read the rules, 
sometimes people think you have to go slowly and there's some kind of speed limit mm -hmm. in place under a safety car but actually the rule is quite different you have to be within a maximum of five car lengths from the car in front. And if the racing has evolved and spread the field out, somebody suddenly is just willingly going around under the safety car, miles and miles behind the pack ahead, and they're unwilling to catch up. You can't overtake because no. it's full yellow flag conditions. Yeah. No, it is a huge frustration. And I think we've had in, for example, GT World Challenge Europe on occasions, the race director saying, people can overtake this slow car because it's, it's spoiling the race. So I'll give you the opportunity to get past and for those of you that know what you're doing to, to catch up. So there was a back marker. I think it was Tim Bailey, wasn't it? Number two with the Lotus 23B. And he now is the one playing catch up. There is John Spears though. He's into the top 10. And from being 22 seconds back, well, he may still not win the race, but he can certainly pick off a whole heap of places when we go racing. So capable, isn't he, John Spears? Fantastic driver. He always ends up at the front and he's unafraid of these big heavy powerful cars although he struggled to get the power down didn't he on that opening lap from the lead out of Lavend we didn't see it happen we saw the aftermath but I expect he just didn't quite have the tyre temperature he needed to deploy all of that horse power mm. and torque lost the back end looped it around no harm done and a hell of a recovery actually to be yep. back up to 10th already fantastic and this safety car for him has come at exactly the right time because life was going to get harder uh, further through the top 10 with quicker cars to pass and indeed gaps having opened up so it's a great shame for Justin Mears with his now damaged uh, Lola T70 Spider, the car that AJ Foyt raced the one that's caused his safety car and it was used in the Paul Newman film uh, winning so it's got a great pedigree but now sadly it's got a big repair bill as well but the tire barrier doing its job stopping the car and uh, Justin Mears we saw clambering free of course the other man to watch on the restart will be Gordon Shedden who is uh, well versed to uh, safety car restarts from his many days in touring car racing whether it's as the leader or the chaser so he's going to be a man to watch and depending on how long the safety car is out for we may of course end up with a slight extra uh, time added on at the end I think we can have up to three minutes or so for each five minutes of safety car usage correct a maximum of two of those yes allowed. yes uh, because the danger is if it's only a, a short 20 minute race you're not going to get this, uh, if it's a long safety car period potentially too many racing laps so the BARC the race on track organizers have that provision in the rules there is John Spears then the man we were discussing having started in third on the grid I mean it was a really brave way to get the lead round the outside of Madwick off the line I mean that took some courage it did and it's interesting that he had the rear grip to do that but he didn't have the rear grip when he needed it a little later <laughs> around the lap coming out of Lavin but no that was a really he got a really strong start as well didn't he as he took his bravery pills this morning, that's for sure. So there is John Spears going through with the uh, McLaren F1B. A lot of wing mirrors on that car, isn't it? Uh. <laughs> I bought for the American market. Carl Haas imported it, ran it in the early Can Am. Yes, he's not excused not to know where he is. <laughs> Keith Arnold's behind in the 4.7 litre Ford engine to Cooper T61. And this is where the incident zone is, so the Safety car brings them down to the right-hander. Of course, here we get a good view of that little jink in the straight, and you can see it's chicane-like in shape, which means that the leading car of a duo that might be battling can maintain the straight line through that little S-shaped wiggle. Meanwhile, the car behind that thinks he's got a run has been slightly blinded by the car ahead because he's close in the slipstream on the gearbox of the car in front. He jinks to the right to pull out and put, an in, put a move up the inside into the braking zone. Unfortunately, the circuit takes away that car's width of space and you find yourself trying to brake on the grass. And you only need to have your front right connected to the grass to lose all stability because you're braking from such high speed that in this grid top speeds of nearly 170 miles an hour we're seeing. Another man to watch, you'll see him going through the shot number one, is Marco Werner, who is currently running the three-time Le Mans winner in eighth place. And uh, he too, I think, could make some progress on the restart. Now, this safety car period, of course, the drivers don't know for how long it is going to be. They might get an idea when they go past the incident zone, but what should they be doing? There is Marco Werner. What should they be doing under the safety car? It's not just have a break, is it? Well, it, it depends really on, on your tyre condition and, and how you feel. I mean, frankly, I'm normally quite grateful for the brake. <laughs> these are quite physical, these cars. But you'll see them weaving left and right, and that's mainly to generate tyre, front tyre temperature, because that's the one that bleeds away most quickly. It's also the front end is the hardest to heat back up. Uh, so if you can just 
loaded up with some weaving left and right, but it's very important that you do it with the front end of the car loaded. So you tend to sort of ride into the brake pedal as you turn to the right and then ride into the throttle as you turn to the left. That'll load up the back end of the car. And then halfway around the lap, you might switch so that you do the other side. But if you just weave left and right, left and right, with no loading on the or the rear, it doesn't really do that. And of course, particularly in this group, it does power these cars. You yeah. simply drop it down into second or even first in a tighter corner out of the chicane or out of Lavin to dump the clutch, light up the rear end. There's your rear tyre will be done in an instant. That's true. The front they need to work hardest at. So they're going through is the uh, Marshall Bailey driven Loda T70 Spider Chevrolet powered, the car that uh, Alberto Maggioli raced in Europe and then it went to New Zealand to uh, have a career out there. It's amazing where people find these and are able to bring them back and uh, it's great to have such a, a lovely representation of the period of these cars here at Goodwood Speed Week. So another lap in the book. We're down to, I'm afraid, six and a half minutes, but we should be able to go green hopefully at the end of this lap. And then, of course, the race officials will, fingers crossed, be able to add on a little bit of uh, bonus time. So Mike Whitaker versus Gordon Shedden. John Spears, yes, the safety car has helped him because he's closed up, but then he wants as much racing time as he can on the other side of it. Their 117 is the T70 Spider, the Chevrolet powered car that Ian Simmons drives, but it was the one that Walt Hankson and Ronnie Buckingham raced uh, in period. And then it had a very successful time racing, gosh, going back, what, probably three decades now, in the early days of um, the Super Sports Cup and uh, in GT races over here with Colin Parry Williams, former rally crosser, the man at the wheel of it. Now keep an eye out for Chris Goodwin in his Lotus 23B on the restart because this will have obviously closed the gap right up. Very experienced driver, Chris Goodwin as mm. well. He'll be lining himself up ready to take full advantage that if he can just stay with the guys ahead, he'll have the lighter, more nimble handling car. He might just be able to pull a move around the outside of one of the first two corners whilst the others are squabbling over each other, perhaps going tight, going in on a defensive inside line which will compromise their apex speed and that is exactly what somebody like Chris Goodwin in the lighter more dynamic car will be looking for. So they're coming down towards the incident zone are we going to be able to go green this time? Yes lights are outlook on the safety car so it's going to be in this time the pace quickens as the safety car lets the field accelerate to try and get everything back up to temperature and also of course tries to get away so it can then dive into the pit lane safely rather than get tangled up with a race car. So here we go, ready to go racing once more into the chicane and we are set to go racing this time. Well, all but the top three have been caught napping there. They should be much closer than they were. The top four now could be closer still, but Gordon Shedden nails it, hoping to get alongside Whitaker under, under the braking into turn one. He's not close enough. That will be perfect for Whitaker because now he can stretch the legs as he comes out of Madwick up towards Fordwater. There was Chris Goodwin keeping a watching brief, but he hasn't got the horsepower of the three cars ahead. James Cottingham, meanwhile, gets a good run out of Madwick, lining himself up through Fordwater on Shedden. And straight away, Chris Goodwin drops back as Cottingham has a go on Shedden. Now, where is John Spears in the background? Is he making any progress? Let's see. He has got Richard Cook behind him, so I think he has gained one place. He's up to ninth. Next target, Marco Werner there with the white and pink crash helmet ahead of him as the three race leaders come over the brow into Lavert then. And Gordon Shedden is staying on the back of Mike Whitaker. So we've got just under six minutes of the race to go. Here they come down towards the Lavert straight and the Woodcut section where the brute force of the Lola Chevrolet, the T70 Spider, should be able to extend the advantage a little. But Gordon Shedden is doing his absolute best. Wiley Campaigner is the Scotsman staying as close as he can. He can possibly break a little bit later in the GT40. Yes, he can look and he brings the gap right down coming into the first apex of Woodcut. Now that short run up towards the chicane. James Cottingham staying there in third place, waiting to see what pans out in front. But now as they make the run up towards the timing line, five minutes on the clock. Again, here in a straight line, the Lola just extends the gap a little. And the lighter car proving a little more powerful as well, or, or a little quicker, should I say, down the straight. Now, this is perfect for James Cottingham. He will be hoping that Whitaker and Shedden get involved with one another, trip each other over, and he'll be watching, waiting, ready to pounce, looking for even half a car's width. Remember racing James many times in GT. 40s he's not afraid to put two wheels on the cars to pull off a move and very good and it is too 
position but, and lining himself up now, yeah. isn't he? Closer than we've seen. I was going to say, if anybody knows how to overtake in the narrowest of gaps, it's a man from the British Touring Car Championship. Three times the champion, Gordon Shedd, and then right onto the back of Mike Whitaker. The gap over the line was half a second, so Mike Whitaker has certainly not got this in his pocket yet. Don't forget, Shedden has also done the fastest lap of the race. And here they come with the Lola D70, again able to now stretch its legs down towards Woodcut. James Cottingham has dropped back a few lengths on this lap, so that takes a little bit of the pressure off Gordon Shedden. He can concentrate purely on what's going on ahead. There's Tim Bailey's Lotus up the road as well, the Lotus 23B that's going to be lapped. Is that going to help Gordon Shedden? Let's see. Up the inside goes Mike Whittaker. Does Flash get by as well? Yep, he does. So through goes Shedden into the chicane, and again, the gap not down enough to allow Shedden a chance to think about challenging. Cottingham is third, but falling away, caught up behind the back marker. That was a disaster for James Cottingham. Really got caught out there by the back marker, who got in the way through the chicane. Meanwhile, the front two managed to pull away. Now, these are both incredibly evenly matched. The pace at the front of the pack has got quicker. A 22-1 the last time from our race leader, Mike Whitaker. Gordon Shedden, though, very close, 22-2. So he's going to really need a mistake from Whitaker in order to get by, because at the moment the pace is too closely matched. Change for sixth, John Spears looked through on the inside line, so uh, he was seventh at the start of the lap, he's now sixth, he's about to become fifth as well, as he's really in Nick Fennell. The uh, Lotus 23B then is about to fall prey to the mighty McLaren, so down it comes towards St Mary's. And John Spears hustles on there to try to gain another place before the end. Three more minutes on the clock. Mike Whitaker doing the fastest lap of the race last time, trying to stretch out that margin over Gordon Shedden. Well, if John Spears keeps going like this, if he can get at least two more laps in before the flag, which I think they will, then he could be on for a podium because he is the third fastest car on track at the moment. And he's absolutely flying. He's certainly got a good half a second or so in hand over Cottingham's GT40 up in third place at the moment. That will be the spot that he will be targeting. So he's fifth at the moment there, John Spears. The next target, Chris Goodwin and he's not going to be able to lunge at the inside of the chicane, but he might be able to saunter by now when all the horses are unleashed on the pit straight as they come up towards the timing line now to put for them. 11 laps in the book. Yep, yeah, easily done, just blasts through. So there is John Spears then up now into fourth place. Chris Goodwin down to fifth. Fennell is sixth. Sean Lynn is seventh. So three places gained on that lap by John Spears, and he's 5.4 seconds behind James Cottingham. Now, the lead gap, six tenths of a second. Two minutes on the clock. Whitaker to Shedden, six tenths. Uh, another hat tip to Gordon Shedden. The way that he is making that GT40 there look, stay in touch with the Lola T70. Very impressive. Really is beautifully set up that car. We were saying earlier in qualifying how poised Gordon Shedden's GT40 looks. Meanwhile, John Spears driving his McLaren beautifully. It's a little bit of vapor there coming out mm. of those trumpets under braking. And it's going to be the last lap this time around, isn't it? Because by the time they get to the line, there will be less than a lap time left in the race. So is John Spears going to be able to get onto terms with James Cottingham? I fear not. What about Gordon Shedden against Mike Whitaker for the race lead? Here they come out of Woodcut down towards the chicane. So flick right, flick left. And Gordon Shedden, again, good through the corners, but where all the horsepower of that T70 counts, Mike Whitaker exploits it to the full, goes over the line with just over a minute of the race to go and the advantage over a second. Yeah, a lot, lot faster, nearly a second faster for Mike Whitaker on that lap, a 121.2. That's the kind of pace we've come to expect of this grid. Gordon Shedden also going a lot quicker, a 121.8, but he doesn't have the legs on Whitaker. So another fastest lap of the race by Mike Whitaker. Gordon Shedden, I fear, is going to have to settle for second place now. Cottingham to Spears was 4.3 seconds, but that's a big ask with a lap to go for John Spears to play catch-up. Lovely shot there of the T70 in the distance on the back part of the circuit, out of Fordwater into St Mary's, and again looking proper period with John Surtees and Graham Hill's names on the side of the team. Surtees, T70 Chevrolet, then the Lola T70 Spider in the hands of Mike Whitaker accelerates out of... Lavin Corner, the auctionman set, it seems, for Whitson Trophy honours. Gordon Shedden chasing for all he is worth, but Whitaker on this lap, going quicker again in the first sector just to try and pull out the margin. There in the background is John Spears. He's not going to catch Cottingham, but not for the want of trying for the last time. Down to Woodcut they come. 
heading to the braking zone. It is going to be a Whitson Trophy win for Mike Whitaker, but Gordon Shedden has driven the wheels off that GT40 behind the car owned by Philip Walker. Up to the chequered flag then, the drone picks up Mike Whitaker, who's about to take the chequered flag. The Whitson Trophy won by Mike Whitaker. Gordon Shedden takes second. And for third place, it will be James Cottingham. Fourth goes the way of John Spears. And then it's a long wait before we get Chris Goodwin through for fifth. And John Spears did the best lap of anybody in the race on the last lap. So that was the commitment, Sam. He was pushing right to the end as Gwyn just bends off Fennel, fifth and sixth. An absolutely stunning lap time from John Spears. A 120.2 goes to show what he could have achieved with just one or two more laps. Kicking himself, no doubt, for the spin. That's Greg Thornton hustling the McKee Chevrolet up towards the line, chased by Keith Arlers, and that was a change on that lap. So Greg Thornton, I think, he's going to come over the line to be the last man through in the top ten. Yes, gets ahead of Keith Arlers just on that last lap. But Mike Whitaker, a very good job indeed, controlling the pace and coming through to score race honours. Now, we all know that car design is massively important. A car's design might improve its performance. Maybe it could be something like this gorgeous AC Cobra along here, or this purpose-built Jaguar racing car. Perhaps even a Ferrari Formula One car. But a car's design can also impact the way we feel. It can be a reflection of our personal style. Maybe like this gorgeous Chevy Corvette C2 Stingray over here. Right now, we're going to take a look at how car design has had an impact on all of our lives coming up right now. Today, we're looking at the democratization of motoring, the cars that brought mobility to the masses and put the world on wheels. We have shortlisted four of the most iconic designs, the Ford Model T, the Land Rover, the Fiat 500, and the Ford Mustang. Your task, gentlemen, is to explore what made them such icons and the impact of these designs that had on the world. What is your opinion on this iconic car, the Ford Model T? This was really the shock of the new. It may look antique to us now, but at the time it must have been cutting edge, it must have been like space travel. It heralded in the industrial age. I mean, in the time of its production, it was responsible for 40% of the cars sold in America. And if you imagine that midway in its evolution, the production line came in. So this was really the birth of the modern age. When you're innovating, you don't have a lot of terms of reference. And it's very easy, I think, from you know, from, from where we sit today, so many of these things seem obvious, um, but they weren't. And I think there, there would have been so many problems that would have required remarkable um, invention and curiosity and, and, and resolve that you're just not, not aware of. On, for example, the production line. When you start to make things in volume, you get into this whole area of, of uh, quality control. Does the Model T inspire you, Mark? Certainly inspires me. Um, you know, I think the um, you know it, it, it's it's sort of banal to discuss the you know the aesthetics or the styling because that simply wasn't probably particularly relevant in the way that it is now. So your design is characterised by organic round shapes. Does the boxy Land Rover offend you? Well, you know, as a Land Rover doesn't offend me at all. In fact, I find, you know, all of the Land Rovers, but starting obviously with the Series 1, um, you know, one of the most iconic modern vehicles. So, you know, I absolutely adore it. I, I find it a really beautiful, a really beautiful car, just because it's so clear. You understand by looking at it immediately what its intention is, what, what it's evolved and what it was designed and developed to do. It's like architecture without architects. Um, it's functional, it's anonymous, and unbelievably, you look at the span of its production, it's 70 years almost. So a remarkable, uh, a remarkable success. Thank you. So we have to move to the Fiat 500, a very, very different car. Johnny, I hear this was the first car you ever drove. What memories do you have? <laughs> um, 
I, I had the, well, I really love this pub. Um, it's, um, it's, I mean, it actually, I mean, it looks, it looks almost like a vacuum forming or a jelly mold, doesn't it? It really, I think it's one of the first very, very intentionally mass produced designs. You get the sense that the design developed and evolved so you could make lots of them. I loved how focused it was in terms of it was great for, um, you know, narrow streets with lots of traffic. Um, and now I, I, I have enormous sort of personal affection and also professional affection. It's the first of a generation of so-called microcars. So it's really doing more with less. It's beautifully petite. It, the, the intensity of the design just makes the simplicity so poetic. That's a beautiful way to summarize it. Mark, what do you think? I think what really fascinates me about this car is how it has gone, uh, how it, it went a very long way to, to sort of describing the Italian uh, aesthetic, which, as we know, in the automotive world was, was so profound. But I look at this car and it, it, it just says, it says Italy to me. Certain objects, certain products really do speak volumes to the place of their creation. They, you know, they, the, the, the Fiat 500 could not have come from anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so, the Ford Mustang. Are you a fan of muscle cars, Lord Foster? I have a bright red Mustang. <laughs> no, um, you don't. In America. Oh. Uh, so, so, and it has this throaty growl of the, of the V8. Um, and as somebody once said, you know, this is a car that looks as, go as though it's going fast when it's stationary. <laughs> so it's the, you know, one of the ultimate exercises in styling. And it's kind of symbolic of the era. This category was this democratization um, of motoring. I, you know, we're, we're talking about the 60s, but it somehow, I think, made the, the American dream, but that sense of liberty possible. And that's why I think it you know, assumed the momentum to, to be somehow identified with a lot of the American dream. I think it represents the, you know, the best of American automotive design, not only of the period, but, but, but you know, ever. Gentlemen, we have to wrap up now. It's been a fascinating discussion. So which design is the most significant? Which one would you choose? Oh, I choose the Model T. It was the car that trailblazed the democratization of, of motoring, without question. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with, with Norman. And um, I think there were so many problems, uh, uh, huge problems that didn't have precedent that were solved to, to, to make this possible. I mean, fundamentally, I agree with uh, both of uh, our other esteemed speakers, although I feel that the, uh, that the Fiat Bambino, um, from a sort of a European perspective, is almost as profound. Thank you so much, guys. So, so we kind of say Model T is the winner here. <laughs> for very capable drivers and race cars to be able to beat the fastest time. Now, Mark, you've been out on track. It's a circuit kept in its original condition. What do they have to look out for? Well, look at this. It looks like a very straightforward circuit, does it? On the back of a fag pack, like I say, it's, it, 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 this is a flat, beautiful piece of uh, you know, timber we have here. The track's not like that. There's a lot of camber. The, the corners are rolling off. To find that the turning points through St. Mary's here, the track is it's got a lot of camber to it. And closing the lap two is extremely difficult down into Woodcote. Big breaking point with a double right hander through the chicane. As you say, we've got a big variation of cars. Um, and what's very, very interesting today, it's quite cold. So the tyre temperatures are never going to be an issue. I think we're going to have a balance between wet weather tyres. Just get the temperature, and the slick tyres aren't easy as we see them going past now in preparation. So. It's not easy, but it's the first time they've done that here at Goodwood. We saw on the time he's on free practice, very, very close to the fastest lap time ever set. Do you think we're going to see that in 
qualifying? Are we going to see the time get beat? I, I think we are going to see the lap record go. Um, I think that the you know, Gordon Shedden was very, very quick yesterday in the Audi. Good all sorts. Look at that, the V8 supercar from Australia, for God's sake. So, I think practice, there was a few guys that didn't, didn't have a smooth run, and now they're looking forward to having a really good crack at it, having known how to handle this shootout as best as possible. What an incredible collection of cars going out here. It's amazing. I think they were looking forward to having um, the, the all-electric VW uh, Pikes P car that Romain Dumas broke the, a lot of lap records around the world in, but he's not here for that. So, um, but it's a great collection and a real good opportunity for a single lap shootout. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Okay, so we've had a little taste of what's to come, a little bit of insight, but before we get underway, we're now gonna go to a quick break. All I'm gonna say is don't go too far as you are not gonna wanna miss this incredible qualifying session. Once upon a time, in beautiful England, Mr. Martin meets a hill called Aston, and could be the universe was created. Handmade, self-built, with sports running through our veins, baptized in the flames of adventure. That's what makes these wings fly. Welcome to the pack, DBX.
Hello and welcome back to Goodwood Speed Week. Now, the Duke has very kindly given us the run of the Goodwood Estate this weekend. And because of the unique circumstances, we're able to do some things that we actually might never be able to do again. Case in point, the epic Speed Week shootout. This is taking place tomorrow at a scale that's never been done before. It is going to be the one to watch. And in fact, strap yourselves in because as you can see, we're now getting ready for qualifying. The shootout is just about ready to go. This is our qualifying session, and the cars coming out first for this one lap dash around the circuit will be the Ferrari's Matt Griffin in the 488 Challenge car, and James Collado in GT3 488. David Addison, Sam Hancock looking down onto the circuit, and we had some great action yesterday, and uh, the first two to go, effectively these demo cars, just illustrating the variants, I suppose, Sam, of a 488. One, the first car designed for a one-mate championship. The other, designed to take on all the best in GT3. Yeah, very much so. The first car, very much customer orientated, but still very capable indeed, as I'm sure <laughs> Matt Griffin is about to demonstrate. Now, you saw that very short run, dear 100 meters or so, from the collecting area up to the start line. That is all they have to try and generate any kind of temperature which basically isn't going to happen and if they do it all bleeds away so what you're looking at are two Ferraris attacking these super fast opening corners of the Goodwood circuit with very little tire grip and probably very cold carbon brakes so the GT3 car in the hands of James Collado the challenge car in the hands of Matt Griffin there it is the challenge which runs in North America in Asia and in Europe, but then there's also a domestic UK series which uh, was launched last year, Lucky Kara winning this year's championship. So Matt Griffin, who'd never been to Goodwood to do any of the events until this weekend, spoke to me on Thursday, said, I'm not really sure what I'm meant to be doing here. Well, what he's doing is going as fast as he can, and as Matt Griffin always does, rising to the occasion. Yeah, and he's really leaning on the car down through the slower corner of Lavent there. You saw a little bit of a twitch from the tail end of it. Same again here at Woodcote. Now that is as much driver-induced deliberately, just trying to feel the car on the circuit, feel the limit, feel the grip available. It's easy to do that in the slow corners. It's helpful to do that in the slow corners. Meanwhile, in the quicker stuff, that's when you've just got to proceed with a little bit of caution, because if you overcook your entry, you overcommit to the speed, there's very little chance of getting that back. So they'll be inching up toward the limit in the quick corners, looking to maximize their pace tomorrow in the final run yeah they get one last qualifying effort tomorrow morning and then the actual shootout final itself uh, tomorrow afternoon so they're good to go is the uh, m ms toyota camry nick padmore will be at the wheel of this car that runs in the euro nascar series so this is the man with the lap record of goodwood he's not going to better it necessarily in this but this is real brute force isn't it it is a nascar style car but running on European circuits, so not necessarily ovals, but road courses, and uh, Nick Padmore making his way up to the line. So the clerk of the course says, here I am, you need to park on this white line, Nick, and he does so. Now, we have to remember that his lap record was set previously in a race, mm. so with a rolling, a rolling approach, as it were, under normal racing speeds to the start of the lap, when the, when the stopwatch begins to count, whereas here they're obviously coming at it from a standing stop, much like the Festival of Speed, yes. which this event is set to evoke. Flag drops and away blast the Toyota, which again would ordinarily have a rolling start, but up through the gears goes Nick Padmore, he blasts away down towards Madrid. So, Sam, talk us around the lap. Well, he's going to be flat out. He's going to try to get over to the left-hand side and get a nice wide open entry, slightly missing deliberately the first apex there at Madgwick. Let the car run a little wider over the crest between the two apexes, try to connect with the second. I don't think he managed to. He's got no, no grip in the tyres, as you can see from the way the car is twitching and ducking and diving through forward water. That will be a test of Nick's nerves because who knows what the limit is there over the crest now teasing the brake pedal on the tricky entry to the first part of St Mary's before the direction change. Braking, turning and downshifting on the way in all at the same time. Normally you have to turn in with your right hand only on the steering wheel, guiding it in toward the apex. Now the tighter, trickier, 90 degree right hand of Lavent, a little bit slower, a downshift required. Now he'll open up the throttle, try to slide the rear of the car using all of that torque, all of that grunt 
to navigate his way down the straight through the kink and let the car run wide, open up the steering before doing a bit of a lane change over to driver's left for the wide entry into Woodcut Corner. You run out of space ever so quickly. Now that's where it's hard to stay on the road, using a little bit of curve, lighting up the rears out of the corner. And he's got to rattle through the chicane, cross the line, end his time lap, and then haul on the brakes quickly now to get back in to the paddock. <laughs> now, Tom Christensen here has been going quicker in the sectors. So the Porsche WSC 95 does a 122.763, and that obliterates Nick Padmore's time by 7.6 seconds. Well, that's quite something, isn't it, from Tom Christensen, because that car really is a priceless piece of history, particularly his yep. personal history. And it's a museum piece prepared by Max de Page as well and looked after by them this weekend. But really nice to see Tom leaning on it a little bit. Now there is 112, which is the Richard Kent Ford Capri, the Cologne Capri, which again had uh, lots of success in the European Touring Car Championship. And indeed Ford ran those cars at Le Mans when uh, the provision was there for touring cars to join the entry to in part boost the number. So Richard Kent now being brought forward. Car that. And the sort of car with which in the very first year in club racing, uh, Vince Woodman and Jonathan Buncombe won each of the eight Thunder Saloon races. Uh, Vince Woodman had the, might actually be that car, uh, had a Cologne Capri and found a home for it many, many years on. So uh, dominated Thunder Saloon ring and then the car was sold on and on to different owners. But uh, back in its original Ford colours, it's not going to be the quickest, but it's going to be a very evocative car nonetheless. And it's only here this weekend to do uh, the shootout. And then behind, Dario Franchitti set to go in the ex Chris Hodgetts, now Craig Davis owned Fortiera RS500. That Capri, the, the so called Cologne Capri, making a great noise. Really nice, isn't it? Now, I'm intrigued to know, David, maybe you know the answer to this. Does the stopwatch begin as the flag drops, or is it just a couple of meters later as they cross the official line? That's because, a very good point. Because that will dictate whether or not your ability to get the car cleanly away from the standing start really matters, or actually it doesn't really matter, you can just cruise away, but so long as you've got a good bit of rolling speed as you go over the line. So this, Dario Franchitti in the Sierra RS500, the sort of car that absolutely dominated in terms of overall wins in the BTCC back in 1989, but of course had great success in uh, European touring car racing as well, and they ran in production saloons successfully for many, many years as well. Dario Franchitti was tempted to drive this yesterday. Looks like he's enjoying himself as well. It's nice to see this session. The driver's just a little bit more familiar with these cars on the circuit today, having had their exploratory lap yesterday. They didn't have much seat time, but there's a noticeable uplift in pace and commitment from the cars that we've seen already, particularly from Dario. As he approaches now down the level straight up towards Woodcut. Love those yellow lights blazing. So evocative, <laughs> fantastic. So Richard Kent Capri is going to come through first, being pursued, as you see, by the Sierra. So there is Dario Franchitti up towards the chicane. Richard Kent does a 1.36 as his time in the Capri, 1 minute 36.762. And what does Dario do? A 28.089, 128.089 for the uh, Indy 500 star. And the clock starts when they cross the line. I'm told. OK. Julie noted. Well, that's great, because that means we've got ever so slightly more representative mm. lap time at the end of it. It's not so heavily influenced by the driver or the car's ability to get off the line with the stand start. Jake hit in a car that should get off the line uh, very effectively. Jake doing what I would have thought we'd be seeing more drivers doing, which is aggressively working the front ends of the car. And I know it's just a short little space that they can play around and try to generate a bit of tight temperature, but you may as well do it because at some point soon, you're about to hit the brakes and try to turn into Magwick from 120 odd miles an hour. So Jake just may seem making the most of that opportunity. You see behind the official there, the little timing beam from TSL. So go through that. Could have done with a few more revs there, yeah. Jakey. Put it down, couldn't the line, he? Held it well, gathered it up, another little dip of the clutch. 
And the BMW here of Pat Blakeney Edwards looks great, very spectacular. Lots of wheel spin, typical Pat Blakeney Edwards as he launches it away, <laughs> fighting the wheel and trying to get up through the gears at the same time. Great stuff. Great stuff. Again, though, not the fastest way, because as you can see, it's went past the little timing beacon, which you rightly pointed out in the background on the grass there. He was still wheel spinning for a good 10 metres past that. Yeah, so that little beam that you just saw behind the uh, official Dorothy Oota, that is where the clock starts. So it's not the normal race timing line. It is a new line, if you like, put in where that timing beam was. So they've got the opportunity to just accelerate slightly and then the clock starts. Tom Christensen then is the fastest so far. Yesterday, the best time was a 118.217. And uh, then Pat Blakey is down in the sectors. But what he's trying to do is go quicker than the time that he set yesterday, which was a 135.096. Can he do it? Well, that exhaust, that side exit exhaust running very low there as a car compressed under body roll, under load through the left hander at St Mary's is fine through the right hander at Lavent. Pat was telling me earlier how much he loves this car, just great fun, and you can see it by the exuberant style behind the wheel. Jake Hill only four tenths of a second down, incidentally, on Tom Christensen. Jake Hill has done his run at 123.190 to go second. So here is the Pat Blakeney Edwards driven BMW diving down then towards the end of the run. Peter Mullen owns this car and I think we'll be pretty impressed with how it is being driven. Pat Blakeney Edwards, always spectacular, loves Goodwood, loves driving anything he can get his hands on, and a 135.151. One, then, is the time. So, again, you can get a car from 1975. It's going to be on a par with a modern touring car or, indeed, a sports prototype racer, but there was a lot of effort put into that lap. Now, where do we head next? Is this the Ford GT, possibly? Which should be Richard Westbrook at the wheel. It is the Ford GT. So, we didn't see this car yesterday. But this is going to be fascinating, isn't it? It's a race car for the road, really, this. It is. I actually think this kind of a car on this kind of a circuit in these circumstances, i.e. where there is a stopwatch and a lot of sort of personal pride at stake, this is quite difficult. They tend to have a huge amount of grip up until the point that they don't. And what I mean by that is in the high speed stuff, mm. you know, if you attack it a little bit too hard, you're likely to be met not with a glorious 1960s style four wheel drift, but with a snap of oversteer, the likes of which Westy is going to need to be on his A game to catch. He knows what to do with the race version, but this is the Ford GT from 2020, the road-going car. There's another, effectively, road car, the Lexus LFA, that Abby Eaton will be behind the wheel of. So you've got a little scrap between these two road-going supercars, if you like, as they now attack the Goodwood Motor Circuit. And Richard Westbrook, absolute best in the first sector. Yeah, he's got loads of rear grip there, but he was struggling for front. You saw the arm full of understeer on the way into Madgwick, but hopefully now... That will be neutralising as he picks up speed, little tease of the brakes, the rear lights flashing as he trails a brake into the first part of St Mary's. Lovely shot this, this long yeah. camera angle, fantastic, tracking the car through the English countryside <laughs> at the back of the circuit. So over the rise towards Lavent, stabbing on and off the brakes then as he turns now into the corner, onto the power, not quite as quick as he would have liked to have been within that second sector. Jake Hill, the absolute best within sector two. But now heading down Lavent straight, speed building all the time. Is this going to eclipse a 122.7 to put Richard Westbrook fastest? Look at the speed in a straight line. He's slightly down in the third sector as well. Yeah, that rear wing flicking up in the braking zone, assisting with the deceleration process. But all of these systems can also be a little bit of a hindrance because sometimes you do need the rear wheels to brake traction. You do need to steer the car on the throttle. But when you've got so much traction control, you end up with a fistful of understeer. Westy crossing the line to go third on a 126.0, still pretty serious. Mm. Yeah, considering that's a road car, effectively. Uh, impressive indeed. This is Abby Eaton with the Lexus. Abby throwing it ooh, almost a bit sideways out of the chicane, catches it up towards the line, a 129.338. Better than yesterday. She did a 31 yesterday, so finding some time overnight. Good effort. I think that was a little illustration, that little wobble she had out of the chicane of the sort of driver versus computer gizmos that a lot of modern cars have today when you're, you're sort of trying to react to what you feel and what you sense coming and then the computer reacts in its own time and in its own way and you're playing this game of cat and mouse really sometimes easier when you're attacking the stopwatch just to turn everything off. Now this is a car that we didn't see 
yesterday. It is Ollie Bryant cocooned inside this very evocative looking Trans Am Ford Mustang GTS. One three Trans Am titles fell to this car with Tommy Kendall at the wheel of it. We've seen it on the hill climb at the Festival of Speed, but it doesn't have a home to race in. But it's going to be interesting to see how it goes in the shootout. Ollie Bryant blasts away. Amazing car, amazing sight and sound as he lights up the rear end. And just caught a little glimpse of the tread pattern on this car at the moment. He's running wets. Quite rightly so, the softer compound will allow the tyre to heat up quicker, that'll give him more grip. Now into the opening turns. Meanwhile, is that Jack Tetley behind? Yeah, in his uh, Chevrolet, kept away. Chevrolet Camaro again from the Euro Wheeland series. Fabulous days of thunder sound, isn't it? Absolutely unique and unmistakable. Right, so Ollie Bryant really enjoying his time behind the wheel of the Trans Am Mustang. And again, kept in its proper livery from the time, from the championship, comes over the brow. The time he's got to beat, still that of Tom Christensen, 122.763. That's Jack Tetley, who was impressive yesterday in the Jerry Marshall Trophy, getting a car home in second place, despite only having fourth gear at the end. Tom Christensen shared it with him. He had second and fourth, but uh, Jack Tetley only had fourth gear at the very end, so it was a real, real problem but they still got second place. Down towards Lavent then, and uh, sorry, down towards Woodcut then comes Ollie Bryant. So personal best, obviously, in the sectors, but is he gonna get to the line before 22-7? I don't think he is, he's to the chicane now. This huge Mustang filling the width of the road. It's gonna be a 24 for Ollie Bryant, 124.488. Cracking effort that cracking effort, although, oh, Jack Tetley just locking the top. A little bit of smoke there wafting out of the back of the car on the way into Woodcut. Gathers it all up for the final corner at the chicane. Using all the road and more. Really fighting the car, but a 127.711 is the time. And that puts Jack Tetley fifth. So those two, the Stars and Stripes Brigade, leave from NASCAR, from Trans Am, leave the circuit. And we get set now for the Ford Mac E. Now, I'm guessing that this is going to be Vaughan Gittin Jr. behind the wheel because he drove it. Yes, there he is. He drove it in the uh, Drift Karna earlier on. That's the most extraordinary sound this car. I was listening to it earlier yeah. on. It's like something from outer space, unlike anything. And then you add in the tire squeal as well as the electric motor. And it's a very odd noise indeed. But Vaughan Gittin Jr. warming up the tires well, at least. Very much so. It was bizarre. It sort of felt like I was transported into a Star Wars film. I had my back <laughs> to the car and I'm thinking, what is that? Is that a jet landing? Or yes. It's just a weird sound. And not like the other electric cars that we've been accustomed to listening to. Not like the Formula E cars, for example. I have to say, I quite liked it. it something eerie and mysterious and exciting. It's very much the sound of the future, I think. Right, so... Let's have a listen to this as it gets underway now. So the car blasts away and the great acceleration of the Mac E takes it into Magwick and there is that oh so distinctive engine, no, not engine note, motor note plus the tyres. So punch off the line, didn't it? Just pure instant traction and acceleration. Oh, big, big lose for Gavin Kershaw. Has he hung on to it? He has. That is the save of the day. Wow. Full points. 10 out of 10 for Style and Recovery. Oh. That was very well held. Especially to gather it up when it reached its maximum your angle on the grass. That was brilliant. Well done, Gavin. So Vaughan Gittin Jr. with the best of anybody in the first sector whistles his way up towards the end of the run. Hundred and twenty-two miles an hour through the speed trap on the long back straight. And what's the time going to be? A twenty-four point eight then for Vaughan Gittin Jr. That was much, much quicker 
when the car went yesterday. It was in the 29s yesterday. And after that big, big moment, Gavin Kershaw then in the Lotus heads up towards the line. He did a 28.451 yesterday, and today Gavin Kershaw does a 131.627. Definitely lost a second or three, didn't he, to that moment? All right, Sam, talk us through this, please. Quite big commitment on the way in, huge entry speed, just loses the rear as the corner tightens. He needed to add a little touch of steering input, but the rear was saying, nope, thanks very much, I've done my work, I'm not having any more of this gives up and he got out of the throttle let the steering go into full opposite lock and then managed to gather it up astonishingly so on the grass actually that was really well done so this is going to be richard mines with the jaguar xjr9 so you're heading to the group c era now up to the line he comes car running as they did for many races with the enclosed rear wheels to try and help the aero of the car Made the pit stops easy, but it helped the aero on track. That was the thinking. Tony Southgate designed car. And Richard Mines accelerates away. Marco Werner's Lotus looks like it's the car behind as they accelerate off then now into Madrid. Well, I was just thinking the same thing. Yes, we took the words. I have to say, I don't mind the variety. It's fun to have these wild differences from a very quiet electric car with its own unique characteristic to the sound but so long as we can still enjoy this that's the key yeah. if you make everything too quiet we're gonna sense the loss very soon marco vanna in the x gunner nielsen lotus 77 1976 car also on track uh, didn't see it run yesterday yesterday one of two cars that we did see yesterday have not ventured out today but hopefully they will be on track tomorrow but it looks like tom christensen is going to end today's shootout as the fastest richard verner sorry lighting up the timing yeah. screens fastest through sector one and uh in sector two as well so i'm just going to say he looks absolutely committed out there uh, yes if anybody wants to beat tom christensen it's another le mans winner isn't it so marco <laughs> verner only the three to tom's nine wins richard mines though has just done the absolute best within the third sector of the four so richard pushing on in the jaguar as he gets a little bit more confident of course these cars with a reasonable amount of aero and uh, plenty of downforce coming into the chicane is richard mines then so what is the time going to be he did a 27.9 yesterday today at 124.165 look out very good Werner now coming through yeah. the chicane he did a fastest overall third sector full commitment through the chicane a 117.961 beats Tom Christensen by gulp, 4.8 seconds. Brilliant effort. And is that the lap record? It is. It's better than the 118, so it's the fastest ever lap around the Goodwood Motor Circuit. 117.961 for Marco Werner. That's brave. That's great stuff. And in a car of that vintage as well. It feels fitting, doesn't it, actually, that it's not one of the modern cars, although there's plenty to come, of course, but so far there's a... And if a car was going to take the record, then that's a great one to have done so. And can they go faster tomorrow? Well, we're not done yet because Tom Ingram, four times a race winner this year in the British Touring Car Championship, is coming up to the line. This is the Toyota Gazoo Racing UK with Ginster's Toyota Corolla. And Tom's still in the hunt to win this year's championship. In fact, it's becoming a four-way fight between him, Dan Camish, Colin Turkington and Ash Sutton. This car... Uh, built last year for the BTCC run this year and Tingram accelerates away front wheel drive to turbo behind you've got Rick Wood in the Holden Commodore well, let's have a quick look at Tom Ingram then at work came out of Ginetta Junior Racing through the Ginetta Super Cup into the BTCC and uh, been runner up in the past Rick Wood gets away in the Holden Racing Team colours it's not an HRT car per se, it was built by Walkinshaw Racing in Australia, and Aaron Noonan, the great Australian V8 supercar guru, any chassis that's ever been built, Noonan's will tell you the history thereof, he professes it to be a Rick Kelly 2008 Holden Special Vehicles dealer team Commodore, built and run by the Walkinshaws, this car had a big shunt with Paul Radisic on board that year uh, at the top of the mountain in 08, David Reynolds took it over, it was one of the Bundaberg red Walkinshaw cars. Andy Prio drove it in the endurance races and then it went to Andrew Thompson and then to Brad Jones Racing for Carl Reindler and uh, Fabian Coulthard, David Coulthard's uh, cousin. 
Now, this is Tom Ingram, and how is he getting on in terms of a time? Yesterday, he did a 127.4, and Rick Wood did a 26 yesterday. So the uh, Toyota provisionally is going to be ninth if it can just get ahead of Dario Franchitti in the Sierra RS500. Into the chicane comes Tom Ingram, the car run by Speedworks Motorsport. The Cheshire-based touring car and GT team up towards the line. The flag is there, and it's a 127.646. Actually, slightly down by a couple of tenths on yesterday. And Rick Wood, then with the Holden, coming up towards the line. He did a 26.078 yesterday, and today it is a 24.783. So go really nicely. Amazing to see, wasn't it, how much roll that car had and the inside front, which has got loads of negative camber anyway, just leaning over so much under load. There's Max Gerardo with that glorious V10 engine to Lara. It's a James Cottingham's car, isn't it? Proper Le Mans LMP1 racer. Max just riding the brake on off, on off with the left foot on that little blast up to the chicane, desperately trying to get just a bit of temperature into those pads and discs before the off. Now, a rare opportunity in a sports car to light up the rear end from a standing start. That's not what these cars are designed to do. They're short of leaving after a pit stop, otherwise it's a rolling start, isn't yeah. it? But you're quite right, a standing start straight into competition is a rare opportunity. What noise! You're in heaven, aren't you? I don't want to talk, I just want to listen. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh. Echoing all around the Goodwood Motor Circuit. Matt Gerardo, and he's fully committed to this. He spent the other part of the weekend in his Lancia Strato, so he goes for cars that make a great noise, clearly. Uh, and so in the Delara SP1 LMP, a 2001 built car through St. Mary's. And again, the, the shootout here bringing cars that you'd never expect to see in competition at Goodwood. No, and I raced against this car in period. I was desperate to try and blag a seat, so I never, <laughs> never succeeded. And Actually, it was one of those cars that sounds so good that when you're fa fighting for position, actually, if you're stuck behind it, it's not the worst place to be because the soundtrack is that enjoyable. It's just magic and looks resplendent in this PlayStation station livery. I really think yeah. it's one of the prettiest open-top prototypes of that era. I agree with that. Yes, very so. And the time it's got to try to beat is a 117. It's not quite going to happen, but not for the ones of trying from Max Girardo. Lots of commitment put in here as he comes up towards the line. So what is the time going to be? A 22.165. So he does go quicker than Tom Christensen. That's something to tell everybody about in the pub, isn't it? So Max Girardo goes second. Marco Werner's time of 117.961, though still mighty impressive. The fastest ever lap around here. But can we go even quicker than that come Sunday in the shootout itself? just see a slightly higher ride height on that Delara from that side profile shot and it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of those kind of cars have been just had their ride height lifted a little bit specifically for this run at Goodwood. Goodwood obviously a very undulating circuit but also a relatively bumpy circuit compared to the modern billiard table smooth F1 type mm. venues that uh, things like Le Mans prototypes were largely racing on. So from the Escuderia Montjuic, Gary Pearson in the Ferrari 512M up to the line. He's next to go. Yesterday he did a 124.281. What did he do today? What a noise that car makes. Totally different sound, but again, a, a proper, proper sports car noise. Unmistakable, isn't it? 12 cylinders. Now, what would you rather have, that noise or the Judd V10? Oh, don't put me on the spot like that, <laughs> David. Come on, that's hard. <laughs> I'd probably say it's actually because you can't, yeah. you can't beat that. I mean, it's like a, a time machine just listening to the thing, isn't it? Gary yeah. Pearson really pushing on, isn't he? Out of four water. He knows his way around here so well and prepares for any of these cars that he races or competes in. So, very at home behind the wheel. Great to have this car here. And Gary Pearson, he's giving it a real workover. Yeah, these cars, I've driven a couple of these in testing, mm -hmm. and they're, 
they're okay in the corners, but man alive, when you put your power, when you put the power down on the straights that they come around, I honestly felt by the time I'd opened the throttle from zero to full throttle, I'd inhaled the whole straight <laughs> ahead of me. I it was trying to brake again. <laughs> Huge amounts of power. Well, Gary Pearson might not be the quickest, but he's certainly trying hard. And you can see the commitment as he flicks the car in. I mean, this isn't just an easy lap round the circuit. The effort being put in is absolutely total. Turns right, turns left, out of the chicane, skims the wall up towards the line. A 21.839. That was good going. Yeah, he worked for that, didn't he? Really close to the left hand apex wall of the chicane. He was in the 124s yesterday and a 121 today. So. Yeah, Gary's trying, that's for sure. Oh, fantastic attack from Gary Pearson. Beautiful to see a car like that driven so hard. Yeah. It's also interesting to see how many of the teams and drivers from the other races have now congregated on top of the pits to watch all of this. Well, because they can sense it coming alive. They know that this is the second run of yeah. the shootout. Everyone's just confidence. Sorry, everybody's confidence just rising a little bit. Greg Thornton with the Salia De Angelis Lotus 91. So this is a 1982 car, the car that won the 1982 Austrian Grand Prix, if you remember the almost photo finish just on the line beating Keke Rosberg. Flag drops, Greg Thornton rockets away. That was a good start actually, good reaction to the drop of the flag from Thornton. So heads into Madwick. See from the time how far forward the driver sat under the regulations of the period very almost nose heavy car with the uh, driver position very far forward between the front wheels almost yeah of course that wasn't only to distribute the weight in as balanced a way as possible but it was to increase the ability or to increase the side of the the size of the tunnels underneath the car get the driver forward get those tunnels opening earlier Lengthen the side pods, get as much ground effect as possible, sucking the car down into the ground. Cosworth DFE era from 1982. It's coming to its end because the turbocharged by that stage uh, Renaults and soon to be Ferraris were, were getting quicker and quicker all the time, but it was still when the DFEs were capable of winning outright, winning the bulk of the races in that period. So Greg Thornton then comes into Woodcut for the first element, now the second. Really pushing, full arms, a handful of offset lock there, out of Woodcut from Craig Thornton, gathers it up in time for the run out of the chicane to the line, and he goes second fastest overall on a 121.7. Really good, that. So, Grand Prix Lotuses, 1-2, Marco Werner in the older of the two, but he is the top from Greg Thornton. But we aren't quite done yet, because out next will be the McLaren M20 the ex and Mars car of Lucas Halusa. And this yesterday was third fastest. It did a 190.4. If he did that today, it would still be good enough to be second. Well, Lucas has turned into a tremendous driver and a lot of confidence. He's very new to this car, actually, but he, I was speaking to him yesterday after his first run. He feels right at home in it. Has done from his first ever laps not so long ago, a few months ago. He made a little bit of a mistake, he was telling me, on the brakes down into Woodcut. He's going to look to make up for that today. Nearly dropped the revs a bit too much off the line there. That won't affect the time because the beacon is just a few metres later, by which time he will have been up and running. Another wet tyre shod car. Softer compound of the wets. Tough enough to last for this one hot lap, but soft enough to warm up nice and quickly. So the M23 taking you back to 1976. So the same vintage effectively as the car that's fastest, Marco Werner. And he is slightly down, but only look by three thousandths there in sector two. This is going to be close. So he did uh, an absolute best in sector two. What can he do now against Marco Werner in the third sector? If he is really brave, if he does not make a mistake in that last part of the lap like he did yesterday as Sam was just explaining this could be on let's see sector three 61.3 was the target time to get to that point is he going to be able to go faster he's almost at the end of lap and straight clock ticks on down and is he quicker is he slower he is slower by three tenths of a second so it looks as though Marco Werner is going to do it but this could also be another very very good time indeed can he get into the 18s let's see out of the chicane 
Lucas Alusa accelerates up towards the flag. He is in the 18 to 118.392 for Lucas Alusa. That is a good effort to go second. Very much so. Very smooth lap. Very calm at the wheel. Not overexcited at all. Just smooth and graceful around the lap. And the stopwatch endorses that with an 18.3. He'll be gutted to miss out on the fastest time so far by just four tenths. But that was a really nice lap from Lucas. Now, when you're Tom Christensen, you can have another go. You can have another car. Uh, and so he drives this Audi R8. This is the GT2. It debuted at the Festival of Speed last year. And uh, will come now up towards the line. So he's already had a go in the Porsche. And a 122.7 was the time. So this aimed at the customer, both as a road car, but then as a easy to go racing with user friendly idea. The new GT2 regulation pioneered by the Stefan Rattel organization. We've not yet had it in race form because of the COVID related dramas to calendars and to entries this year. But the intention is to have more of this type and Porsche have an equivalent car as well to bring the customer with an easy to run, easy to drive car onto the circuits. It does look easy to drive as well. I yeah. Mean, not taking anything away. It just looks really well mannered, doesn't it? Exactly. It just sits there. Yeah. This is the sort of plug and play GT car for the customer, isn't it? It does exactly what you want it to do. It gives you the confidence, has the stability, has the grip and just eats up the tarmac here. So Tom Christensen. Noticeably for something that is so customer orientated and if I understood you correctly, sort of road legal also or road usable, mm. it's not got that traditional bucket of understeer that you see in other road cars that are sort of track worthy. It's true. It seems to have a nice balance to it. Very strong front end. So it's going to be down on the top times, but where is this going to put it? Let's see. A 17.9 is good. Anything in the 19s, 20s would put him into the top three. A 20, a 21, 22.208 for Tom Christensen. And that means sixth. Perfectly driven through the chicane there. Nicely rotated on the way in and through the direction change. Super close to the wall, considering yeah. it's a very wide car and he's probably quite low down and far back in that cockpit makes it very difficult to judge where the edge of the road is. So you look at, is that Harry King? It is. Uh, uh, That's one way to get some tyre temperature. Harry King, I tell you, is an absolute little star. He has come into Carrera Cup GB this year and viewing figures have shot up because of the way he races. Um, he has just been fantastic. We have a semi-reverse grid for the second race and on occasions he's had problems that have put him further back on the grid. He's about to blast away, and you'll see why I say he's an exciting driver in a moment. He came from 10th on the grid at Knock Hill to win. People say he can't overtake around Knock Hill in a Carrera Cup car because there isn't the room. Harry King disagrees. He's a very exciting driver to watch. He's a very modest, unassuming character, and he's got a great future ahead of him, I think, hopefully with Porsche in GT cars. And you're about to see why I say all of this, uh, because Ooh. there, he's absolutely <laughs> on the edge, right from the get-go here. And Harry King, he's never raced here. He's only done a, a few laps on Thursday, and now these shootout laps. But the commitment, Sam, is absolutely 100%. Well, positively drifting out of Ford Water there, a little ride of the <laughs> inside curve into St Mary's. <laughs> Trailing the brake in, steering from the rear <laughs> through the left-hander. You're right. I mean, you don't normally see a Carrera Cup car driven like this. This is spectacular stuff from Harry King. Fascinated to see what the stopwatch has got to say about it. Fastest oh. sector time so far, in fact, for King. This could be an absolute flyer. Absolutely. 400 and something horsepower, I think, being deployed now down the drain. Yeah. King absolutely on a mission. He's not leaving an inch to spare, is he? 485 brake horsepower. 4-litre engine, effectively, and a 117.9 to B. I'm not necessarily convinced it's going to happen, but he's way up the curve. He's throwing everything at this. Harry King then comes into the chicane, goes right, goes left, accelerates up towards the line. What's the time going to be? It is a 118.210. Wow. He goes wow. second wow. fastest. <laughs> brilliant, wow. Harry, brilliant. Hat tip, Harry <laughs> King. That was sensational. And in a car that I wouldn't have expected to be quite so spectacular to watch. And certainly not as quick as it has proven to be just now against the kind of competition that makes up the leaderboard. You're going to watch Carrera Cup GB next time, aren't you? Just for Harry King. Uh, th this is the car that was fastest yesterday. Gordon Shedd was at the wheel yesterday of the GT3. Uh, spec Audi R8 LMS. So something else that Flash gets into 
I think any time you stand still, somebody gives him another car to drive. Just leaps from one to another, doesn't he? So, wow, he's going to have to go some to get ahead of Harry King. That was some lap. Well, when you consider that Marco Werner is the guy who sits on this sort of provisional pole, if you want to call yeah. it that, just two tenths ahead, and he managed to do that at the wheel of a 1970s Formula 1 car. And Marco was on it as well. He was oh. visibly committed to his lap. So these are representative times we're getting now. And this shootout concept is really coming into its own. Yeah, it's going to be great to watch, isn't it, tomorrow when we get to the final itself. So the fastest ever lap around Goodwood has now been set. That Marco Werner, 117.961. What can Gordon Shedden do as the... Audi R8 in its nerve ring 24 hour colours howls its way uh, up towards the approach of St Mary's out of forward water now and Gordon Shedden slightly down in that second sector. Yep, not quite got the poise has it so far but he's not too far off. Shed picking up speed as he heads down into Lavent. Car looking nice and stable isn't it? Loads of aero grip on these cars. Not a tremendous amount of horsepower. Very high cornering speeds. Lots of gizmos to help in the braking zone that he's approaching now. So down towards Woodcut comes the car in the hands of Gordon Shedden. Turns into the double apex right of Woodcut then. So the fastest time in the shootout thus far. Marco Venner is a 117.961, it's not going to be quite quick enough, it's going to be a 119.363. Gordon Shedden goes fourth fastest in the shootout. My word, that is a brave marshal, is <laughs> standing right there in the middle of the track, beckoning the drivers to slow down and turn a hard right back into the paddock. So our shootout completed, our chance to have one look at the... One more car indeed has been found, the car that didn't go yesterday, so we have the... Uh, arrows in the hands of Nick Padmore then, the car making its way up towards the line. The shootout almost at an end. It's a one lap blast around the Goodwood Motor Circuit. A standing start, four sectors to the lap, and it is effectively a qualifying lap, if you like. The fastest you can go around the circuit away blasts the Exteric Warwick arrows and accelerates now up through the gears. Away blasts the arrows again. Period Formula One car, brilliant noise. Now let's see whether this can go faster than a 117.961. Well, this is the one I've been waiting for. I was absolutely heartbroken to see the car stricken and not participate yesterday. They had fuel vaporization issues and Padster is fully committed. I didn't hear a lift there, did you, David, on the no, way down through Ford Water? Rarely have I been quite so jealous of a colleague. This is fantastic <laughs> stuff. I love the livery on this car. I love this era of Formula One car. The proportions just work. The wide tyres, the wide track, the clean, minimalist aero, no flick ups. The car's ever so pretty. And this is one of the most memorable with its livery and body shape. Pads are absolutely wringing its neck on the run down to Goodwood. We did the absolute best of anybody thus far in the first sector. Let's see what the lap time is going to be. We'll get the time at the end of the run then. So Nick Padmore twitches the car through Woodcut up towards the chicane. A 117.961 is the time to beat and up towards the line. He comes. The lap time the run will get in a moment, but it he is the it. fastest. A 1 minute 9.914. Nine, Eight seconds quicker than anybody else. Wow. That is insane. The fastest ever lap of anything around Goodwood with an official clock on it 69.9 seconds Nick Padmore has obliterated his own lap record and then some wow 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 take your hats off everybody all hell Nick Padmore wow the king reigns supreme if anyone's gonna want to hang on to their own lap record it was Nick and that was an emphatic performance eight seconds to the good Crikey. well done Padster that awesome. is amazing, isn't it? Awesome job. <laughs> what a little start. So Nick Padmore is the fastest at the end of the shootout and fastest by <laughs> eight seconds. Amazing stuff. And uh, we will have more action from Goodwood very shortly. Harry 
heartbreaking with uh, Nick Padmore just coming up in the background there. It was set an epic time, but so did you in this car. That was incredible. The whole paddock was watching you out there. Yeah, it was a, a real thrill to be, you know, pounding around Goodwood in a, in a Porsche 911 GT3 cup car. Um, yeah, my first time at the circuit. I have never been here before, so that was in fact probably my eighth or ninth lap around here. So, yeah, really pushing the limits, you know, awesome bit of fun. And uh, yeah, at the event is so cool here and, uh, you know, I'd love to come back. Just this track, you know, kept in its, you know, original condition. What was it like sort of pushing the limits out there on that shootout? Yeah, of course, I've been brought up with, you know, circuits with a lot of extra runoff and everything. And, you know, to go back to an old school track with the basics, big curbs, very little runoff, it was a, yeah, a real challenge. And, you know, I love it. You know, the, the paddock has got this awesome theme to it. And, yeah, a, a, real, a real cool place to be. And to be the third quickest with two Formula One cars in front of you, you'll take that? I certainly will take that, yeah. Um, you know, I think, yeah, it's the best we could have managed out there. And, yeah, a, a real cool, fun uh, a day out for, for me as a Porsche Junior. Thanks so much. Thank you. Oh, ho, ho. woo! That was incredible. What a session. The fastest ever lap recorded on that track. And if that hasn't got you psyched for tomorrow's shootout, I don't know what will, to be honest. Uh, so look, there's loads of cars out there that will be remembered for years and years to come. But it does take two to tango, and quite often it's the drivers who are also making a huge impact. My first racing hero was Wynn Percy. He was a touring car racer and I aspired to be as good as him. Well, I don't think it comes as any surprise that my racing hero was my dad. Well, I think my father was my inspiration to, to get into racing. He'd race carts when he was a teenager. He was Scottish karting champion. Definitely Ayrton Senna was uh, uh, the, the hero, you know, of everybody, especially in Brazil. Alan Prost, actually, on four wheels, it was uh, it was the professor. So my racing hero, uh, since I was around four or five years old, was Valentino Rossi. I'd say Prost was someone I admired because he was very smooth in his driving style, and I guess I always tried to be more like that. Michael Schumacher, and, and I was racing, he was never my teammate, luckily, uh, but I was racing against him many, many years, uh, and, and uh, Following his way of working, not only driving, his technique, his tactics, uh, but the way he's working, he was just not giving up. The one that had really, really captured my imagination was uh, Alberto Scari, who was a uh, current world champion in the mid 50s. And then later on, uh, my, my racing hero would have been Nigel Mansell. When I, when I decided I want to be a racing driver, I kind of looked at Nigel and thought, well, here's a guy who's fighting against all the odds, and he, he found that it seemed like he was getting a difficult time from the, his own supporters, from his, the British press. And I was like, why are they not behind Nigel? So despite all that, Nigel, you know, won. And um, so he became my hero. I think Goodwood is like a fantastic uh, event. You know, uh, people is really loving, you know, to be there, to watch the cars. It's just absolutely the best event, I tell you. It's definitely a bucket list for everyone. It's wall-to-wall -wall action on the track. You know, you, you never see the track quiet. There's always something going around it. There is a social side to our sport. We've all had different, sometimes different experience, sometimes our paths are crossed. Goodwood definitely gives you the chance to catch up with old friends and enemies, actually, and maybe you think, well, they're not so bad after all, and go and have a right old ding-dong battle out on the track. So a favourite memory from Goodwood uh, would be the members meeting last year, uh, driving the IWC Mercedes Goldwing, and because that car was quicker than everyone else in the race, I was able to come in first. And it was the first time our 11-year-old son, Dayton, has seen me win a race. So it kind of brings everyone together from every part of the world, every, um, every category, every team. When would I ever get to meet uh, the, the, the NASCAR drivers or the IndyCar drivers, you know, no, in normal circumstances. Have me there as soon as possible. Whew, we've had a lot of action already. I think we need to take a little break, catch our breath. When we return, though, we'll be seeing more incredible action from some top machinery, perhaps of a different sort, though, but still the same amount of excitement. Plus, I've got a little brain teaser for you before we go, and I will reveal the answer after the break.
and on row two of the grid, Andre Lotter versus Andrew Jordan. So this is going to be uh, a lively race indeed. And up to the line come the last couple of cars. Now, uh, having a look at all of this from a slightly different uh, point of view is uh, another Goodwood hero, Nick Swift, who is uh, perhaps looking forward to being out there rather than having to watch these cars, Nick. But uh, this promises to be a very competitive race, doesn't it? Exactly, David. This is uh, probably the most frightening thing that I think I can do, sit here and uh, watch these guys go around in uh, our own cars. So, but really exciting. Now, where's the Mini going to be stronger around here? Because I guess with all the nice fast elements of Goodwood, the big bangers are going to have uh, plenty of room to stretch their legs. Absolutely. I mean, their only place we can make up is really on the corners, the fast blowing corners of, of Goodwood, Matchwick, but also through the chicane. You know, we're pretty good through the chicane. So we are almost set to go racing. Before we do, though, let's uh, hear from Mark Blundell, who is on the third row of the grid and talked earlier to Tom Clarkson. So next up, it is the St. Mary's. It's going to be one of the most lay races we've got all weekend. It's for saloon cars from 60 to 66, and you've got a massive array of cars. Now, you might recognize this guy, Mark Blundell. He's driven all sorts in his career. Uh, Formula One cars, Indy cars, and now, well, Mark, what are you driving in this race? I'm driving a Lotus Cortina. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's a little bit too twitchy for my liking, but uh, I'm used to cars with downforce, and of course, this has got no downforce whatsoever. Well, you gave it some yesterday, uh, qualifying eighth. I mean, what is it like to drive around Goodwood? Oh, it's just a, a thrilling circuit. Um, it's got its challenges, as we all know, several corners, you need to be committed, and no margin for error. If it goes wrong, it normally goes wrong in a big way. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're blessed with the weather. Uh, seems like Goodwood again have pulled it out of the hat and uh, we've got some quality drivers and quality cars. Well, have a great time, Mark. Good luck. Thank you. So, Steve Blomqvist then, the man on position. Mark Blundell will start on the outside of the third row of the grid as you see the Lotus Cortinas uh, amongst the sort of homologation specials, if you like, against the Cooper S's uh, making their way getting warmth into the tyres up towards the grid. This is the grid, Stig Blomqvist, Sam Tordoff and Nick Manassian on row one, ahead of Andre Lotter, Andrew Jordan alongside, then Tom Christensen, Colin Turkington and Mark Blundell share the third ahead of Rob Huff and Emmanuel Pirro. Behind them, there's Marino Franchitti lining up alongside Alex Brundle and uh, Richard Meaden in the Mini Countryman, ahead of Neil Yarney and Gordon Shedden. David Brabham, Cortina mounted alongside Michael Cullen and Tim Harvey. Karun Chandok comes next with Anthony Reid alongside. Uh, then it is uh, Stuart Graham with Paul O'Neill in the Dodge Dart. Guy oh. Smith's Cortina next, and one car pulling off. We'll come to that in a moment. The grid completed by Ross Hyatt and Rowan Atkinson with the Baccaro, Jochen Maas, uh, then Richard Atwood and Tiff Needell. And who do we lose from the grid? Looks like it's 83, Andre Lotterer, who would have been fourth, but that Galaxy with a problem and sadly ain't going to take the start of the race. There are also one or two other cars that were having a bit of grief uh, this morning in the uh, qualifying session for the second part. But Nick Swift, that's a big shame. Andre Lotterer, problems on this formation lap. Yes, that certainly is. And, and it looked like I saw the team last night, they were working very hard and actually changed the engine overnight. Oh, so right. it's a real shame to see them guys pull off now. Now, where is the best of the minis in all of this? More to the point, where, where are your customers? Where's your car? <laughs> well, our car's in the capable hands of young Alex Brundle, who is doing a splendid job. Um, but uh, Mr. Huff um, is the first mini uh, in the Padmore car. Yes. Um, so he's, yeah, he's really had that flying this morning. So up to the line they come. Yeah, Rob Huff in this car that's entered by Lee Dale who comes from a good mini racing family himself. Uh, yesterday, Whisper It, in the Jerry Marshall Trophy race, um, the mini you shared with Andrew Jordan had an early problem. What was all that about? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the most ridiculous thing, literally one tooth off of a gear gets then pushed out the bottom of the gearbox casing. Right. Uh, oil everywhere, it's a disaster. So Andrew Jordan starting on the second row of the grid here, having not really got into the car yesterday, but a, a different car, admittedly the Mini, not the Cortina now, uh, we're talking about cars of a different period, but he's eager to go racing, that is for sure. And Tom Christensen is sadly missing from the third row of the grid because that was the Alfa Romeo damaged in the second qualifying session earlier on in the day. So uh, a couple of gaps on the grid, but this is going to be a very lively 20.
20-minute race indeed. Hold on to your hats. Part one of the St Mary's Trophy for the pre-66 touring cars. Flag falls, away they go, lots of wheel spin. The Grunt and Go Galaxy is then rocket away from the front of the grid. And uh, Sam Tordoff it is that makes the best start of all as they go into Magic for the first time. Andrew Jordan's up to third at the expense of Nicola Manassi on Mark Blundell. They're going around the outside. Number 27 getting all sideways as Cortinas are what to do. But they're all facing just about, Nick, in the right direction. Absolutely, they got away, DC. Andrew really having a look up the inside, but now the big V8 show their speed. The problem is the V8s are in a straight line, but they've got to throw the anchor out so early that the Cortina, wait for the approach of St Mary's, he's going to close the gap right down. Stig Longfist then goes into the lead of the race, the 1984 World Rally Champion, 72 years of age, leads, and here comes Andrew Jordan right round the outside. He's going to run out of road, is he? No millimetre perfect. He's up into second place, on board with him now. Fantastic stuff. That was unbelievable. You could see that with the two cars uh, literally fighting with each other. Andrew could Sneak it up the inside. That's low. So he's got the inside line for Lavin. He's got his nose in front. He's got the race lead. Brilliant stuff. AJ goes first there. Andrew Jordan leads, but here come the Galaxies. Blomqvist tries to go one side, torn off the other. That's all about horsepower, isn't it? Down to second goes Jordan, and he's about to go down to four because they all come streaming past. Oh. This is all about power. He's third, but he can break later. He's back up the inside of Benassio. Look, the Galaxies are absolutely side by side. That's like two battleships being side by side. And that's never going to work into the chicane. Torn off goes wide, and Blomqvist will lead into the chicane. What a lap. Unbelievable. You can, see, you can see the pain that Andrew's going through there. <laughs> Rob Huff coming up very well in the mini, but Andrew was boxed in, nowhere to go. He must be going mad. So these two aircraft carriers, they're leading the way. Uh, it is Stig Blomqvist up front, Sam Tordoff second. This is Andrew Jordan's view. Look at the work being put in here as he goes into Magic, and he's right on the back of Tordoff now. That's it. Can, you can think you can get a toe off of that great big battleship, as you say, but they, once they get the hammer down, they're gone. And so now Nicola Manassion tries to go round the outside, but Andrew breaks, if at all, much later going through Ford Water, so he's got back on the inside line, back into third place, heading up now towards St Mary's. Another Cortina fight is developing nicely. Colin Turkington, number 23, ahead of Mark Blundell. Jordan to the inside, lots of up, twirling to avoid contact. That was close. That was very close. I would say there's no room there, Andrew, but he had a good look. Now, Andrew Jordan, Goodwood's track tester, knows this place like the back of his hand, and that Cortina is one that the Jordan Racing Team has built for customer Pete Chambers, so Andrew knows the car got a mini bouncing oh, off. Is that your mini going that, off? I think that might have been. I'm oh, not yeah. quite sure what's happened there. <laughs> uh, no, it's not mine. I think that was the uh, the Metcalf car, Willow One, the old Swift Dune car. Right, so a uh, big sigh of relief if it was the Medcalf car. That was Tim Harvey, wasn't it, at the wheel? Yeah, uh, it could have been. I can't see. The problem is they look identical. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my world. Uh, right, on board with Andrew Jordan then. Coming out of Woodkid still sawing away at the wheel, down the gear into the chicane. Now, it's only a 20 minute race, this, but the uh, amount of abuse that Blomquist and Tordoff and Manassion are giving the brakes on their big American Yank tanks, so is that going to be a problem towards the end of the race or not? I think so. As you say, yeah. that with the 20 minutes, uh, they, they should get away with it, but that is always the, uh, the, the, the hunting ground that we have in the last five minutes of the race. Well, Stig Blomquist leads and he's done the fastest lap, but there's a great little battle developing now because Andrew Jordan is being caught by Colin Turkington, his former BTCC teammate at BMW. And also by Mark Blundell. And then Rob Huff, who I don't think has braked for the last five minutes in the mini, is almost up there with them as well now, going great guns in the background. Gordon Shannon is eighth, Tim Harvey is ninth, and then in tenth place, Marino Frank Kitty. It's quite a roll call of drivers, this. Back on board with Jordan. Just talk us around the lap, Nick. Okay, so at this point, you know, looking from the underpowered car to the BA, you know, you've really got to get coming into Levant now. He's really got to get that power on earlier, and he'll probably try and sneak it up the inside. Here he goes. Uh, but you know, it's it's it's, it's, it's a it's a fruitless task, really. You can't, there's nothing you can do. They get the hammer down and they're gone. But the the problem he's got now is he's compromised his exit. So Turkington could be right up behind him. So down they come, then in towards Woodcut, the Cortinas together. The one snaking under breaking is that of Mark Blundell in the background. And you see they all concertina onto the back there of Nicola Manassion in the uh, Studebaker Lark Daytona 500, the uh, American and Australian marketed car. But up front, Steve Blomquist leads the way, heading over the timing line. The rally fraternity delighted to point out that 
uh, septuagenarian Blomqvist showed all the touring car drivers how to do this in qualifying yesterday, but Steve Blomqvist irrepressible, and he loves rear-wheel drive cars. He wasn't really at home in front-wheel drive machinery. No, exactly, and it is right up Stig Street, you know, look, at he's, it, he might even be breaking into a smile at this point, you never know. Steady on, there's a long way to go, yeah? Uh, so, Blomqvist leading, Sam Tordoff, though, second, has done the fastest lap of the race, back on board with Andrew Jordan, absolutely flat through Ford Water, up towards St Mary's, Colin Turkington has got his Cortina dancing as he tries to fend off Mark Blundell there. Oh, yeah. And you can see now what's going to happen is it's, this is playing into Huffy's hands because mm. the two Cortinas are really sort of bunching each other up a bit more now. So the minis are coming into play and Shedden coming along in the Jason Stanley car as well after it. Change for the lead is imminent. Look, Tordoff manages to find Acres up the inside, so his Galaxy takes over the lead. Sam Tordoff, runner-up in the British Touring Car Championship, goes ahead of Stig Blomqvist, but Stig will try to fight back on the run down towards Woodcut and Andrew Jordan versus Colin Turkington. Now, that is a battle that we've had many a time in the BTCC, and it's coming to Goodwood Speed Week here as well. Then behind them is Mark Blundell, but AJ, for the moment, keeps Colin Turkington at bay. Colin still fighting for this year's British Touring Car title to try and make it five but we have a new race leader Sam Tordoff has hit the front now can he get away do you think from Stig Blomqvist in second place I think he looks like he's he's coming Stig Stig is not going to let him get away with this is he he's going to get me he's going to have a second wind at it uh, and he, I, I think the two are going to now just work away and they're going to be gone whereas the Cortinas still busy squabbling and Sam Tordoff I suspect he's going to be able to, now he's got into the race lead, think about looking after the machinery because he's a savvy driver, is Sam Tordoff, so he's not going to be abusing the brakes, is he? He's going to want to race win and work towards that goal now. No, exactly. You know, but then Stig can't run, rule out Stig. You know, he, he's going to run that without any brakes, any, any tyres, anything. He's going to still be giving it all he's got. Again, it's just brilliant, the things that Goodwood provides, isn't it? This roll call, Sam Tordoff versus Stig Blomqvist for the race lead in pre-66 touring cars. And Stig is fighting back, isn't he? He did, you see him coming in there with a big arm full of oversteer. You know, he's, he will not be letting this go, that's for sure. And Andrew Jordan is back up the inside of Nicola Manassian, so the fruitless task is on again, because having got alongside, he just waves Nick goodbye, doesn't he? As yeah. the Studebaker romps away the straight line. Exactly, I've felt that pain many a time. <laughs> right, for the race lead, they're side by side again. Sam Tordoff on the inside line, just trims the lawn there, coming down towards Woodcut, but right with him again is Stig Blomqvist. Now, Stig watched these cars being raced many, many years ago, always wanted to race one, and now he gets his ambition, but he wants to win in one as well. Battle pack on for third place. And what about the minis? Together they turn there with uh, Rob Huff just ahead of Gordon Shedden, who has just been out in the shootout in a GT3 Audi, and now he's put into a Mini Cooper. Absolutely, and yeah, Shedden has really come along, come alive now. He's really starting to grip to grips with it. He's gone uh, a few handful of tenths quicker than the 32.4, which is pretty impressive. Um, so yeah, he's really getting a bit between his teeth now. And so is Stig Blomqvist. He's back up the inside of Sam Tordoff. Goes for the race lead. Sam puts two wheels on the grass, and Stig Blomqvist retakes the lead. Lap six in this 20-minute race. And not only have we had a change for the lead, but Nicola Manassian has suddenly got back at the party, bringing Andrew Jordan with him. Now, Tordoff, having lost the lead, has lost a little bit of time. Does he have a problem, I wonder? And certainly, look, they're all concertinering for the lead. Yeah, it's, it's looking interesting. I think, Sam, maybe we're looking this now that you can see the brakes are starting to wear out. We've got to remember, we're all on the same compound rubber. So it could be a mini or it could be this ton and a half of American muscle, but we all have the same rubber with the same compound. Back on board with Andrew Jordan. He ideally needs the Yank Tanks to trip over one another up front, doesn't he, really, to bring him back into the mix. He's still busy defending from Colin Turkington, and then Mark Blundell as they drop once more into Woodcut, but now it's definitely three for the lead, and it's Real Americana up front, isn't it? Blomqvist and Tordoff in the Galaxies, then the Studebaker in third place of Nicolas Manassian. Out of the chicane they come, and of course there, where they have to break early, so Jordan of the Cortina pack close up as well. Almost at the halfway point, Stig Blomqvist. He's done the fastest lap of the race, and he's back into the race lead. Now, can he hang on to it? That's the next question. Yeah, well, he's, he looks like, I mean, he could be eking that out, you know, but there's still, we're already talking about two tenths on that last lap. So Sam's got it all back and under control again. I'm sure it just, it must be a nightmare to try and stop that car. Yeah.
We've had a change further down. Mark Blundell has got ahead of Colin Turkington. And also David Brabham has got ahead of Tim Harvey. Ninth and tenth. A, a switch around between the Otis Cortina and one of uh, David Brabham and uh, then the mini of Tim Harvey. Yes. So, so that obviously was uh, my uh, my mini that, that we took a grassy grassy excursion across on the on the first opening lap. So, <laughs> but it looks like he's now started to get back to grips with it again and uh, chasing down Harvey. So here is Andrew Jordan, who again gets up alongside Nicola Manassian. The Studebaker almost disappears alongside and then reappears back in front. That, that is so frustrating. <laughs> so frustrating. You can see, Andrew, you can't push him on the grass. You know, he's given yeah. him all the room that he needs, but he will take him to that edge of the road. So through Woodcut, Carl's drifting. Touch of understeer. Correction applied, and the tail wags on Steve Blomqvist's Galaxy. This car uh, owned by Bill Shepard, who specialises in racing and preparing uh, American muscle cars, comes up towards the timing line. Sam Tordoff looking for a way back through. Nicolas Menassian almost with them, but some laps he's trying to be part of the leading group, and on other laps, even other corners, he's having to try to defend that third place from the Jordan Cortina behind. Yes, exactly. But he should, you know, safe in the knowledge that he is going to be out as long as he can pull enough of a gap down the straight as they come into Woodcut, because all Andrew is looking for is that that chance to get a sniff into Woodcut, get his nose ahead before the chicane, and job done. He's got himself a nice podium. It sounds so simple when you say it like that. You know, <laughs> don't mention that to Andrew, clearly. Well, here he comes again. Look, absolutely on the limit. Hard on the brakes. Oh, so close. Oh. That, that, that's pretty good. See that Studebaker is still very good under the brakes. You know, Andrew was on it right to the last second. Yeah. So he's leaving nothing on the top by way of commitment. But look, there's the gap on the inside again. Even if he does get ahead, we know the Studebaker is going to be quick in a straight line. Believe it or not, the fastest lap has been done by Colin Turkington. Uh, there away once more goes Nicolas Menassian. So the Studebaker powers clear. This is the run down towards Woodcut. What are we on? Lap eight, uh, just under eight minutes to go. Suddenly, look, we've got a Cortina fight there. Mark Blundell right onto the back of Jordan. Yeah, oh, 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 oh. That's Turkington. That was wide. Very that, wide. That was very wide. He's obviously run out of brakes at that point. Right, so Colin Turkington drops out of that battle pack because he's had a wild old ride down, as you saw at uh, Woodcut. Leaders go through them. So Blomqvist to Tordoff, half a second. One second back is Manassian. Six tenths back, Jordan. And then three tenths behind him is that man, Mark Blundell. And Mark's having a rare old time in this car. He's driving it in the approved manner, totally sideways. Absolutely. <laughs> Full Goodwood style through Madwick there. He is full on opposite lock. Uh, really going for it. I can see now we've lost half in the mini. Oh dear. Uh, which is really annoying. Uh, so we're at real shame there. So Shedden is going to be he's all on his own a little bit there. So he's got no one to really chase now. Uh, Rowan Atkinson is in the race too, and he is in 19th place here, number 95 in the Plymouth Barracuda. So, turning his way into the chicane. This is Duncan Pitaway's car, as I say, 19th, but uh, Rowan Atkinson certainly not disgracing himself. He's become a bit lonely, but lap time's still pretty good, actually, for a guy that doesn't race all that often and is in a, a beast new to him. So, uh, going nicely in that car. Six and a half minutes on the clock in this first St Mary's Trophy race. Now, here are the race leaders. It remains Stig Blomqvist ahead of Sam Tordoff, then Nicola Manassian in the Studebaker. A car actually prepared by Andrew Jordan's team, so uh, Andrew's trying to get past a car that he has had a hand in making go so quickly. That'll teach him. <laughs> you see, Sam Dordoff's now got the lights on, thinks he's going to intimidate uh, Stig there, but I don't think that's going to work. And here, as well, is the... Oh, there's the inside of my car. Exactly. Oh, up the inside nicely into Woodcut. Who was that with? So there, number 76, Alex Brundle wriggles his way. He was ninth at the start of the lap, up towards the timing line. Chasing after the David Brabham uh, Cortina, and has just put himself ahead of Emanuele Pirro, in fact, in Martin Halusa's Alfa Romeo. So could move that. Yeah, no, Adam. that's good. I mean, he's worked his way up. I'd, I'd like to know what happened. Is somewhere along the line, he just slipped off onto the grass mm. so, and did his utmost to obviously save it and keep it out of the gravel or the wall. 
or plan work, whatever he did. A little bit of trim flapping, I notice, on the left-hand side. This is Alex Brundle, hard at work. That's the office, then, in a yeah. Nick Swift tuned prepared mini. Yeah, that's it there. And, you know, here we go. So this is, this is where it's difficult now with the Alpha. He's going to have the straight line speed as we come out of Levant. So what Alex has got to do now is literally just concentrate, concentrate through Levant, try and get as much of a better run out of it uh, and stay ahead so the Alpha can't get mm. past him before the King, really. Let's see whether the plan works that way. We're running out of race time then now as the... Sam's back in front. Yeah comes up out of the chicane. This is how he did it then, coming out of Lavin. Oh, a sideways stick. Oh. And that just gifted it to him on the inside, didn't it? Oh, yeah, that was, that was, uh, I bet he didn't imagine that was going to happen that easy. Well, Stig has got the lead back once. Can he do it again a second time? So Sam Tordoff now has hit the front. He's also done the fastest lap of the race. So is that game over? Is he now going to be able to push? Ah, Andrew's got the demon tweet now. Put the headlights on. That's another 10 brake horsepower, I think. He's going to need it. Exactly. Exactly. Or maybe he's just looking at his reflection in the back of that paint job. <laughs> the JRT car. So Nicola Manassi, a beautiful drift by Andrew Jordan. I mean, the car control the guy has is fantastic. Oh, it's fantastic, yeah. Doesn't matter whether it's the Cortina, the Mini, an AC Cobra that he's got to oh, play with this smoke. weekend. And now, yeah, Smokey Tordoff in the lead of the race. Oh, no. It doesn't seem to be coming out of the exhaust. It's like he's underneath, isn't it? And suddenly it's got very tail happy, suggesting that things are getting greasy out there for him. So Stig Blomqvist might have a chance now to power back past. Yeah. Tordoff goes defensive, but Stig Blomqvist crawling on over the back of him. Two wheels on the grass. Smoke's getting worse. Yeah. Blomqvist lines up. No, he still can't get through, can he? Though the, the smoky Sam is going to hang on at least for the end of this lap, I think. How long's left? Oh. Three minutes. The danger is that the circuit's going to get really slippery. That soil, oh. it's going to become very larry indeed. And actually, Benassion comes up to have a go at Blomqvist. So, out of the chicane. Oh, Sam oh, torn no. off with a big slide. It's not looking good yeah. for him. No, it's not looking good, actually. No, he should pull over and that's it. We're done. That's it. Yeah, it's got all smoky. And quite rightly, Sam tore off. He's going to park the car. Right, so Steve Blomqvist is back into the lead. Finally, by default, Andrew Jordan's up into third place. Yeah, he's got his podium. There we are. So... Poor old Sam tore off. Yeah, that's Great shame. shame. That is a real shame. So, Stig Blomqvist back into the lead. Let's have another ride on board with Andrew Jordan. Look at the gap now to the Studebaker, Nick, and just see where he can close this down, because the next section is very Cortina friendly. Oh, absolutely. Now, this is sector two. This, this really is a through. Whoa, let's look at that. <laughs> Nick, Nick, I think we are seeing a little bit of uh, the fluid out of Tordoff's car. But, you know, this could play into Andrew's hands. He's you know, as you know, he's, he's not <laughs> he's not too worried about sliding and sideways and his rally cross. Um, he he could be in the pound seat here. You know what yeah. we're talking about coming into Woodcut. If they have to break a bit heavier, he could be bringing this into him. He, if he he just needs to be within a hundred meters in the braking area, and I think he could sneak it in there. But you can see how much they pull out. Yeah. Such a big gap. So that straight plays right into the hands of the big bangers. The corners play into the hands of the smaller engine cars. The Cortina trying to get back into the mix. Andrew Jordan then in that third place. Back markers ahead now with what have we got just, I reckon there's a lap time left in the race. So one more lap to go. Through goes Stig Blomqvist with a bit of trim peeling back there on the uh, left-hand side of the car. Back marker getting out of the way. And Stig Blomqvist, can you believe this, has just done to the thousandth of a second an equal best lap time to Sam Tordoff, who's sitting watching the race. So two of them have done the same lap time to a thousandth of a second. How's that for being evenly matched? <laughs> that is fantastic, isn't it? it? You just couldn't write it. So Stig Blomqvist leading by seven tenths of a second. The clock will hit zero, I reckon, just before they get to the line. So this should be the last lap. Blomqvist is all sideways. Andrew Jordan's even more sideways now in third place. Yeah, the rear tyres of the Cortina probably are, you know, they, they're designing, they, they would set these cars up so they're going to run for over an hour in a, in a normal race, but, you know, he's going to be, he's giving it everything. He's using all the curbs, using everything he's got there. Understeer, oversteer, constantly twitching away at the wheel. And suddenly, Nicola Manassian, look, now that he's uh, given up fighting Andrew Jordan, he's finally swatted him aside. He's having a real go. He's running out of time, but he's having a real go against Stig Blomqvist. 
for the race lead. He's not quite close enough, though, as they head down towards Woodcut Corner. Turns into the right. Menacion on the back of Blomqvist. The flag is being made ready, surely, because the clock is about to hit zero. Into the chicane they come. It's going to be a Blomqvist victory, barring any dramas here. But the three leaders together, and here comes Menacion. Paul on the inside up to the line. Out, out goes the chequered flag for Stig Blomqvist to win part one of the St Mary's Trophy. Nicola Manassi on second, Andrew Jordan third, then it's going to be Mark Blundell fourth, fifth Colin Turkington, and Gordon Shedden is on target for sixth. Yeah. That was a proper touring car race. That was fantastic. Uh, that, I really, really enjoyed that. I and mean, then fantastic for Stig. I mean, that is amazing, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. That is a true hats off to Stig. Well done. That was fantastic. 72 years of age, a guy that has done quite a bit of racing in his time, but of course he's mainly known as a rally driver, the 1984 World Rally Champion. Uh, seventh, Emmanuel Pirro, eighth, David Brabham, uh, ninth, Alex Brundle, and tenth, Tim Harvey. So uh, your car, ninth. Happy with that, Governor? Yeah, yeah, that's all right, you know. Alex he, keeps the job. He, he, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and he's such a nice guy, you know, Alex is, is a top, top. But, uh, so yeah, that was good. We'll find out what the grassy excursion was at the beginning. Uh, but yeah, good to see the cars home. So let's have a look then at the results of part one of the St Mary's Trophy. A race win for Stig Blomqvist then, ahead of uh, Nicola Manassian in second place. Third going the way of Andrew Jordan, ahead of Mark Blundell. Colin Turkington fifth, sixth to Gordon Shedden. Seventh was Emmanuel Pirro and David Brabham comes home in eighth place. Oh, it's great, isn't it, to see all those historic cars out on the track. Well, it's time now, I'm afraid, for another quick break, but I'll give you a little brain teaser to get your head around while you're thinking, and I'll be back with the answer shortly. Also, if you do want to get involved, as always, use the hashtag GWSpeedWeek. Now, I'm not sure about a tea break. By the looks of it, I might try and grab a bit of champagne. Welcome back to Goodwood Speed Week. Now, the Duke of Richmond has been catching up with all sorts of people over the weekend, and a lot of the leading people in the industry, of course. And one of these people was, of course, the CEO of BMW. Oliver, hi. Morning. Uh, very nice to see you. Great to see you. That last trip I made to see you in Munich, we haven't done much travelling since then. It's extraordinary. Our business is very different, um, as I'm sure. It's been, it's been difficult, very difficult for you too, I'm sure. I think uh, the automotive industry has, of course, a big lockdown. You know, we, we lost almost 300,000 cars in due course. The worst thing, if your dealers are locked down, you can't do anything. But that doesn't mean that people refrain from driving a car. People refrain from stepping into an airplane. They refrain from entering a taxi. But they're not refraining of driving a car by themselves. So, so that is quite a positive effect we, we see worldwide. So there is an, an inclination not to go into public transport, but kind of go into a cocooning effect into your own car. 
and that is of course a good a good sign for us i think uh, the automotive industry is the second biggest industry in the world if you think about economy development the automotive industry worldwide has to play a big role and very focused presumably on on sustainability in the future fewer people are driving cars nowadays i mean how important is the whole sustainability issue for you now after half a year of coronavirus management i would say this is an accelerator. Sustainability has to be at the heart of everything we do. I think we are on quite an adventure. We started on the electrification side in 2009, when we decided to build the i3. In our business, you have to be ready when the market is, is ready, especially if you, if you build more than one vehicle, like the i3, that, there was one car. And now we are on the verge, in our second phase, we will build 12 cars. And uh, in the third phase, a majority of the vehicle will be, will be electrified. So you have to look that in a, in a 20 years time frame. And uh, at Rolls Royce, just speaking about electrification, we, just, we will have the first fully electric Rolls Royce. Talking about Mini, we, we just announced uh, a year ago that we go into a joint venture with Great Wall um, in China to build the brand even more global than it is today. I've got an electric Mini here the estate all of which I'm enjoying oh, super. enjoying super. a lot Congratulations. super quick it's such it's really really uh, really good well, fun you drive, you know? <laughs> but this is a uh, uh, chance this is how long it takes when I was in Oxford in 2007 and 8 in end of 2007 we built the first electric mini as a prototype and now 13 years later the car actually hits the marketplace you know, this is how long it takes sometimes in our industry to make from a great idea to make a profitable business mm. out of it. And we are quite proud that that Mini is now electric too. The production values that you have and everything else, can, can people operate quicker and make that difficult for you or not? If you are in the startup world, you, you, you think you can do quicker. If you grow into volume, there are specific rules in this, in this, um, in this industry, you know, until you have a sales system which provides like us more than 160 countries and if you if you want to be a global player you have to be a, you have to have a good sales team around it you cannot invent that inside of two or three years and in the long run i think we're not slow at all you know you have to be there at the right time and we will see what what is happening in the next couple of years about market shares about market development about what do customers do with used cars and so on? And uh, we build the iNext next year. I think at that point in time, we'll be, be quite a bit ahead of sure. whatever you call assisted driving. I'm not even talking about autonomous driving. That will take much more time. That will be um, a big step ahead. And also how a battery electric vehicle drives in combination with BMW dynamic genes. Uh, I, think, I think that is a... That's a big part of our DNA, and the world will see that that there is uh, an electric BMW like like no other car. So I think I think we're not too late. We hit the market right when the market is ready. So the future of BMW, what's the what's the long term future? Is it? I think what is specific, what what has developed in the last ten years at BMW, uh, is this thing um, as I mentioned was power of choice. So currently we offer in most of our vehicles four different drive frames. We have auto, we have diesel, we have wagon hybrids, and we're now coming up, we have uh, the battery only vehicles. And I think if you want to grow, um, to depend only on one drive train is a dangerous thing. Because these things change, the, they adapt over time in specific markets. In the electric world, where does M Sport fit in? It's a profitable business for us. But of course, it's, it's still a niche. It's not the mainstream. On the other hand, it goes right into the heart of, we, of what BMW is, the ultimate driving machine, dynamic car driving. And we will, we will transform that now into a much more sustainability vehicle dynamics uh, um, section of our business. So you will see in the future, you will also see a lot more electrification in the cars. We can electrify combustion engines which reduces the emissions. You will see plug-in hybrids, we call them power hybrids. And of course, uh, that is what we're what, what we still working on, 
there might be a possibility to have electric only, but there is no decision made yet so far. But overall, um, the M division will, of course, always stay at the heart of BMW, but on, in a much more sustainability fashion than we, see, than we know today. I'm sure it'll be a, a huge success. And Oliver, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thanks very much for, uh, for, for joining us and for, and for doing this little, little chat. Fascinating chat between the Duke and Oliver Zipser there. But at Goodwood this weekend, we've got some wonderful racing machinery from BMW as well, including the actual car that won the 1940 Milli Miglia. So this seems as good a time as any to learn a, to learn a little bit more about something called M Sport. A company is like a human being. As long as it goes in for sports, it's fit, well-trained, full of enthusiasm and performance. With these words from legendary automotive exec Bob Lutz, BMW's motorsport division was born in 1972. Launched with a team of just 35 people, their first project was the BMW 3-litre CSL, nicknamed the Batmobile due to its aerodynamic appendages, including a large rear wing. This homologation special won the European Touring Car Championships six times out of seven between 1973 and 1979. Not a bad start for the nascent division. The CSL was also the first car to wear the now famous M stripes. These, incidentally, combined the blue of Bavaria and BMW and the red of Texaco, the division's early sponsor, with a purple stripe to provide a transition. When the partnership ended, BMW paid the oil giant for the right to continue to use the color. The first M-branded car, its rarest model, and to date the only mid-engine road car, was the 1978 M1 supercar. The body and chassis were built in separate factories in Italy and then sent to Stuttgart, where it was united with the straight-six engine taken from the CSL and finished off by the M division by which point the Group 5 rules had changed anyway, so BMW used the cars for their own one-make Pro Car Championship. For two glorious seasons, most of the world's F1 drivers competed in the ultimate Grand Prix Support Series. Thanks, Rory. Great to hear about M Sport. Such a legendary division. You really can't overstate that. But let's look at some more history now. And we're going to wind the clock back in Formula One land to 1986. Now, it was a legendary season. Some of you might remember this car. It is the Williams Honda FW11. And at the end of that season, Adelaide, 1986, Nigel Mansell was on course to win the championship until that left rear tire blew on this actual chassis. It has been rebuilt and it's on static display here at Speed Week. But let's delve a little bit more into that 86 season right now. Hill versus Clark, Stewart versus Fittipaldi, Hunt versus Lauda. The truly great rivalries in Formula One are usually between two people. But in 1986, the year of the Chernobyl disaster and the completion of the M25, F1 was fully turbocharged with the most powerful engines ever also the start of an amazing rivalry like never before. And thanks to Goodwood's legendary Black Book, we brought together some of the major players involved in this incredible season, which was all about tyre-melting turbo power. 
It was an era where the cars and the engine wanted to kill you every time you drove it. They were absolutely phenomenal. I mean, just rocket ships. I mean, they were just unbloody believable. And into this mix, we throw a four-way rivalry like the sport has never seen before. It's like a steroid pump ease Hollywood action movie with four huge leading stars. And it's all encapsulated in this one iconic photo. Never before and never again would the gang of four pose together for a photo like they did here back in Estoril in 1986. It tells us more than it might seem at first glance. This is much more than just four people striving to be world champion. These are four men from four very different backgrounds, unified in their quest for the sport's biggest prize. First up, the reigning world champion. He wasn't known as the professor for nothing. He was, uh, he, he had a wise head on his shoulders. Alan, by this time, it wasn't just that he'd won a world championship. Uh, um, it was, he was so mature. But behind closed doors, <laughs> Alan was the professor of manipulation and politics. We were ready to fight, that is, uh, that is for sure. McLaren had won the previous two world championships, but the MP42C that Prost was driving to defend his title was an updated version of a car now heading into its third season. The tag Porsche engine was no longer the most powerful engine out there, but the Prost-McLaren combination were masters of race strategy. What Prost also had in his favour was experience. But a relative lack of experience wasn't a deterrent for a man who was going to become his greatest nemesis, Ayrton Senna. When Ayrton walked into the room, there was a different feeling in the room. And I know it's very easy for us all to get wrapped up in this godlike image that Ayrton had, but it's true. It's not just about talent, it's commitment, sacrifice, all other things. And clear it was all in. Senna's car, the Lotus 98T, had a new advanced carbon composite tub, but an even bigger step was the engine. Renault have pulled their factory team to become purely an engine supplier. Senna's Renault-powered Lotus will benefit from full work support and a massive 1,200 horsepower in qualifying trim. Senna's the upstart, but he's got a point to prove. He needs to show that he can convert that ferocious speed into becoming a regular title contender. But perhaps there's someone else in this photo who also needs to do that, maybe even a bit more. Nigel was, you know, Nigel. And any success was very much his and any failure was attributable to a third party. You've got to understand that I started my career in Formula One back in 79, 80. And I didn't get into a competitive car till five years or so later. Then I wasn't number one driver until eight years later. Nigel's Marmite, you know, we all know he's Marmite. You know, you either love him or hate him. He didn't need it, Nigel. I think after Mansell crashed when he was leading in Monaco um, for Lotus, I think Peter Wars said that man will never win a world championship. And then, of course, Nigel got to stick it to him. He wasn't just fast, he was quite astute as well. Mansell's car for 1986 was a game changer. The Williams FW11 was a big step up in aero terms from the 85 car. This mated to the now sorted Honda 1.5 litre V6 Turbo was simply the class of the field. But there was one problem. This guy. Double world champion Nelson Piquet was signed up by Williams to supposedly be the number one driver. In fact, he wasn't just Nigel's problem, he was everybody's problem. Mansell was like the fighting dog and Piquet could see that and worked out every way to wind him up. He was phenomenally rude about Mansell's wife. Uh, the Mansell, uh, what I got, oh, I did a lot of things. I wasn't paying much attention to it and, until he started to attack my family. I told him that his wife is so ugly and uh, I tried to have a fight with him. He was the polar opposite to Senna. Nelson never rated Ayrton at all. He used to call him the taxi driver. And that's what makes this picture so amazing. The four smiles are covering a burning bitterness and a rivalry 
that's more powerful than any of the cars they drove. As we get to the final three races beginning here in Estoril, Senna has already taken an amazing six pole positions and victories in Detroit and Spain, which was a classic. Ayrton blocking and Ayrton would go boom, boom, boom. <laughs> the Brazilian taking the win by 0.014 seconds. To this day, the third closest finish in F1 history. It didn't take long before Mansell struck back with a run of wins at Spa, Canada and France. But his finest hour came on home soil at Brands Hatch. The fans, in one word, were just absolutely, ballistically sensational. And to be fair to Nelson, he drove the most fantastic race and he was really upset. He missed one gear. One gear he missed. And I managed to overtake him when he missed that one gear and then we won the race, obviously. Mansell's victories spurred PK into action, adding victories in Germany and Italy to his season-opening win in Brazil. However, his most satisfying win came in Hungary, battling Senna. Yeah, it's not only one time, I'm passing three times in that race. His third overtake was this unbelievable pass on his arch nemesis. Reigning champion Prost had taken wins at Imola and Monaco, but the professor had a game plan. What was very important is to win races where the car was competitive and to get the best uh, number of points where the car was not competitive. And that plan came together perfectly in Austria as Prost took his third win of the season with all three of his rivals retiring. And that brings us back here to Portugal. The top four drivers were all still in contention with just 13 points between them. Mansell took the win, giving him the chance to take the title in Mexico. With Senna only finishing fourth after running out of fuel, he was now basically out of the championship battle. To be very realistic, uh, I think Nigel is world champion today, but it's not finished yet. Prost was right, as Mansell miscued his start in Mexico and only finished fifth. This meant the whole season came down to one last race in Adelaide. Mansell still had a six-point edge over his two rivals. I was confident. I always said if I just have the equal opportunity as anyone else, then I should be able to do, get the job done. You go in with a mindset. Is that we don't know how things are going to unfold. But one thing, don't forget, never give up. We saw that it was not possible to do the rest uh, in uh, no stop. You know, and we did not say anything. We, we, I saw that the wear of the tires would be a problem. There's no way we're going to make it. We need to plan a pit stop, but we, we have to hide everything to the Goodyear people and to anybody, you know. We, we, we don't say anything. But I felt more obliged to be fair to both of our drivers than to guarantee collaring the world championship. Patrick Head was a very nice guy, but he was not, I guess. In my side, he want to be an English man champion, not a Brazilian. You, you dream about climbing that ladder your whole life. And so you say what goes through your mind, you know, you're almost there, you're almost there. There was yet another element to this race. Keke Rosberg in his last ever Grand Prix. Keke was, was very good. We said that whatever happened, I'm going to make them uh, follow me and... Uh... So that's why on lap seven, he takes the lead, he goes and then Nelson yeah. is trying to go and Nigel with him. Exactly. It worked very well. It was only one surprise. I don't remember when I had a puncture. Lap 32, but... you get the front right puncture. As soon as I came back, you know, in the fight, with my fresher tires, there was no way I could lose this race. <laughs> I was just sitting there behind Alan, just twiddling my thumbs, I was driving probably 70, 80 percent, so comfortable. What Kiki did in racing into the distance, he discounted the potential for tyre failure. There was a lot that could go wrong in the pit lane and, and hence why it was Patrick and the other said, stay out, stay out, tyre's good. I was really comfortable just sitting in his slipstream sort of thing at the distance behind where, you know, I was having no issues at all. 
It was a dreadful nightmare, I have to say. Dreadful nightmare. There it was in our pocket, and there it was gone. I was gutted for Nigel, because he really put so much into every lap. Nelson was in a position to win the World Championship, and I decided to change the tyres, just from a safety point of view. Pit, box, box, get in, get in, get in. But I think he was a great sportsman. He never, ever gave me a hard time and said, you didn't need to call me in or anything like that. There's nothing luck about it. There was no luck at all about it. And of course, the paper said, poor Nigel, bad luck. You know, it wasn't bad luck, you know. We took the right technical decision. We Our car was much better than my car and the wheels much better than the boss, and we lost the championship. And I then had to fly up to Japan to explain why we lost the world, the Drivers' World Championship. My four championships, I mean, obviously, this one is the, this one is the best. It was an unbelievable race, you know, for, for everybody. It's, it's part of the history of, uh, of Formula One. It might sound like a bit of McLaren ego, but, I mean, we were the best team. And, you know, in any sport, the best team normally wins. Four drivers battling all season long for the title, and three of them taking it right to the closing laps of the final race. 1986, we've never seen an F1 season like it. OK, coming up, we have our very last PG Tips tea break of the day. And I'm going to be joined by two very special guests. That's all I'm going to say. I'll leave you with that tease. Go on, pop the kettle on. I'll see you in a minute. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Now, we've already had so much going on today, so we thought now was probably a good time. Pop the kettle on, have a little break, grab a cup of tea, and get to know each other a little bit better. Now, throughout this incredible weekend, we've been inviting you to get involved on social media, because you know what? We're a little bit nosy, but also we like to give back, and we've got some amazing competitions on the go with some absolutely fantastic prizes. All the information is online. You can see it at goodwood.com, so do make sure you check out what's going on and get in touch using the hashtag GWC. Speed Week. Now, I have to say, I'm very lucky right now to be joined in the studio by two very special guests. It's none other than the Duke of Richmond and Rowan Atkinson, CBE. Hello, welcome. Great to have you Thank both you here. Uh, uh, now, I know it's been a jam-packed day already. Your Grace, how's it been for you today? Good. No, it's been an excellent uh, second day. It's always, second day has always been a bit of a relief after the first, so I think it's gone really well. We've seen some great racing and uh, it's been a fabulous day. The weather's held together. We're, we're very happy about it. That's all you can ask for, really, isn't it? We've had Absolutely. some great weather. And uh, that was handy for you, Rowan, because uh, you've just joined us fresh from the St Mary's Trophy. Yes. How was that? It was great, yes. I mean, I was, you know, pootling along towards the back and, uh, and quite enjoying myself. <laughs> uh, it was very, very good, actually. You know, great car, this amazing sky blue Plymouth Barracuda. 
with a 5.4 litre V8, a classic sort of V8 pony car would it be yeah two, oh there it is uh, two two door american thing uh and i love the color i like the whole thing about it it's it's a really sweet good natured car slightly slightly heavy but but you know that's fine the good thing about a heavy car is that it's slightly more predictable um so i know it was a great racing companion uh, yes, see. well, you were joined on the track as well by uh, some touring car champions. Yes. I'm sure that there was a lot of pressure there. Yeah, yeah, no, and I and, and I always seem to be, whenever I do the St. Mary's Trophy, and I've done it quite a lot, actually, since the very first revival here in 1998. Oh, wow. Uh, and because I'm, I'm usually the better known of the owner of the car and me <laughs> um, therefore I'm always put in with the hot shoe drivers <laughs> and so I'm usually putting along every you know sometimes towards the middle of the field but usually more rearward of that and and I'm very happy because you can always have a race you know with someone somewhere yeah, well I love yeah. that Yes, I'll take, yes. On, take that on board in, yeah. my, uh, in my life, everyday life. Yeah, um, now, I don't know, a lot of people are familiar with you driving your Mini. Where did this love of muscle cars come from? Well, I actually own a Ford Falcon, which is another car in a similar vein. In 1964, Ford Falcon, slightly smaller engine, 4.7 litre V8, uh, which I've raced for on and off for sort of 10 years. But, but it, you know, this problem with my relationship with, with racing, I've done it, I suppose, for about 35 years. In 1985, I started in Renault 5 Turbos, the Renault 5 Turbo C Cup, in which I was usually about the middling, you know, towards the rear of the field. But the great thing is that all the cars were the same. So actually, wherever you were in the field, you was, was a pretty good indicator of your relative skill uh, to, to, everybody, to everybody else. But yeah, I've raced on and off, but the problem is more off than on. And motor racing is like any singular sport, like you know, clay pigeon shooting, or golf, or something. That yeah. if you if you only do it once every two years, then you're <laughs> never really going to be any good. I mean, oh. I'm never going to be great, <laughs> but at least you know you always want to feel as though you're doing as well as you could. Yes. And 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 if you're out of practice, which I always am, <laughs> that it means you're just sort of you know in there and and having a go and trying to have fun wherever you are and trying not to be competitive. And I'm I don't think I'm, I'm a particularly competitive person, but certainly when it comes to motor racing, I've learned not to be competitive. <laughs> because just you know just, just enjoy, enjoy it. it. Just enjoy enjoy it and do the best you can now of course your long friends and and your grace do you actually get to spend any time with rowan when he's here at goodwood yeah we do a bit he often yeah. uh, he often stays with us we've you know, it's, it's 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 been great and we do other things together to so say it's been yeah. it's been great having rowan here and um of course i think when, when rowan drove the mini here that famous year yes that was a very big moment and i think the only yeah. time mr bean ever did a live performance wasn't it, it what yeah so yeah so yeah the yeah maybe the first time but maybe first there will time. be another time <laughs> uh, but it was it was the first and last time at the moment yeah it was just a, it was just a great stunt that you know that we did for tv uh, in fact, I think you're going to see it in an ITV pr program, a repeat in January. I think the, there's a bit of a Mr. Bean thing going on. Oh, it's, very good. I believe it or not, the 30th anniversary <gasps> of the first television showing of a Mr. Bean show. Oh, well, congratulations so, anyway, on anyway, that. Anyway, anyway one, a, one of the shows that I think is going to be repeated is the one with uh, me in the armchair on top of the... Oh. Or, or should I say Mr. Bean? <laughs> in the armchair on top of the mini uh which was yeah it's a it's a great and silly stunt and we did it live here and it looked it, it looked as good here as it did i think in many ways it looked almost better here if you were watching it as a spectator because you really couldn't see how it was done whereas you always assume on tv well there's some you know tri trickery uh, trickery going on whereas when you were here as a live spectator i think it really looked well, it really looked as if I was driving the car. Well, I think we would all like to see that again, I have to say. Um, Your Grace, Rowan, should we take a look at how some of the people at home have been getting involved with Speed Week? Yes. Because the effort, I tell you now, has been phenomenal. Uh, now, here we go. We've got uh, racing there for us dedicated to our wonderful emergency services. So, Your Grace, it's one of those central sculptures, I believe. What do you reckon to this? That looks like quite complicated one. Yeah, <laughs> it does. Me. I'm not quite sure we're going to deliver that one, but it's it's create it's very creative. It looks quite dangerous too in terms of the incendiary devices around the base of it. But yeah. no, it looks that looks it'll be good in the dark. That one, I think. That would be a good one, um, Rowan. It's, the idea is that they've recreated. You know those big statues that are put in front of the house every year. Yes. It's that type of thing, but they've made them at home. So uh, fantastic. What, what well, do you I think have to, to say that it's one? Brilliant. Yeah, I love that. Oh. Very good. Yeah, we're well impressed with that one. Uh, do keep sending these posts in. You can see the hashtag Speed Week Central feature. Oh, we've got some more here. What's this one? Stanley H8 uses initials SNW in the side 
in the style of the, of the STP, STP logo. logo. Yeah, STP logo is a famous kind of sponsor, isn't he? Of, um, That's other, very good. This was a kids' things. competition to design their very own mini. What do we think to that design? I think Rome will come to you on the mini. What do you think to that? Um, well, I think it's great. I think it's. Uh, I like color as the as the color of the car that I've just raced may indicate it's it's sky blue you know I like a car that says hello yes uh, and I think that says hello to me it does <laughs> it's fantastic we've got some more things coming here because we've been in all different Different competitions. This one is about the best, the revival. Oh yes, of course. So yeah. we've got the genuine vintage hat here, the gloves, the cape. This is someone celebrating at their own home. Well, that's fantastic. <laughs> well, I think yeah. I mean, that is the great sadness and the great you know thing that's missing today in many ways is are, are the crowds. Obviously, yeah. can't, can't be here for obvious reasons. But um, but the, but the dressing up, yeah. The Revival spirit. I mean, there is a hint of, of revival about yeah, it, there is. but it, but it, but it's the it's the sort of mass, you know, dedication to oh, the I period wardrobe, which always amazes me. I I was assuming that only one in twenty people are going to take it seriously, and suddenly, you know, you when when it's only one in twenty people who don't take it seriously. Absolutely, and then they're the the odd ones out. Yeah. Oh look, we've got another one here. This is a great one. Oh of look the, at that. Uh, the Speed Week Central feature. What do you think to that one, Your Grace? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's very creative taking the chicane well, that's and it, having yes. the cars I mean, spinning I'm, out from that. That looks a uh, very impressive group of cars as well. We wouldn't mind having those stuck up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is it. What, what's the name of the guy who was just... Jerry sport? Judah. Jerry Judah, that's right. Well, it is a Jerry... It, it, it's we'll send that over to him and see what, yeah, he, that's fantastic. see what he makes of that. He's got some serious competition there, I'd say. I know, yeah. I, I feel a bit sorry for your designer now because uh, there's some very outlandish ideas yeah, coming I mean, he's through. He's in trouble, yeah. I'd say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we thought he, he was outlandish. <laughs> and, then, and then it turns out that he's, a, oh, he's tame compared to some of these guys. Yeah, I think we've got something else coming up as well, a Jensen uh, button feature. I don't know if this is coming now. Oh, here we are. Oh, oh, look at this. Oh, no, no this is one of the minis. Mini. Yeah, it's very interesting, the predominant of the predominance of orange in the minis isn't that interesting how the you know orange and blue seems to be the big uh theme well that's great yeah they've done a great dog. design there well we're very impressed finn uh aged 11 well done we're loving that uh, unfortunately we've run out of time we've run out of time with our tea break that's all we've got time for uh, a huge thank you to the duke of richmond and of course rowan atkinson uh, for joining me thank you so much no, uh, we're gonna keep going because we've got lots of exciting things coming you know, loads of things are going to happen on the track, which you will not want to miss. Uh, my love of cars uh, came from going to rallycross meetings with my dad. My dad used to race a VW Beetle. Uh, that was more in the 70s. And then in the 80s, uh, he was uh, in a VW Golf. So he, he went from rear wheel drive, which he loved, to the front wheel drive Golf, which he didn't love so much, but that's what V dub. Um, basically, they, they said he had to use that. So um, yeah, I used to go there and watch him. Um, most of all in the UK, most of the time it was raining. And, and I remember, I remember the cars starting up and almost blowing my eardrums. And uh, uh, yeah, really, really lovely time in my childhood. I mean, I've, I've watched so many guys through the years um, race, um, but, but truthfully, the, the guy that I really followed was in, it was in the 80s, so the guy that I followed was Alan Prost. Um, I think because he was very calculated in the way he went racing, you know, the professor, uh, he really understood it's, it's about being quick, but it's, it's the whole package. It's, it's building a car around you and, and teamwork. Obviously, as a kid, I didn't think like that, but uh, watching him, I just liked his, his style of, of driving. My first road car was a Vauxhall Cavalier, two litre. Um, it didn't even have matching bumpers, as in the bumpers weren't color coded. It was the proper, it was the L. It wasn't the GL or the GSI, um, but it had a two litre engine. And I actually bought my own road, my first road car myself. I think it was two, just over 2,000 pounds, two and a half thousand pounds. It was the 1990 and it had 90,000 miles on the clock when I, when I got it. Uh, this was 1997, it was seven, eight years old, eight years old. Uh, but I loved it. You know, I, I put SPAC suspension on it. Um, I won a kart race in France in the European Champs. And basically my dad said, if you win this race, I will buy you a set of 17 inch alloys. And back then 17 inch alloys were like humongous. 
Uh, so he, I won and he bought me them and this car was just like terrific. And it handled like a go-kart because with the suspension, it was lowered, these big wheels, great tires on it. It was really good fun. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know where it is now. My dad said, this is about 10 years ago, that it was up on block somewhere and someone had stolen the wheels and, uh, and it was burnt out. So yeah, hooligans. Well, if you, if you have Google, you would know that I didn't. So you, this is a trick question. No, I didn't. I passed it a second time. Um, I failed because I went for a gap that wasn't there. Um, there were parked cars on my side of the road and you're supposed to give way to oncoming traffic, which I, I did initially and I got bored of waiting. And, and also there was enough room, so I went for it. And there was, there was like an inch on either side of the wing mirrors. Trouble is the lady coming the other way put it up on the curb on the side, on the, I was going to say sidewalk because I live in America now, on the pavement. Uh, and I failed because of that. So anyway, I passed second time. And then I had to do my driving test again here in the States, which was hilarious. That was last year. Um, and it was just funny to go through the process again. It's amazing how much you forget. And also how different the regulations are in, you know, in different countries. But uh, I passed. Well, of course, there's still lots more to come, so stay where you are. We'll have a short break and also see if you can solve this little brain teaser. Open on a kitchen table, Cobble Hill. There's a kid. His mother says, you always have to be 10 times better. So he keeps writing and does not stop. He writes about the heat, about the game, about the block and home. And it keeps writing and writing and writing until it all cuts to black. Title appears. This is a story of a storyteller from Brooklyn.
So they're an example of some uh, of the manufacturer's wares that are going to be out for our supercar run and our first glance. And that, as I say, is going to be coming up very shortly. Supercars not only uh, of the road variety, but race as well. I noticed the uh, Jensen Team Rocket RJN McLaren GT3 car that has uh, found itself at the front of the grid there. I'm Richard Porter, joined by Erin Baker, the editorial director of Auto Trader. He's waiting for the cars to set off on the front row there. What can we see? A couple of Ferraris, a couple of McLarens. Not a bad start. I'm not entirely sure which one's leaving first, but it's going to guess that it's this F8. Ferrari F8 Spider. What do we know about the Ferrari? Erin, this is. Um, a facelift, effectively, I'm saying that in a sort of slightly polite way, of the 488. Um, but it's got a little bit more power and uh, it's still got that up and over roof that they had, which you apparently can open up to 28 miles an hour, which is quite good if you're stuck at some traffic lights or something like that. Yeah, that's right. Hi there, everyone. Also looking at beautiful red open top McLaren. I was in this yesterday, took it for a spin around the lanes there. Quite a lot of incredible power and noise too. Look at that row there right at the front. Absolute brilliant setup. McLaren in there with the GT3, uh, a couple of Ferraris, a couple of McLarens. Let's get going. Can I tell you a really not that interesting piece of trivia about that car closest to the camera? It's the F8 Spider. Spider, a lot of Italian convertible cars called Spiders. As far as anyone can agree, Spider comes from a type of open top carriage. Yeah, yeah. The old days that had very spidery wheels. We all knew that, Richard. We all knew that. Did you? Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. I'm picking up that Rolls Royce there. Fantastic. That's the race. They've also got the brand new Ghost here. Beautiful Aston Martin open top there. We've got that crazy Ford Mac 1 next to the Puma ST. Oh, the Audi R8, the green hell version there. Some Lexus. Lexi? What do we say there, Richard? Uh, I think it's Lexinens. Nice. We'll take that. And some Porsches. Oh, and here's the Bentley, one of my very favourites here. The V8, that GT, ready to go bonkers with its black pack on it there. That's the black pack, is it? That's the, so you, you get all the chrome filled in black rather than shiny, yeah, you if get you so choose. Mm. You can go completely bananas with the options on those, can't you? Because you can have all sorts of trimming. And also, I think there's a cricket ball interior, which is the colour of a cricket ball. And I'll tell you something amazing about that, Bentley. Rear fridge can hold two full-size champagne bottles. That's the important fact. I'm so tired of cars in which the rear fridge can only hold one champagne bottle. I mean, it's tiresome. So thank you, Bentley, for that. <laughs> That's the kind of trivia I bring to this. What are we looking down on here? Uh, Lamborghini Aventador SVJ. There, the green thing. With yeah. The ring on the back. They've also got the, um, the rear-wheel drive, haven't they? The Huracan Evo rear-wheel drive. I love a Lamborghini with rear-wheel drive. Forget your four-wheel drive nonsense. I looked this up because uh, it, it seemed to be important. Lamborghinis have been four-wheel drive since the early 90s, 93. Mm. And occasionally they go back to rear-wheel drive. Oh, now here we are. We're off with the F8 Spider. The astonishing thing about this car, I think, is that it's got 710 horsepower. And this, you always think of these Ferraris of this size from the 308, 328 and so on. The mid-engine Ferraris are sort of the bedrock of the range. And they've got so much power now, it's insane. Yeah, absolutely. And now McLarens are off and on the way. Uh, the McLaren uh, GT3 car, Michael O'Brien, won the Glover Trophy. Uh, British Championship car, one of the four contenders, by the way, in the British Championship that can still win. This is a GT3 spec car. They're, they're building these down at Woking in a special GT department, I gather. Taking that very seriously now. Yeah, that's right. There goes that 600 LT that I was in yesterday. LT, of course, standing for a uh, long tail. It's kind of a slightly more hardcore performance. Um, that's what it says on the team. got a slightly longer run. Is it actually longer? Slightly. We're talking millimetres. The whole car industry operates in millimetres these days, doesn't it? McLaren SLT, slightly longer tail. <laughs> but also more hardcore 
Oh, it makes a good noise, doesn't it? That's the uh, Ferrari F8 Tributo. Uh, means tribute in Italian, in this case, a tribute to reusing the platform for the previous car. Now there goes the first of the two green bonkers uh, uh, Lamborghinis. That is the Huracan Evo rear-wheel drive. I think it's piloted by David Green, who was in the commentary box with me here yesterday, and I promised I wouldn't say rude things about him driving it. He missed that apex, though, didn't he? So, <laughs> I think I was about to say his driving days are behind him. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is a rear-wheel drive one after the Gallardo uh, Balboni in the last generation of uh, what, in inverted commas, we'll call the entry-level Lamborghini. Um, and uh, apparently, I've not driven it, it's, uh, it's quite amusing because it is only real drive. You don't need any of those turbochargers to spoil the fun. 610 horsepower, and you can really feel it. The track motor just snapping away there. Coming through St Mary's, grabbing fourth gear on the exit. quite a nice time, I think. Yeah, it doesn't shut up, though, does it? Car. In a car that connects you to the road. Again, I'm very tired of cars that don't. I think they're called aeroplanes, aren't they? <laughs> now we're on to Aston. Aston have got some tasty stuff here. That's the DBS we're seeing there. Uh, with the roof down, all the better to hear that mighty roar. Uh, I'm guessing it's a twin turbocharged 4 litre V8. I think it's a twin uh, turbocharged 4 litre V8, is it? That's a DBS. Oh, sorry. Uh, so that's twin turbo, but a V12. The... That's because I'm a girl. Me and it's Engine's not. Girl. It's, it's just because the Astons <laughs> all look quite similar from some angles. Uh, that's a 715 horsepower V12 with twin turbo on it. Uh, the DBS Super Ligera, Super Ligera, as in those pizzas you get at Pizza Express that have fewer calories. Nice. Now, Bentley, here's something I do. Here's a 4 litre twin turbo V8. Look yes. at that zip on cue. 0 to 60 in 3.9 seconds. Orange flame. I asked what that colour was. Literally by Bentley, as I got told, orange flame. This is driven by chassis engineer Andy Marson, who is pretty rapid behind the wheel. Yeah, it's shifting around a bit there, but then it is a big car. Oh, look, there's a Jaguar. That's an F type. Yeah, I'm assuming it's that F-Type R. Um, uh, yeah, I think so. Hard to sell from this angle. But yeah, look, it's got yes. the R there at the front. Now, that is a rapid car. I got locked with one of those, locked down with one of those in lockdown. That was a superb couple of months with one of those. What a living nightmare that must have been. Well, I could only I could only polish it and take it for an essential journey, but uh, what an essential journey it turns out to be in that. I mean, that's proper supercar territory. Six-figure price tag, huge amounts of, uh, of uh, torque and horsepower. That's a, that's a supercharged V8 in those, isn't it? And um, it's, that engine's been around uh, since the time of the Romans, but it's still rather fabulous and makes a wonderful noise inside and outside. It is. I'm a big fan of that car. It looks, mm, it looks a biz. Pretty car. OK, this is uh, a McLaren P1, but uh, P1 GTR. This is a fairly major... Is this the... No, it's the Senna, you plonker. This is the McLaren Senna. Uh, the most extreme car, road car they've ever built, mid-engine, designed around the era, of course, a huge, monstrous track performance. 789 brake horsepower. Also looking quite good in that, we're going to say, retro livery, right? Like the old Marlboro McLaren Formula 1 cars. Yeah, oh, now the Rolls-Royce ghost. Here we are, car after my own heart where it's all about the silence, not the noise. And this is really the first iteration of Rolls-Royce's post-opulence era. It's all about less is more, a restrained interior, subtle, pared-back luxury. I gather that when they were developing this car, they were so obsessed with making it silent that actually they went too far. They believe that there comes a point when you can be in a sort of confined space like a car and it's too quiet, it's actually disorientating, you do need some noise. Yeah. See that now Aston Martin DBX the SUV is finally here from Aston Martin 
split opinion, but there's no doubt about uh, the money-making credentials of SUVs for luxury manufacturers. I think the DBS is, am uh, DBS is amazing. Of course, they've got Matt Becker, chief engineer, who works his magic every single time. It actually weirdly actually feels looks and handles um well look not looks but handles like vantage sports car in my opinion you've driven it have you yeah i thought it was epic yeah yeah took it along a little spin around silverstone it seems to be having a race with an audi r8 which is not something i expected to see only at goodwood this is is this the r8 uh, yeah. green hell yeah that's it that's Grunhalle, um which has been a sort of limited edition made to honour the uh, R8 racing car that keeps winning the Nürburgring endurance races. Yeah, that's right. Multiple wins in the 24-hour race. Just 50 will be built to collector's car. Ah, oh, the Lexus LC convertible. Now, that's got the 5-litre V8, but they're bringing out the hybrid. Yeah, that so that right I gather. Around? Now, I mean, in the general context of McLarens and Ferraris and things, you go, oh, well, it's just a Lexus. But quite honestly, if you're a bit tired and you just wanted to get home tonight, that would be lovely because they're really nicely put together, very relaxing. That engine's great. Yeah, yeah, it is. There plenty of space inside. My goodness, that is a comfortable car, which actually then belies its, ability, its performance and its handling, which, you know, Lexus doesn't shy away from good performance and handling. Got here, Bentayga, Bentley Bentayga. Um, yeah. They've had a bit of fiddle with the styling of that, haven't they, and, and, and updated it a little bit. Um, they have top speed, 190 miles an hour. Oh no, yeah, Bentayga speed, top speed, 190 miles an hour. Driven by Le Mans winner Guy Smith, I think. Bonkers. This probably feels a little bit different to his Le Mans racing car, but they are eerily good considering that they're a big car and they weigh quite a lot. Yeah, they've got champagne fridges as well, I'm sure. How many bottles are in? Uh, a Magnum. A Magnum? Oh, At make... last. <laughs> True car of the people, I think. <laughs> Unbelievable craftsmanship from crew, though, and everything that Bentley produces these days. We particularly like all the moles and spec, or the, uh, the digital uh, detox that's offered by the revolving infotainment screen inside that disappears to just show some fascia got here at Ooh, BMW. Yeah, that's the M440i, isn't it? Yeah. Mm, yeah, rapid is what I've got to say about that. Is it? Is that a, it's a quick car, one of those deceptively quick cars. Yeah. Because it's not the M4, uh, but it probably is as quick as an old, you know, an M3 would have been like 15 years ago, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, M M440i, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, they were offering media uh, passenger rides in that on Thursday. A few got out, a few uh, green around the gills, I think, after a hot lap in that. Maybe they just looked at the front grille, which is certainly a uh, dividing opinion would be uh, the way of putting it. Oh, look at that. There's a Land Rover Defender. Oh, another one dividing opinion, but I blooming love it. What a great, great reimagining of that car, in my opinion. It is, isn't it? And there's, uh, there's a facelifted Jaguar XF, which um, is a car that probably gets overlooked because people aren't that interested in saloon cars, but it's, it's perfectly nice and they've done a really sort of interesting and detailed job on updating it with a nicer interior which it needed frankly yeah they've also got ah oh, just as i was about to mention it the f pace uh, coming up behind it suv but in plug-in hybrid form mm. and i think it's all about it's all about the plug-in hybrids these days richard yes but please people remember to plug them in they don't make sense if you don't you're just carrying batteries and gubbins around for no reason but if you plug them in they're great you can tootle around town on battery power and then you've got petrol power for longer journeys brilliant Absolutely. Good plug for the plug-in hybrid. I know, I'm quite into them at the moment, but I'm quite into this as well, because I think they've done a few subtle tweaks to this, the F-Pace, which I guess does good business for them because people like SUVs, um, including, uh, this is a very subtle detail, they've got rid of the joint at the front of the bonnet, and it actually makes the car look sleeker. Subtle change, but cost them a fortune to do for boring car industry reasons. And they get, oh, look at that, the 90 and the 110 uh, Defenders in formation there. Lovely, form isn't it? That formation 90 flying. on steel wheels in that slightly retro blue is a rather fabulous thing. Yeah, I mean, great design package. Legendary off-roading, of course, we just expect that. Um, but what... I mean, they're impossibly good off-road now because I think people get a bit upset that they don't have the sort of ladder chassis that the old Defender had, but actually all of the electronics that they have now for the kind of off-roading that most people might do, they're pretty much unstoppable, even if you don't really know what you're doing. Yeah, no one's going to use really a tenth of what these cars are actually capable of, but their wading depth, which always freaks me out, quite frankly, um, and their ability to go up and down the slippery stuff is quite something. But so too, you've got to ha hats off again to Jerry McGovern. Once again, he has designed a brilliant car. OK, now this is the Ford Mustang Mach-E 
1,400. Yeah, 1,400 brake horsepower, isn't it? It has uh, seven electric motors, which is extraordinary, because even something like the latest Avaya has, has four, one for each wheel, somehow has an extra three to create that 1,400 horsepower. It's also got um, uh, onboard speakers that are uh, generating uh, extra noise. The motors already make a pretty weird spaceship noise, but then on top of that, they've got some synthetic noise, which they created uh, with the musician T-Pain. Yeah, I love that. So important to show what electric power is capable of, isn't it? And you can have some fun. Yeah, important to show what T-Pain's capable of as well, because he hasn't really had any records out for a while that I can remember. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a, a mighty thing. Well, I think that's it for uh, Supercar Run, courtesy of Michelin and the first glance batch for today. Once upon a time in beautiful England, Mr. Martin meets a hill called Aston, and could be the universe was created, handmade, self-built, with sports running through our veins, baptized in the flames of adventure. That's what makes these wings fly. Welcome to the pack, DBX. So before we get to our final race of the day, the Sterling Moss Memorial Trophy, and before that, the Sir Sterling Moss Tribute, a quick look at a Gen 2 Formula E car. This the uh, Team Envision Virgin car, Karen Chanhock at the wheel of it. And although we've seen the uh, Jaguar uh, Formula E car a little earlier, there's a chance to have a look at the next generation, the second generation of Formula E machinery. And Karen Chanhock trying very hard indeed with a lock-up as he heads towards St Mary's. So the but groundbreaking Formula E category, taking another step forward with a different aero, and the car will, in a moment we understand, now go head to head with an electric bike and a drone. So that is coming up shortly as well. So Karin Chan not making his way down towards the Woodcut corner. And to, tomorrow, forgive me, there will be the uh, race, but this is just a, a test lap that Karun Chanok is doing in anticipation of tomorrow's head to head with the drone and the electric bike. So there's the chequered flag. So Karun will do one further lap round and uh, head.
head towards the paddock. And so at uh, some stage tomorrow, we'll see him in earnest in an all-electric competition, both uh, on track and in the sky. So, as I say, we've got one more race to come, which is going to be a little late, of course, now, but the uh, Sterling Moss Trophy coming up in due course. Prior to that, there will be the Sir Sterling Moss Tribute, and uh, there we can get the race itself up and down. Carry and Chanpot then down to St Mary's, turns his way up now to Lavin Corner, and very shortly we'll be making the run down towards Woodcut, up towards the completion of the lap. So once again, finding himself in something direct to drive over the course of the day. Carew and Chanhock down to Woodcut. He's had the check flag, so the car this time will head to either the pit lane or straight to the paddock. And uh, then, as I say, we'll get ready for the Sterling Moss tribute, ready for our final race of today. But tomorrow, just looking ahead, we're going to start with, uh, again, a very early get up. Ten past eight for qualifying for the Lavin Cup. And then first race at 8.40 for the uh, Richmond and Gordon Trophies. Right, last race coming up. First, though, let's go and join Tom Clarks. Last race coming up, as you say, David, and one of the highlights for me, because this is a very expensive grid of cars. It is a one-hour, two-driver race for GT cars pre-1963. And there are some, I think I'm literally talking about priceless cars on this grid. Unfortunately, the Ferrari bread van that won this last year when it was called the Kinrara at the Revival meeting isn't here, but we're going to have a classic battle at the front. It's going to be a great race. It is indeed. So the uh, cars, they're all lined up, good to go. But first of all, there will be our Sterling Moss tribute. And you see the Rob Walker colours on the Ferrari 250 with which the Lexus Sterling Moss had huge success here in the RACTT. This race, formerly known as the Kirara Trophy, uh, has perhaps the most glamorous grid on the Revival Race programme over the years, and it's been renamed uh, to honour the late and great Sir Sterling Moss. It's going to run to the dusk. Engines fire up, and so the car's set in a moment to be brought forward. All of them make a great noise. It's a pit stop race. Will be well. We should go for that, up and it will be a pit window at the 20 to 40 minutes mark. But there, first of all, out comes the famous Ferrari, ready to begin our tribute to Sir Sterling Moss. Ross Braun owns this car, and this is Ross driving it, so he will lead the tribute. BRDC badge proudly on the car. I say it was the Rob Walker colours. Uh, it wasn't Rob Walker that owned the car, but it ran in his colours. Sterling Moss drove the car. And up towards Ford Water it comes. The uh, RAC TT fell repeatedly to Sterling Moss at Goodwood. And it was a place that was very special to him. And for Ross Braun, a real treat of driving the car, to own the car no less. Uh, beautifully restored. The uh, field now being released behind from the assembly area, so this leads the field around to the grid. So we'll go to the grid in a few moments just to pick out some of the other cars. These are Garcia Body Giulietta setting off. That's the car of Nick James and uh, Julian Draper. Lights are blaze already, you see the number 19, the Tim Lazel, Richard Needham, TVR 142 Ferrari, the ex Graham Hill Joe Bonnier uh, car, that's Martin Halusa that will go first, number two, Nick James at the wheel of it, number seven, E Type, uh, Ian Dalgleish was going to share with James Turn, but Sam Tordoff is now going to drive that in the second stint because uh, James Turner has gone home. Let's drive. Ian Dalgleish was going to go solo, but Sam Tordoff's Porsche has got a gearbox problem, so number 600 Porsche withdrawn, and then into the car uh, of Ian Dalgleish will go Sam Tordoff. You're following all this, you see. 
So even at the last minute, even in the assembly area, shuffling and driver, Sam Tordoff's had a pretty horrible day, what with his galaxy braking, and uh, then the Porsche having a problem, so he's had a drive around out the day in the number 70 type instead. Number 90 type, just to caught a glimpse of in the background, that's going to be John Young that starts, son Jack to take over, and uh, Chris Baton also taking over the uh, seat of Nigel Greensill. Nigel not being here, so Chris Payton parachutes in to join David Gooding. So lots of uh, quick driver changes in the last minute. So the cars now head their way up to the grid. Again, it's the 3-2-3 three, grid. It's going to be a standing start. And uh, very shortly, once the grid is complete, there you see the big cement dust trail put down because of the liquid out of the back of Sam Tordoff's car earlier. That's going to make that side of the grid rather treacherous when the Cars have to unleash the power, but hopefully it won't be too big an issue. It'll soak up while we await the uh, start of the race. And uh, the cars then all good. They make their way to the line. Last minute drama one or two, but it still should be uh, a very entertaining race, no question about it. They're the E-types then for the front of the grid. Gary Pearson's car is on pole position. It's going to be Richard Mines that starts uh, from the middle of the front row. Harvey Stanley lining up on the outside of the front row of the grid. Second row is the Gregor Fiskin and uh, Marino Franchitti E-Type. And Oliver Bryant is going to go first. The car that lines up alongside. That's Ian Dalgleish, who's going to start at the rear of the grid alongside the Mick James Alfa Romeo. And who else do we have? Note, well, almost every car is of note uh, in some respect. Now you can see number 111, that's going to be Oliver Bryant to start. Phil Keane to take over. That must be a potential winning car. It starts on the second row of the grid certainly one to watch I think and uh, as soon as everybody is ready you can see that at the front of the grid in front of the uh, Ferrari there is the platform and we'll be going down to the grid very shortly for the to Sterling Moss tribute as uh, there the cars on the outside of the front row James Cottingham and Harvey Stanley's uh, left hooker E-Type the E-Type that had its first race just a month after it was uh, launched at the Geneva Motor Show, went to Bolton Park uh, and Graham Hill and Roy Salvadori drove the cars. We'll be joined the Duke of Richmond very shortly, the Duke of Richmond and Gordon for the Sir Sterling Moss tribute on the grid. Drivers in their cars ready for the green flag lap, but uh, everybody now getting ready for the start of the uh, one hour Sterling Moss Memorial Trophy as the Kinrara Trophy has been renamed. Fat drivers now encouraged to locate the cars ready for the tribute. And uh, there is Ross Braun. So he prepares himself coat on. And, uh, teams also make ready for the uh, Sterling Moss tribute, as I say, that will take place in a few minutes' time, ready for our last race of the day. All of these cars, pre-63 GT cars. There is Harvey Stanley along with James Cottingham that will start. Yep, hello James. On the outside of the front row of the grid. And uh, again, it's uh, certainly a car that has a very good chance of winning. Second row E-type, Oliver Bryant there with his familiar Union flag crash helmet standing alongside Phil Keane. And uh, then we have the uh, number one E-type. Gregor Fiskin and Marino Franchitti's car also to uh, keep an eye to on the second row of the grid. Drivers all ready, teams ready on the grid as well. There's the Richard Mines E-Type that uh, Richard will start. Middle of the front row, Rob Huff to take over in the second of the Dick Prothero cars. And uh, as everybody gets set, there, the grid all ready for the uh, Sterling Moss Memorial Trophy that will be, as I say, followed uh, following the tribute to Sir Sterling Moss by the Duke of Richmond and Gordon any moment now. to be a 
24 strong grid, I think, in the end, with the uh, problems for the Porsche. And Hugenholtz all good to go in the uh, Ferrari. He will start, seventh on the grid. So let us get our Sir Sterling Moss tribute underway. Let's, first of all, go down to the grid, and there is Dermot O'Leary. Uh, this is Goodwood Speed Week. Uh, in April this year, motor racing lost one of its most legendary and iconic figures, Sir Sterling Moss. Uh, so this weekend, at Speed Week, Goodwood pays tribute to a true hero of the sport. Sterling Moss, racing at Goodwood, seemed all set for another win. Since Fangio retired, Sterling has been the sport's top personality. Sir Sterling Moss, a true British hero, defined by his personality almost as much as his impact on the track. His first ever race was at Goodwood, and he enjoyed many of his most celebrated successes in this corner of West Sussex. Confident and charming, his style and swagger epitomised the lifestyle of a racing superstar and ensured he was one of the most beloved figures in British sporting history. Well, Sterling was just one of the all-time greats, and not only that, he was a, a massive character. He was a huge legend of the sport. I remember doing one of my first races at Goodwood, qualifying alongside Sterling, who was in a Lotus Cortina, and expecting it all to be quite gentlemanly into the first turn, and he had me straight on the grass. He was a big character and sadly, sadly missed. He walked like a racing driver, he talked like a racing driver, and he certainly drove like no other racing driver. The model. I think for all of us, certainly for me and people of my year, he just looked like he was part of the car. I own one of Sterling's old racing cars. That you know, shows how special Sterling was to me. We all know he was the greatest racing driver never to win a Formula One World Championship. He had very high standards. He was a true gentleman. Someone I miss a great deal. His exceptional versatility behind the wheel resulted in victories in every type of car, from 500cc F3 to saloons, as well as 16 Formula One Grand Prix wins during an exceptional career. I think one of probably the most underrated driver. He definitely had the skill, the passion for the sport. I think uh, the variety of cars that he mastered, not just drove, but mastered, is something we probably will not see again, ever. A great figure for, for us as drivers. A lot of us have, have looked up to in the past you know 15 20 years or, or even more just massively passionate for for motorsport for formula one for for british racing as well huge amount of respect for him to me that's one of the special things of being here at goodwood was getting to spend time with with sterling over a cup of tea and some scones in the afternoon sir sterling moss remains as famous today as when he retired following a crash here at goodwood on easter monday 1962. quite simply he was the greatest british driver of his generation and an extraordinarily unique talent. Stanley Moss will always be one of Britain's greatest sportsmen, as well as one of the world's greatest drivers. It's extraordinary, you can hear a pin drop right here. whole track stops and just watch that homage uh, and now a great friend of the Sterling's legendary guitarist Mark Knopfler playing Going Home the theme from Local Hero.
Sterling, Crawford, Moss. To the world at large, he was simply Sterling, or Mr. Motor Racing. To us, he will forever be Mr. Goodwood. Not since Nuvolari has anyone so perfectly epitomized the spirit of a racing driver. That heady blend of nerve, determination, bravery, and sheer God-given talent. Icon is an overused word, but Sterling was absolutely that. With Sterling, it was more than 16 Grand Prix victories or the countless wins in other categories, 212 of them in total out of 529 starts. It was more than the record Millimilia drive or the all-round ability that saw him win in more or less everything he drove. It didn't matter that he never won the World Championship. He simply knew he was leagues ahead of many who had, and so did we. He transcended his sport, celebrated not just for his sporting prowess, but simply for being Sterling Moss. His career was strangely entwined with our motor circuit here at Goodwood. His first race was here at our inaugural meeting on September the 18th, 1948, just a day after his 19th birthday. He won, of course, by an almost impossible margin against opposition in identical cars. And tragically, his final race was also here on that dark day in April 1962, when he suffered career-ending injuries in a crash on the far side of the circuit at St. Mary's. In between times, he was always the crowd favorite, winning so many times, including those four consecutive victories in the Blue Ribbon event of Goodwood season, the RAC Tourist Trophy. If the accident robbed him of his best years, then so too were we, his fans, robbed of the opportunity to watch him to savour the talents of one of sport's genuine megastars. In later years, when motorsport returned to Goodwood, he became the star attraction at our modern day events, a patron of the festival speed and ever present at the revival. And it wasn't just the fans who were in awe of him, grateful for just a fleeting moment in his presence. His fellow drivers also gravitated towards him, aware of his special place in the pantheon of the sport's all time greats. Even into his 70s, the silky style, arms out straight, head tilted back, was still evident, as was the sublime car control and the apparently effortless speed. We're so sorry that Susie couldn't be here with us today, and we send her our very best love and best wishes. I thank Mark Knopfler for that fabulous rendition of Local Hero. We celebrate today a life lived to the absolute full. And it is an honor to rename this race the Sterling Moss Memorial Trophy, a fitting tribute, I hope, to a truly unique figure in our sports history. We miss you, Sterling, and we will remember you. We will remember you always. Fabulous words from the Duke of Richmond and Gordon, and that sets us up then for the Sterling Moss Memorial Trophy. The grid is formed, cars, drivers are there, and the start driver now strapped into their pre-63 GT car, and we get set for one hour of racing, and uh, we'll be getting underway uh, in a few minutes' time once the grid is clear. And uh, of course, this race with the mandatory pit stops so it remembers Sterling Moss, of course, but it also gives us a chance to enjoy what promises to be a really entertaining, really exciting pre-1963 GT race with the Jaguar E-Types on the front of the grid. Now, before we go into the detail of the grid, let's head to the grid itself and rejoin Tom Clarkson. Well, I'm on the grid next to pole sitter Gary Pearson and the, the TV images cut to him at various points during that tribute and you could hear a pin drop throughout. It's an emotionally charged grid, this one, and I think we're going to see a great race getting underway in just a minute. 
can't argue with that, Tom. Absolutely. So uh, Gary Pearson will start from pole position and raced, of course, against Sir Sterling Moss in many of the Goodwood Revival events and indeed other historic events because in recent times Sir Sterling had uh, bought himself a little Oscar to go and enjoy himself with in uh, historic events. And uh, it was finally in a support race for Le Mans a few years ago that he decided time was time. So Gary Pearson fires up the E type, focuses now on the race ahead. David Addison, trackside, joined once more by Sam Hancock, who is drooling over this grid because, Sam, this is just outstanding in terms of the people on it and the cars on it. So the car's getting underway. For some reason we have small problems out. We'll come to that in a moment. Um, but the cars are about to set off. Let's try again. Sam, thoughts on this grid? Yeah, thought, oh, that's better. thoughts are those of some sympathy for the drivers lining up on the left-hand half of the grid, particularly those a little further back, because there's a load of oil that's been laid down covered in the drying cement dust. They're going to struggle for traction off the line. No such challenges, however, for the front row, probably even the front two rows, and this very unique Goodwood grid, three by two by three by two, closely packed formation, always makes for a very exciting start. It takes you back, doesn't it? Because I think uh, only in recent years have some of the, the other circuits lost that ability to have a 3-2-3 three, three grid, but of course things are wanting to be down here as they would be in period. Of course, 4-3-4 four, four grids at some venues was the norm. There is the grid stretching back, got one gap where the uh, Tordoff off Sunderton Porsche should have been, but with all of these E-types at the very front, picking a winner is very difficult indeed, and uh, after what we have just witnessed, what we've just felt, there's perhaps even more desire to win this race than ever before. Now, of course, the drivers will be looking up into the top right-hand corner of their windscreens and through it toward the person on the flag, on the Union flag. We should have a green flag left first yeah. that gives them now an opportunity to practice their starts they'll be picking up the revs feathering the throttle taking a bit of a punt really at how many revs they need to get off the line cleanly without the engine bulking and dropping in revs that would require another little dip of the clutch and delay their acceleration but again too much too much of a heavy right foot and you're going to sit there on the line with the rear wheel spinning not so easy to get these early 60s GT cars off the line. No, very true. So there is the Richard Mines E-Type. The Exit Prothero, or one of the Exit Prothero cars, ready to go. And in a moment or two, the green flag. There it is, will be waved to release the cars for the final race of day two of the Goodwood Speed Week, presented by Mastercard. You see one or two of them there trying to steer away from that cement dust, but with an hour of racing, Get off the line nicely, keep out of trouble, worry about the plan from then on in as the cars now turn their way through Magic Corner. And already the lights looking as though they're going to have to do quite a bit of work in this. The light's just starting to go, isn't it? It is. I was out last night in the Jerry Marshall Trophy into the dusk, and it's amazing how much vision you can lose, actually, even just before sunset. What happens is it becomes harder to pick out your braking points. There's still plenty of ambient light. It's not a problem to pick the line, pick your apexes, but getting that meter perfect braking point, particularly at the end of the long lab and straight, braking for Woodcut, you've got to be really accurate there because just a couple of meters too late, and these early cars have a big habit of locking the inside front wheel, very tiny tire contact patch, and there's no room for error on this circuit. Let's have a look at the grid then. Gary Pearson starts on pole position, Richard Mines alongside, and then Harvey Stanley on the outside of row one, ahead of Gregor Fiskin and Ollie Bryant. Adrian Wilmot's on row three, alongside Hans Hugenholtz and Nick Mayton. Then you've got Mike Grant, Peterkin and Nal McFadden, ahead of Tim Lazell, uh, then David Gooding and John Young. The sixth row of the grid is where you find Richard Walmer and Carsten LeBlanc. Then there is uh, Alan Letts in the he shares with Chris Snowden, uh, then Mark Gordon and Martin Stratton on the outside of that row, ahead of uh, David Clark and then Ed Foster with the MGB. On the ninth row, there is the uh, Richard, Bur sorry, Michael Birch, latest elite, the ex-Peter Arundel car. A gap where the Porsche of Tim Sugden and Sam Tordoff is not because of gearbox problems. 
Martin Halusa is there, and then the back row, Nick James and Ian Dalgleish. Uh, and that car's had a quick change of driver as well. James Turner standing down, and Sam Tordoff will do the second stint. So he's broken one car, or one car has broken on its way to the assembly area. Gear linkage fell apart. Tim Sutton described it as gearbox renovations while he was sitting there. But Sam Tordoff has found a berth in uh, a different car at the 11th hour. So this is on board with Mark Gordon, starting 17th on the grid. And the cars now turn their way up towards the grid. Of course, standing starts. Yeah, and if Gary Pearson can repeat the standing start he just made off the green flag at the start of this warm-up lap, he'll be looking good into turn one. He definitely left the others standing, particularly Richard Mines struggling to get off the line, the centre of the three cars on the front row. And interestingly, although it's down to personal preference, a lot of the teams will choose to put the slightly slower of the two drivers out first. The idea being that if you put the quicker of the two drivers, they could build up some kind of an advantage, only to have it neutered later in the race if a safety car is thrown. So strategically, it does make sense for the slightly slower of the two to start. And one car that that doesn't really apply to is that of Oliver Bryant and Phil Keane on the second row, both of them Massively fast professionals look out for them in the pale grey E-type. So the green flag at the back shows that everybody is back from the formation lap. All eyes now on the starter's flag as the Sterling Moss Memorial Trophy is go. The flag falls, the E-type's rocking away. Mike Grant, Peter gets Cobra, snakes off the line. Sluggish start seemingly from the... Oli Bryant, E-Type, which gets gobbled up in the pack as they dive down towards Madrick for the first time. And it's going to be Gary Pearson that leads the way. On board with Mark Gordon. Carl's on the left of him. He's losing a place, possibly on the outside line. But it is Gary Pearson, then, who hits the front as they come for the first time in a one-hour race along the run towards Fall Water. And there, the Cobra, Mike Grant Peterkin, tries to get up the inside, looking for position as they head up towards St Mary's for the first time. But a really good start by Pearson. Not a great start by Bryant. Another good start from Gregor Fiskin from the second row. He tucked it up the inside into Madgwick, taking a position. He's now running in third, trying to keep pace with the leading duo. Richard Mines ahead in E-Type, of course. Now, there's the top three starting to pull a bit of a gap. Gregor, if he can just tether himself to the back of Richard Mines. And in turn, if Richard... Oh, as they all start tripping over each other, down into Lab. And that is with the obvious overtaking opportunities on the lap here at Goodwood. Three into one doesn't always go. So that going through on the inside was uh, Nick Mayton going ahead, and that puts him then in number 10 just up th on the inside line. But the top three certainly escaping. So Gary Pearson it is then who leads the way with Harvey Stanley, who's been very impressive day long in this car. There in second place, the two uh, white E-types dive into the chicane up towards the end of lap one. We're talking tenths of a second between the two big cats. They prowl their way now past the pits. One lap. In the book, Gary Pearson sharing with Alex Brundle, leading the way. Second across the line is Harvey Stanley. Third, it is Gregor Fiskin. And then a gap back to them, the uh, battle that's going on with, looking on the inside line there. Look, you can see the Aston Martin of Adrian Wilmot going through on the inside to take the place away from Nick Mason as they go around that right-hander of Madrid. So the Aston, the DB4 GT, up into fourth place. And Adrian Wilmot absolutely on a mission then, just up to the grass. Yeah, traditionally we've seen Adrian driving that car. He's not afraid of exploring the outermost limits of the circuit with here at Goodwood. Just about hanging on to it there. Nice shot here again as they come up towards No Name. The cars go light over that crest and then they've got to keep the car loaded laterally so that it's poised, ready to turn into the first part of St Mary's. Two race leading E-types then as one. And uh, then in third place, Gregor Fiskin hustling along. Richard Mines in danger of losing another place, though, there. Look, because Mike Grant, Peter Kinn in the Cobra, tries on the outside line, can't do it. Richard Mines here having to try to keep the car in the hunt so that Rob Huff is able to try and then bring it back into contention in the second stint. The oversteering Cobra there of Richard Woolmer goes through. It's another car that's looking pretty competitive early on. And two can halt there in the glorious Ferrari short wheelbase Ferrari. Number 14, he's dropped back just a little bit off the line. He'll be handing over later to Dario Franchitti. So if you can hold, can just keep the car up there in the leading pack, as it were. Dario might have a chance of getting back in with the sniff of a podium later on in this long race. So we're going to have two Franchitti brothers going head to head off in the second stint, Ferrari and uh, E Type respectively. Right, over the timing line has gone Gary Pearson. He's four tenths of a second up now on uh, in second place. Harvey Stanley, and then in third, it is Gregor Fiskin. 
fourth is Adrian Wilmot. In fifth place now, it's the E-Type in the hands of Mick Mayton. Then you've got hans Hugen Holtz ahead of John Young. Mike Grant, Peter Kidd. Richard Mines is down in ninth place, and it could be tenth in a moment because Richard Woolmer is right there behind him. But look at that. Again, that long shot showing the speed of the car, showing what Goodwood is like. And the number one, third place E-Type gobbling up the tarmac as it heads now towards St Mary's. Stanley putting Gary Pearson under a bit of pressure there as they came through the left-hander at St Mary's. Gary, though, a wily fox. He's been around the block a few times. He knows how to make that car just a little bit wider. A little bit of subtle body language that's not really visible to us from the outside, but will be all too visible to Harvey Stanley behind. Pearson just letting him know when, only when, he's going to let up. Give him a little sniff of a gap on the run into Woodcote. And there, Hans Hugenholz, look at the Ferrari coming out of attack from John Young with his E-Type. So, uh, John, who has done many a mile around Goodwood, very, very successful historic racer, started off in oval racing in Hot Rods many, many, many years ago, closing right up now as they drop down to Woodcote, turns into the right-hander, trying to hustle on behind the Dutchman in the Ferrari, and in turn also clear off from the Cobra. So, Mike Grant, Peterkin, is the next man in the queue, hoping to be able to close on John Young if he gets stuck behind the Ferrari. The lead gap, half a second. Gary Pearson has just done the fastest lap of the race as they go through, heading now out of Madwick on towards Fordwater. Go the race leaders. Uh, up into ninth place, by the way, has gone the red Healy 3000 of Richard Woolmer at the expense of Richard Mines. So Richard here is falling away early on, putting the onus very definitely on Rob Huff. And now, look, John Young starting to really, really, really push the Ferrari of Hans Hugenholz. Yeah, and recovering slightly from an aborted attempt into turn one. He had a look up the inside, but it was too little, too late. He put a wheel on the grass just in the braking zone. Now Whoa. he commits. Very, very last minute lunge, beautifully executed through the first pass of St Mary's, gets the pass cleanly completed, closes the door as they turn left, and now he's already exiting with two car, a two-car length cushion. Meanwhile, that puts Hans Hugenholz under pressure from behind. So, really good move, that, wasn't it, to come charging through into sixth place by John Young. Meantime, for the race lead, Gary Pearson cannot shake off Harvey Stanley. There wasn't much to choose between these in qualifying. Remember that the interloper on the front row was courtesy of a Rob half time. And back marker there in the way, that is Nick James. So, through they come out of the chicane. Now, is this going to... In Put yep. the lead in jeopardy, let's see, because they're going to be almost side by side as they come up towards the line. Harvey Stanley tries to go to the inside line. Gary Pearson covers him off. So Harvey Stanley to the outside now as they go into Madrid. Absolutely nose to tail. So Gary Pearson is under big, big pressure now through the right-hander. Alex Brundle is watching all of this in the pit lane. And he is there nervously watching with Tom Clarkson. Absolutely fantastic driving from Stanley. <laughs> quick analysis of what's going on so far. Yeah, really big. Um, we're, Gary's done a, done a great start and uh, is leading the race, but we're under, obviously, as you can see, pretty big pressure uh, right now. But he's hanging on, on brilliantly, and uh, car looks good. Quick word on the car. Yeah, they're all happy with it this morning. Lovely balance. So, uh, so far, so good. Let's just hope everything holds through to the end, and uh, P1's what we like to see. All right. Good luck with that, you're still in the lead. Thanks a lot. See you guys. Still in the lead, but only just still in the lead. They've got Richard Mines coming under attack. Look for number 21, the helium Carsten LeBlanc, then 111, Oliver Bryant. Now, why is Ollie Bryant down in 12th place, Sam? That, we talked about a bad start, but he's not been able to respond, has he? I think something must have gone wrong off the line. Perhaps they struggled with the clutch or something. Perhaps he's not got much use of it now. Harvey Stanley still keeping Gary, Pre Gary Pearson under huge pressure. Was that a wisp of smoke out of the back of the Stanley E-Type? Let's just have another look. It might have been tar smoke. Getting a little bit lively, isn't it, as it comes up towards the line now. Beautiful drift out of the chicane. Harvey, relatively new to historic racing, relatively new to racing full stop, driving superbly. Great performance from half the suave. So, Gary Pearson, another fastest lap of the race. Four tenths of a second up, he is then over Harvey Stanley. And these two just escaping. They're ten seconds to the good already over Gregor Fiskin. So it's an electrifying pace. People are up at the front, number 48 through there, the Corvette Stingray. No, that car, the Chevrolet Corvette, I should say. Alan Letts at the wheel of it, former oval racer, turned Mini 7 racer, turned historic racer. He's under attack from the TVR in the hands of Tim Lazell. Look, as they come up towards the line, so the Chevrolet Corvette just hanging on to its place. 
Tim Blaisel, the artist, driving very well as well. He was in his 1800 BMW teaser earlier on, doing a very, very good job in that. Meanwhile, we reach Jim Bryant up the inside into Ford Water. He found a bit of pace now from that E-Type, so slow off the line. Stellar driver pairing, Holly Bryant, Phil Keane. But at the moment, the onus is on Phil Keane, isn't it, to make amends here, because after that slow start, it's given a lot of time away. It's 34 seconds behind the leading car. That's a huge amount. Yeah, Martin Hallou, so we just got a shot in that glorious CFAX short wheelbase. Not really set up for circuit racing as much as it is for sort of tours and rallies, so he'll just be enjoying gracefully drifting the car around the circuit for the next 50 minutes and 48 seconds. So the leaders go across the line. The gap is 0.4 of a second between the two and Harvey Stanley. In a sense, yes, he would like to get the race lead and see if he can pull clear of Gary Pearson, but as long as he can hand over the E-Type to James Cottingham with this sort of a deficit to make up in the second stint, given the James is more experienced in historic racing terms than Alex Brundle. You could argue right now advantage to the 36 e type. It could be, but it's much easier to be the hunter than the hunted. So Gary Pearson will have his mirrors full of those bright headlights, which I'm sure Harvey has turned on to full beam deliberately, just to keep Gary on his toes. Doesn't seem to be having much effect though. Gary will have seen it all before. Very poised drive. Right? There's a few strips of tank tape on the radiator just to keep the engine temperatures up. Yeah, you're right. A little bit of smoke when the 36 E type. Yeah, I think there's maybe the bodywork just rubbing on the inside rear of the rear wheel arch on the left hand rear corner of the car when it's under load. So hopefully we don't have to worry too much about that. I'm still quite impressed by the pace these are doing because you think there's nobody else on the track. They are now 12 seconds clear of anybody else as down now towards Woodcote Corner comes this battle between Gary Pearson in the lead of the race right there behind him. It is Harvey Stanley then and the margin between them is still no more than half a second and it has been like this really since the race started. Now up towards the timing line the first 10 minutes are done and Gary Pearson feeling the pressure very definitely. Harvey Stanley just sitting in the wheel tracks. Another lap ticked off the gap 0.349 of a second another 10 minutes and we can think about the pit window opening lovely driving out front from gary pearson here he's picking his moments ever so subtly defending without compromising his own line too much he knows that on the run up to madrick he doesn't need to go fully to the inside just a little bit of a drift towards the middle of the road is enough to tell stanley behind you're not coming through here pal wait your turn so there is Mike Grant Peter Kidd, a little bit further back in the pack, but still going strongly with the Cobra, and he currently is seventh place going after John Young. So we saw John working his way up past John uh, Hans Hunenholt for a little while back, and now the Cobra has done exactly the same. These two run together as they now turn their way up through the uh, approach to St. Mary's into the first part of it now, the right hander. Navigating their way cleanly past Calusa in the short wheelbase. Dusk is descending. Bryant again up the inside on the apex at Ford Water. Tom McFadden at wheel of the E type. Back with the leading duo now. Pearson still ahead of Harvey, Stan Harvey Stanley as they go through and out of the chain. Brilliant overhead shot just a moment ago. Gave us a quick illustration. Slightly different te technique, different between the two of them on the way into the chicane and in fact here as well into Madwick, Harvey Stanley likes to get a little bit wider a little bit more over to the left on the entry that'll straighten the car up through the exit conversely on the way into the chicane you'll see he takes a shallower earlier turning point making a little more of a straighter line on the approach but pays the price on the exit so Gary Pearson the race leader he did win the Kinrara trophy as it then was last year sharing with Andrew Smith in a Ferrari 250 Harvey Stanley We've been hearing from Sam Hancock, a newcomer to motor racing in general, never mind historics, but he's doing a really good job staying right on the back of one of the most experienced and in revival terms successful drivers here, Gary Pearson. Is he sitting there just biding his time, waiting for the pit stop, staying in touch, or is he genuinely struggling to find that last tenth? Because if he is going to get past Gary Pearson, it's a major scout to claim. Gary knows exactly what he's doing and knows exactly how to defend. But Harvey Stanley stays right there on the tail. He's not dropping away, but he's not been darting around looking to make that overtaking move. Well, they're both driving beautifully. And to me, it looks like they're both absolutely flat out. They've dropped the number one car of Gregor Fiskin, who's not even in our shot anymore. So, crack 
striking pace, both of them in the low 130s, and that's a good second and a half or so advantage on raw pace alone over the closest challengers of Fiskin and Wilmot. So again, as one, this enormous white eight-wielding type, so close to the two leaders, comes out of the chicane then. More and more back markers up the road, including that look, the number 9 E-type of Mark Gordon that's going to be negotiated uh, shortly. Together they are right under braking there because the gap right down onto the tail comes Harvey Stanley. It was two tenths of a second only when they started this lap, but now is the traffic going to get in the way? Stanley perhaps thinks about the outside line, but Gary Pearson, the pioneer, he has got to get through the traffic there. Gets past Michael Birch with the uh, Lotus Elite, the XP to Aaron Little Carl there is Harvey Stanley going through full water. Gary Pearson still ahead of him, but only just as they come to the right handed part, the first part of St. Mary's now. This is lap 10. Well, the cards can fall either way in your favour or against when you're in second position relying on the leader to punch the hole through the traffic. On the one hand, you hope that the traffic ahead impedes the leader, gives you a little chance to chuck it up the inside, catch them unawares. But on the other hand, if the traffic joins back onto the line in between the two of you and separates the two fighting cars, it's very hard to make that time back up, particularly when they're so closely matched as Stanley now into the slipstream, closer than we've seen him yet having a look Pearson goes defensive to the inside Stanley to the outside it's really the first time Harvey Stanley has mounted a proper bit for race honors here and he's all over Gary Pearson like a cheap suit isn't he as they come now up through Woodcock corner the two of them together but Gary will position the car exactly right to hang on to the lead less than five minutes before the pit window opens this battle is going to go on and on and on the more sideways of the two there out of the chicane was Harvey Stanley, but he doesn't really lose out as a consequence. He still got the pace to stay on the tail and then dyke to the outside of Gary Pearson. It wasn't really the room on the outside line. That would have been a brave, brave effort. And so Harvey Stanley slots back in behind as the cars now uh, make this run out of Magic, heading up towards Ford Water. But suddenly the complexion of this battle changes, doesn't it? Harvey Stanley looking a lot more toey. He wants to get ahead. He wants that lead. Yeah, and it looks like Pearson's having to use a bit more of the track width. Perhaps the tyre just starting to go off, maybe slightly over pressure. Struggling to defend now, but for Harvey Stanley, he's forced Gary into a full-on defensive line around the whole lap, which helps him on the way in, but you have to pay for that on the way out with a wider exit when you're the leading car forced into defensive tactics. Now, in this battle pack, uh, further down, there's Richard Mines, there is also Nal McFab, and there is Oliver Bryant, who, don't forget, was fifth on the grid and is now way, way back in terms of start. So, yes, it was a slow start by that car, but it may well have a problem because he's over a minute back and not even a Phil Keane uh, effort can bring that down, I wouldn't have thought. Yeah, a real shame for those two. I know they had high hopes. They've still got a bit of work to do on the car to extract all of the pace out of it, Ollie was telling me just now in the assembly area. But still, you know, they had the pace for certainly a top five, maybe even a top three finish. So a real shame to see them dropping backwards with some kind of problem. Yeah, it must be, must be, because uh, Ollie Bryant is not a slow driver, that is for sure. And struggling in a sense here to fend off the Healy behind the cast of the block. He's struggling to get past Norman Fadden, racing here the second time as he comes now into the left-hander at St Mary's and up front the lead gap still four tenths of a second between Pearson and Stanley. And there's Norman McFadden through, Ollie Bryant still swing away at the wheel with the correction applied as the back tries to wag out, put the power down and the back tries to step out even more but the Jaguars here accelerate down towards Woodcut. Richard Mines just rounding out the top ten in the car that he will give over shortly to Rob Huff. Yeah, and Huff, he's going to have his work cut out, yeah. isn't he? Obviously, that was another of the front row cars. Started second place on the grid. That would have been a lap time set by Huffy in qualifying. So, a lot of work to be done after the driver changeover. We're coming into the window soon, actually. And Nal McFadden here all over the back of Richard Mines. So the Irishman who will hand over to Paddy Shovlin, former British GT racer and Ferrari Challenge racer. He times go past the pit, then great noise that they all make Castle LeBlanc there right up behind them in 13th place in the big Healy down towards the right at Madrid they go. So this battle pack is for 10th and back as they turn uh, through the long right. Richard Mines drifts out wide. Does that give Ollie Bryant a chance to challenge us? Here are the race leaders still absolutely tied together. Now that gives you an idea of just how far ahead of the Oliver Bryant car they are because oh. they're at the end of the lap, was up the kerb and onto the dirt. There goes Harvey Stanley. Yeah, he'd have lost some momentum. He'll have to check the throw.
throttle lift out of it, gather the car up, just went a little bit too wide on the throttle out of the chicane there. That's given Gary some breathing space into turn one at Madgwick. But how long for? Because he he has to navigate his way past the traffic. Stanley will be tucking in behind, hoping to take advantage of Gary's hard work as he punches a hole through the back markers. So onto Ford Water they come. This is lap 13, 41 minutes of the race to go. And there is Alex Brundle getting ready. Um, oh, a big off there. That's the Lotus Elite, I'm afraid, of David Clark. And also off is the 142 Ferrari of Martin Halusa. And, and Gary Pearson is involved in all of that, the race leader. Big damage, I'm afraid Alex Brundle sees the pictures on, no, he says, because that is his car out of the race, damaged, he's denied a chance to get on board. What triggered all of that? Because that has taken three cars out of the race, and I rather fear that that was getting through the traffic. That marker's wrong place, wrong time, possibly we'll hopefully be able to piece it together, and so Harvey Stanley will pick up the lead. Now, keep an eye out for strategy here, because that will surely trigger a safety car if the pit window opens, which is about to do any second the more bdi driver will dive straight in to try to take advantage of that safety car because as soon as it is thrown they're not allowed to pit under the safety car Indeed. but if the window opens before the safety car is called they can duck in and as long as the driver change pit stop is underway when the safety car is officially declared they can carry on and take advantage of the, the pause in racing there it is Indeed, there is the safety car, and the pit lane is therefore closed whilst the safety car is on track. So uh, we saw this process earlier on in the day. If the safety car is deployed and doesn't pick up the leader, the green light will go on. Now, how did we get to where we got to? Gary Pearson there goes through ahead of Harvey Stanley. And there's the Lotus Elite. Gary goes to the inside, hits the Lotus and hits the Ferrari. Oh, big damage to the E-Type. That fires David Clark off the road. So there's the damage on one side. Gary Pearson goes for a gap, which kind of closes. Cannons off the Elite into the Ferrari. Big damage to the e -type. Yeah, hits the Ferrari. Bang, the Lotus Elite. Gosh, the front actually ripped off that car. So that, I'm afraid, is uh, a big mess, that Elite. So that car parked by the side of the road. And uh, that's why the safety car is now out, so that the cars can be retrieved. So I feel a bit of sympathy actually for Gary Pearson on that because mm. he went up the inside at the exact moment that the elite ahead would, under normal circumstances, just have waft drivers left a car's width or so, opening up a very reasonable gap for which he had enough closing speed to cleanly pass by the apex. But I think the elite was maybe trying to be helpful actually or, or just turning in on a, on a slightly different line to the one that you might reasonably expect as the following driver the elite just tightened his line which would have caught gary unawares having already committed to that inside well david clark i think all the brunt of that with that uh, elite going into the barrier there he is he's okay shaking his head not impressed of course but he's okay gary pearson's car with a lot of damage on the left front after hitting the uh, Halusa Ferrari, Martin Halusa's car, that's uh, the 250 GT short wheelbase. There's the confirmation that the pit window is suspended, so the race carries on. But actually what this does is twofold. It brings all the gaps down, but then it gives your gun for hire less time in the second part of the race. If you were thinking of pitting early, well, you're calm, but it's going to give that driver less opportunity after the stops. Well, critically, just to pick back up on what I was saying earlier, I think the safety car was called just before the pit window opened, yeah. which meant that nobody is able to take advantage of the safety car. The rules this year don't allow you to pit as long as the safety car is out. Traditionally, that has not been the case. You'd normally have a yeah. flood of drivers in there now clogging up the pit lane instead they're going to have to wait and of course also this means as we said before the race if you had put your hot shoe out first and they had built up to kind of an advantage track position and what have you all of that will now be undone because of this safety car so that is why many a team elected would be quick driver in seconds that looked like an overtake to me as the cars came out of the chicane let's see but uh, the uh, number nine mark gordon e time you're riding with coming out number 90 is the John Young e type, which is on a lap, in fact, yes. So, number 90 e type have gone a lap down, and perhaps there's now some debate through the semaphore as to who should be ahead. So, the uh, 
safety car on track. Mark Gordon looking across. And there goes John Young. Oh, to get his place back and also to get past the Cobra. So not quite what was expected. Now, he was behind the Cobra when he came across the line, was John Young. So not quite sure why he's overtaking it there, are you? He may feel that for some reason they drove by. I don't know, maybe he lifted off or he needed to address an issue and they went by when they shouldn't have done. I'm not sure, but the rule says five car lengths from the car ahead is the maximum gap that you should allow. So if anybody drops back too far, it's not a surprise to see the following cars overtake. But in doing so, they definitely risk a penalty because that is not written into the regs as something that you're allowed to do. Exactly right. So the car with the fastest lap there, you can see on the graphic with the purple clock next to it, the retirements, Gary Pearson. It's very rare you find Gary damaging cars. That's a, a rare moment to say the gap just at the last minute just seemed to not disappear, but certainly narrowed it. Yeah, it, it's tough for everybody involved in that because, of course, Gary and uh, Harvey Stanley were embroiled in that fantastic battle where every tenth will have counted. And we were just saying a minute ago that it's quite tough to be the leader, the first one to come across the back markers and try to pick a hole through. Gary won't have wanted to have lost any momentum and had been decisive throughout in doing so. And just, I think, three or four cars on the same bit of road, they're all going into a very tricky corner where the, the speed is so high and the cars are so light on their feet. It's very hard, actually, to reposition the car in that part of the circuit if you need to adapt your line to compromise it and, and give another car around you any space. You haven't actually got that much control with the speed that you're carrying into the first part of some areas. Once you've committed to that line, which is something you choose somewhere around the exit of Ford Water, to be honest, a few, few metres later, perhaps, it's hard to make adjustments thereafter. Well, as we were saying earlier, this does really bring now number 111 E-Type back into the mix. Because from being over a minute adrift, you're now looking at about 20 seconds back on the front to Phil Keane. Uh, the downside for Phil is that there's less time of the race that he can make a difference uh, for if and when we get the cars through the pit window. But uh, the cars for the moment are continuing. So the pit window will open as soon as the track is clear. But right now the lights stay on uh, atop the safety car. Everybody's staying out on track. And uh, it is, of course, now Harvey Stanley leading the way from Gregor Fiskin and Adrian Wilmot third in the Aston Martin. The other thing I wonder, the little little Lotus Elite will have been able to carry a lot of speed through that apex at the first part of St Mary's, probably not needing to break as early or as much as the E-types were a little bit heavier and arriving a little bit faster. I wonder if um, that just created just enough confusion to trigger that whole incident. Could well be. So uh, the car's here turning up through St Mary's and uh, looks order, as I say, Harvey Stanley from Gregor Fiskin from Adrian Wilmot. Fourth now, Mick Mason ahead of John Young up into fifth. Sixth, Mike Grant Peterkin. And seventh now is Hans Hugenholz ahead of Richard Warmer. Hans Hugenholz, car seventh, to be taken over by Dario Franchitti. And Dario is with Tom. Well, Dario, it's the big wait. How long is the safety car? going to be out. That's what we're all asking. I think that's what everybody in pit lane's asking here. They're all waiting and as soon as the safe car comes in, I think pit lane's going to get very, very busy. No, no, what's your take on the race so far? That was interesting. Real shame that the uh, the incident happened between the, you know, the leaders there and that looked beautiful Lotus Elite getting damaged was, was really sad, but um, much different mix of drivers now going in, so we'll, uh, we'll see how, uh, how things go. Uh, Dari, can you quickly show us? So what happens? You've got your own seat. I've got a booster cushion because uh, Hans is quite a bit bigger than me, so I've got a booster cushion too. So I can reach the pedals. To steer me all the That's fantastic. Good luck. Thanks, Dario. The circuit is clear, and the safety car staying out for the moment as the cars then turn their way up through Magic. So uh, still the lights on. When the lights go out on top of the safety car, you know it's set to peel in. But uh, with three cars, I think, to retrieve, yes, because the Ferrari also ended up stranded trackside, it's going to be uh, a fair few minutes. And we're almost at the halfway point now. So uh, everybody waiting for the situation to be 
as a point where the pit lane can open. That's the Ed Foster MGB, the Roger and the Ali Poole car that he shares with Nick Padmore, the fastest man as we know now uh, around Goodwood. He uh, improved upon his lap record earlier on in the day. Now, of course, strategy is going to play a key part again now because as soon as the safety car comes off, expect to see a flurry of cars head straight into the pit lane. The window, remember, is open, but, pit, uh, but access to the pit lane has been temporarily closed until the safety car has ended. The problem is, if you come into the pit lane at the same time as everybody else, there's a good chance you're going to get bulked with traffic either coming into your sort of designated parking bay, as it were, where your co-driver is waiting for you, or you're going to get bulked on the way out. Now, driver change speed itself is no longer a factor this year. There is now a two-minute mandatory pit stop time. Stopwatch on that starts on the way into the pits and finishes as you exit the pits and cross the exit line. Therefore, there's plenty of time to do a single relaxed driver change in the middle. So it's been allowed just for a bit of uh, sanitation, the cockpit area in this COVID era. So don't be surprised to see a quick cloth giving a wipe down of the steering wheel and the gear lever and so on. And uh, that gives the drivers plenty of time to strap in and get comfortable. But what they do need to do is pray there is nobody directly in their way and balking them from pulling cleanly out of their parking spot. Yes, it's one of those situations where you have to get on with your neighbour, isn't it? So that so you can quickly escape a bit when it is the moment so to do. Safety car staying out, of course, for a little while longer whilst this incident is attended to. The uh, natural light just starting to dip a little bit more. We're going through is Adrian Wilmot with the uh, Aston Martin, the uh, DB4 GT, Tom Alexander's car that uh, was sold first to an American market. There, the rest of the field come pouring through. The TVR goes through. There is Sir Alan Letts with the Chalet Corvette. It's the car owned by the author Peter James, but it is going to be uh, Chris Snowden, local driver, who will take over. Pat Blakeney Edwards, good to go. So you can expect whatever it is he gets into to be sideways. It'll be the AC Cobra and Mike Grant Peterkin that uh, he will take over. Somebody else watching all of this. Uh, having been out in the Formula One demonstration earlier, Esteban Gutierrez, Tom Clarkson has found a very interested spectator, Tom. Yeah, interested spectator. How are you enjoying it? I'm loving it. I can't believe how much they push with these cars. They're so so beautiful. Uh, there's not many of them uh, exist. So it's great to see this. It's amazing. Now, do you have a favorite car in this field? They're all pretty priceless, really. Yeah, I mean, there's some uh, very nice Jaguars. Uh, very beautiful looking, very elegant. And they're quick, one of them is Link. Absolutely. Now, when I say the name Sterling Moss to you, what does it mean? It's a big heritage of motor racing. Uh, it's really uh, English motorsports heritage, is all I can think of. And, and with your know, corporate head on, he won his first Grand Prix, the British Grand Prix 1955, in a Mercedes. Exactly. So I'm, you know, I took the words out of your mouth, didn't I? <laughs> No, it's great. It's, it's, it's great to see how important you know, this event has become. And obviously, you know, the tribute to Sterling Moss and to be here and to express it that and what it means to, to the UK motorsports. It's really nice. All right. Well, enjoy the rest of the race. Thanks, Esteban. Thank you very much. Green flag wave. We are back racing then. So the pit window is open now for 20 minutes. And you can see just how busy it gets down there. First of all, you've got to find your team. Uh, so there are drivers leaping out saying, come on, park here. Chris Snowden there in the black overalls ready to take over the Chevrolet. Hans Hugo Holtz dragged out of the car by the team and by Dario Franchitti, who gets his little booster seat, as he was saying, ready to get on board. It gets the Scotsman. Yeah, saw a lot of the leaders there carrying on, and I think that's the right strategy. If you've got good pace under you, take advantage of the clear road ahead. Take advantage of the quieter circuit as half of the field duck into the pit lane for two minutes to do their driver change and just go and bank some qualifying pace laps to get a bit of track position and then do your pit stop a little later in the window, hopefully coming into a quieter, calmer pit lane.
Now that battle you're looking at is for second, third and fourth. Gregor Fiskin ahead of Adrian Wilmot, ahead of uh, Nick Mason as they come now down towards Woodcut, getting themselves through the traffic, putting a lap on Ed Foster going nicely with the MGB. Pit stops are cycling through in as well and Arma Fadden in to give way to Paddy Shufflin as well so the order will be somewhat jumbled for the next few minutes it is still a 20 minute window so the uh, time after the window closes will not be much up towards the chequered flag but let's concentrate on this battle for the moment Gregor Fiskin staying out Adrian Wilmot going after him then you've got Nick Mason and also John Young and then the Aston Martin goes to the inside line down towards Madrid quivering under braking Adrian Wilmot tries to get up alongside but he can't really do it there the two of them Turn from the corner absolutely together. Good defence by Gregor Fiskin, still being able to hang on to the place. Really nicely done by Gregor under the brakes. Just managed to chop in front of the Aston Martin and came out on a good, proper, normal racing line, giving a good slingshot up towards Ford Water and a nice car, car length cushion already. Ed Foster falls out of his MG, uh, gives way to Nick Padmore. Ed Foster is really not designed for as little a car as the MG is. No, no, of all the things he could have chosen, <laughs> my boggles. Right, now back on track, uh, other battles, this is John Young, number 90, who has just got himself up into fourth place at the expense here of Nick Mayton. So you've got a reversal between the two types for fourth and fifth places. And out of all of this, did Ollie Bryant pin? Yes, he did. So Ollie Bryant, number one, 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 into giveaway now to Bill Keane. And this is really playing into the hands of the leader, Harvey Stanley and the James Cottingham E-type, because not only have they got a nice clear road around them, but also their closest challenger, Gregor Fiskin, that we're looking at now, and the number one E-type is getting embroiled in a battle with the Aston Martin of Wilmot behind. Those two holding each other up just a little bit, and that is allowing Stanley to pull away. Does he pit this lap? No. Committing absolutely the right decision. Look at the road ahead. There's nobody there. Stanley's had fantastic pace from the start. He just needs to reel off some flat-out laps at 100% qualifying speed. In comes then Gregor Fiskin out of second place. So up to second goes the Aston Martin of Adrian Wilmot. Up to third goes John Young. And in there is Gregor Fiskin to give way to Marino Franchitti. Remember, it's a two-minute pit stop, so the cars do sit there for a long time. It makes the pit stops much safer, in a sense. There isn't the freneticism, which means that things can go wrong or belts can not be done properly or get in the way of anybody else coming in. It's all a bit more controlled with this pit in to pit out time. And also, it's a good way of policing. You can't really uh, police how long the car stops at its pit box for, but you can police from the timing loops, two minutes from line to line. Very much so. And most of these cars will have pretty straightforward stopwatches taped to the steering wheels. And it's up to the shots <laughs> we see. A wheel on the grass there from Nick Mason. Um, so most of the stopwatches will be fixed in the steering wheel and the driver has to remember as he turns into the pit lane, crosses that timing line to start it so that the incoming driver can watch it as he's being strapped in, gauge the time it would take him to drive up to the end of the pit lane and they'll pull away with something like five seconds to go before two minutes is up and manage their speed accordingly down pit lane within the speed limit, of course, so that they don't cross the exit line too soon. Is the leader in this time? No, there was more arm twirling as more opposite lock was needed from Harvey Stanley, who is becoming very adept with this big cat, isn't he, as he goes across the line. Uh, so he's going to stay out seemingly to the end of the window here, building up the lead all the time. And let's see what James Cottingham's uh, job is going to be to preserve into stint two. In now comes John Young to give way to Jack Young, his son. And uh, James Cottingham there walks across the pit lane, so the stop is imminent. And of course, no radios in any of the cars. They'll all be receiving their instructions from the pit boards hung out over the pit wall. And James Cottingham will be directing those instructions. He knows that Harvey Stanley's got fantastic pace. He knows that the road ahead is clear. And it is absolutely the right thing to do to keep Harvey out as long as possible into the pit window. So John Young relays some Jack. There is Dario Franchitti coming through in Hans Hugenholtz's glorious Ferrari. But, uh, howls its way up towards the timing line and meantime it is nine seconds between Harvey Stanley and Adrian Wilmot for the lead. Now this is Marino Franchitti versus Rob Huff. This is a battle to savour, is it not? And this is for position now as well. So uh, Franchitti Jr. versus uh, Huff in the E-Type. Franchitti Minor, I suppose I should say. Uh, going up now towards St Mary's. So the Gregor Fiskin car versus Richard Mines car, but now with the guns for hire behind the wheel. 
Wow, talk about being thrown, thrown right into the deep end, out of the pit lane and into the thick of a battle like this. Two world-class professionals at the wheel of each of those cars and in comes Harvey Stanley, our leader, to hand over to James Cottingham. So down the pit lane comes the race leading car, sideways Huffy tries to find the gap to get past Marino Franchitti then as the two of them run absolutely nose to tail out of Lambert, the leader into the pits and also that will give another lap to Adrian Wilmot, he will inherit the race lead, now what can he do as he lined up for a go on the inside line, they go down towards Woodcut, we look elsewhere and charging Dario Franchitti coming up behind Mick Padmore in Ed Foster's MGB, yes Huffy did go through, so out of sight he's done it, he's got the move and he got the job done. So Rob Huff gave place at the expense of Marino Franchitti. Of course, that safety car to an extent helped this car as well, didn't it? Because it meant that Rob didn't have as much time to make up in stint two. Well, remember, of course, from the grid, from the qualifying session, the Huff car definitely had the legs on the Franchitti number one E-type behind it in terms of raw pace. And I wonder if Marino just took a bit of a strategic personal decision there, thinking, you know what? I can either hold up both of us back by getting overly defensive or I can just gently let him by unimpeded on the straight and get my head down and just concentrate on extracting the most pace from my own car as I can until I check a flag. And this was the overtake, this was the move where Rob Huff lined it up beautifully. In fairness, Marino Franchitti he gave him racing room, didn't they? Up the inside went Rob Huff and the new Scandinavian Absolutely. touring car champion got the job done nicely. Yeah, that's what I mean. There wasn't really any need or any decision to defend at all there from Marino and I think he just he knew the inevitable was coming and it makes more sense to get it out of the way get it done so that he can just have a clean run get his head down bang in the lap time so the stops cycle through James Cottingham gets aboard quick wipe of the windscreen so where is his battle going to come when he rejoins is it going to be against Rob Huff can Huffy get close enough because of course he hasn't qualified Cottingham car, not by Mark, but he did. And the two minutes coming towards the end as James sits patently, gets a thumbs up. So he will come out in the lead, but it's going to be interesting to see whether Huffy can close that gap as away goes Cottingham now. To the chicane comes Huff. So really? He's up to speed, isn't he? Sorry, I was just going to say, what spectacular driving star from Rob Huff. He's not afraid of getting that car totally sideways. Let's just start looking out of the side windows to navigate his trajectory if he carries on like that. Well, he's just done the fastest lap of the race. This is game on. Uh, Rob Huff, 1 minute 30.029. Up now to the fastest lap of the race as the sunset shot there. Look at that wonderful pictures here from Goodwood Speed Week. Fastest car on track. Rob Huff setting off now in pursuit of James Cottingham. James fresh into the car. Rob has done a couple of laps, so he's into his stride. And this is the car that he's chasing. So this is building up nicely. Well, a long way ahead, though, isn't he? A good, what, a good corner or two. Yeah. Just looking in the back of our shot there to see if we... There he is. There's Rob Huff in the background coming out of St Mary's just as James Cottingham is turning into Lavin. That is quite a gap, but if Huffy keeps up the sort of pace that he's just set at 30.0, he could be on the back of the leading E-type within a couple of laps. Tyres howling in protest then as Rob Huff terrorises tyres through Lavin corner. Behind him in third place then, number one, which is now Marino Franchitti. And we've got just under 90 minutes of the race to go as the cars here come down now towards Woodcut corner. Stunning sunset here, descending over Goodwood. Now, as lovely as that is for us watching, it's a nightmare for the drivers when they come out of Madgwick. They're blinded by the sun all the way up to Fordwater and through it. The fastest corner on the circuit, effectively blinded by the sunlight. Steering activity here. Who are we riding on board with? Charlie March, I think, in number 9 E type, has taken over, has he not, from Mark Gordon. So this is the car in 20th place. Down the gear, turns in. Charlie's got his work cut out, hanging on to that E type. Woo! Oh, that's like hard work. Yeah. Something else that's great about this, you look at what's going on in the car. The, 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 Yes, there are dials and switches, but also there's the key and the key fob there as well, isn't it? Never mind these electric starters. So Adrian Wilmot, this is the leading car, the Aston Martin, but it's yet to stop. Another lap will be completed, but is it going to be done in the pits this time or on track? Because the window is, of course, ticking down. So it's in the rest duration. How much of the pit, pit window is left? Uh, it, it opened at 17.39, so 17.59 should be the close, and it's 17.50 on the time of day clock. So we've got plenty of time. Yeah. 
So uh, another four or five laps, maybe. And Adrian, I think, is the quicker of the two, in fairness, out of him and Tom Alexander. So uh, from this team's point of view, yes, keep him out there. Keep the laps are coming. Now, the gap between James Cottingham and Rob Huff last time was 5.2 seconds. And Rob Huff was considerably quicker because, of course, James had had a standing start from the pit lane. So we'll need to see at the end of the next lap what the fly lap times are like. James Cottingham has just got over the line and done a 131.2 and Rob Huff has done another fastest lap at 129.9 so the gap is four seconds between what are really first and second out of those that have made the pit stops. There is Rob Huff. He still could win this race. No doubt at all. All he needs is another three or four laps and he'll be right on the back of Cottingham. However, if Cottingham catches any traffic whatsoever that holds him back, Huff will be right there to capitalise. So the back markers are going to play a part of all of this, so it's the natural pace of Rob Huff. Uh, further back, Pat Blakeney Edwards is up into fifth place on the road now, ahead of Jack Tetley. Dario Franchitti is seventh, and Marino Franchitti, of course, still a holding family honour in fourth overall. But it remains James Cottingham, who lost out in the first sector of this lap to the tune of three tenths of a second. Yeah, the gap is coming down and down and down and down. Rob Huff has got a race win in his sights here really has, flicking that E-type around beautifully. You'll just notice as he loads up the car, he gives a flick of turn in, and then he has to correct it a little bit, get the rear sliding, pivot the car in toward the apex, and then when he unloads the front end, comes off the brake, that's when a quick waft of understeer will set in. Easily neutralized, of course, by a big boot of the right foot. So Rob, who lives in Dubai these days, has been racing in the Scandinavian Touring Car Championship, uh, which he's won these last few months. And uh, now back in the UK, his uh, father here to cheer him on. Peter himself, a, a racer in MGBs many years ago. Over the timing line, what's the gap between them? Two and a half seconds. So it is getting closer and closer and closer all the while between these two as Huffy continues to charge on behind James Cotting. And meantime, Adrian Wilmot still leads on the road and still yet to make a pit stop. And behind the battle of Cottingham and Huff is Marino Franchitti keeping a watching brief, isn't he? Yeah. His pace very good as well in low 31s at the moment, just at a 30.8 earlier on. Huff has just taken half a second out of Cottingham in the first sector alone, and both of them lapping quicker now than Adrian Wilmot. So even though the Aston leads on the road, and yes, I you, has to make a pit stop, they're still catching in real terms anyway. Huff just getting a little impeded on the run into lab and there as they pass the short wheelbase. I think might be is that Dario's car? It might have been possibly, yes. Number one there is the Marino Frank Kitty E type. Still putting on. I wonder if we'll give a little wave to brother Dario as he comes by. Let's see, there's the car that's leading on the road. Uh, still to make its pit stop, Adrian Wilmot goes through and there was a board but uh, Adrian has still got five minutes left before he really has to panic about pitting. Now, lower down the order there, look, is number seven uh, E-Type, which is now Sam Torn off the wheel of it. Uh, how is Ollie Brown Phil Heen's car doing? It's still only in eighth place, so even the uh, lifeline of the safety car hasn't really helped him, has it? Yeah, I'm fascinated to know what kind of mechanical gremlins they've been struggling with. Chassis-wise, it looked OK. It seemed to have perhaps a lack of power for some reason. It's very leggy on the straights. Now, the gap between Cottingham and Huff is 1.3 seconds. So, there they are. It's not going to be long, is it, before we have this change between the two of them, I think, for the race lead. Rob Huff on the limit, and he's hunting down James Cottingham. So, the uh, difference in terms of a lap time for the grip was only a tenth over one flying lap. But the pace that Huff has got, lap after lap after lap, is bringing him closer and closer all the time. But also, now, we're getting quite a lot of cars under investigation for a short pit stop and one of them is James Cottingham's car, one of them is Ollie Bryant's car, one of them is Rob Huff's car. So all of a sudden the battle for the lead, yes it might get lively on track but the officials could be applying penalties post race, let's see. Well that could play, play beautifully into the hands of the Fisk and Franchiti E-type. Air race number not under the list of those being investigated by the stewards for short pit stop, meaning that they exited the pit lane before two minutes from the moment that they entered it. And the penalty that you get is double the shortfall. So if you were under by five seconds, for example, you get ten added to your race time. 
So it could be interesting to see by what people were under, if indeed that is uh, what it is. But we'll uh, await confirmation then as the race goes on on track. The gap between the two effectively leading E-types, 1.4 seconds. Huff closing there onto the tail of James Cottingham. Ironic that in a sense, that that's number 36 e E-type should be one that is being looked at because we'd seen on board, hadn't we, the fuzz up from James as the team was preparing to release him. It's ever so hard for the drivers to judge though because once you're released, if you exit your pit sort of box, as it were, just a little too soon, unless you stand on the brakes right before the end, it's hard to judge exactly when the clock is going to strike two minutes. True enough. So it can come back and bite you, can't it, as uh, there James Cottingham presses on. So again, part of the interest now is going to be where number five, Aston, blends back in after its pit lock. And indeed, whether any penalties are going to give that another life before the very end. So Huff, what he can do for the moment is just drive flat out, see if there is a penalty looming, whether that can be overcome before the very end. We've only got 11 more minutes to go. So Tom Alexander, actually, if he's not as quick as Adrian Wilmot, doesn't have that many laps to worry about, does he? He's not going to lose too much time over his stint because it will not be a very long stint after all. Well, actually, the one in the pound seats is Marino Franchitti, isn't he? Because if the two cars ahead of him, Cottingham and Huff, do, do both get penalised, they might come out roughly where they are now in relation to one another. Meanwhile, that will release Franchitti. So there the line goes Adrian Wilmot. Yet another lap ticked off for him. So look back to the race leaders, the real race leaders. Cottingham and Half go through. Now, of course, they're a lap down because of the uh, need to have served their pit stops. On the leader, glowing brakes now on James Cottingham. Oh, just a bad to his woes. Yeah, he's going to need to watch that because we've still got a good 10 minutes of the race to go. Bright, bright red disc, still bright red, long after the corner, and with a very high-speed airflow going through them as they run up through Ford Water. That pedal is going to be getting very long, particularly on that heavy stop down into Woodcut Corner at the end of the straight. So this car may find itself uh, in the lead of the race once penalties are applied. It depends, A, if there are penalties coming and to what extent. If it's only a second or two, then it isn't going to help it. But if it's more draconian than that, then it will. So we'll have to find out post-race. And uh, there is Dario Franchitti, still behind his brother, of course. And uh, we'll wait and see where that car is going to be when penalties are applied, if indeed they are recovered. Still under investigation at the moment, of course. So Adrian Wilmot leads on the road but has yet to serve the pit stop. He's lapping a good three seconds a lap slower at the moment than James Cottingham and Rob Haas. So the car in real terms is going to be dropping down the order anyway, no matter what Tom Alexander does in that second stint. So just under nine and a half minutes of the race to go. Hopefully the news on these short pit stops will be given to us within the next five minutes because we're keen to know who has got what, if there are any penalties, and what that's going to do to the race order. So down they come into Woodcut. There is number 14, Dario Franchitti, fifth at the moment, and being chased by the 4.2 litre. And you can't have the 4.7 in the pre 63 set. It's got to be the 4.2 litre engine uh, in the uh, AC Cobra, and that's Pat Leighton Edwards at the wheel of it now. Yep, Leighton Edwards looks close in on the short wheelbase of Franchitti, but funny enough, both Franchitti, I was just thinking, driving their respective cars beautifully. Beautifully, particularly Marino in the E-type, but absolutely perfect as he came through the right and then the left of St Mary's, everything looking very poised and under control. Now, where in all of this is the race leader on the road? Because the pit window is going to close in 20 seconds time. So if that Aston has not yet gone in by uh, the time we get to 56 seconds, going to look perilous for them here. They could get a penalty for not pitting within the window. There's the E-type battle, which is about to go, I suspect, the way of Rob Huff, as they now come down towards Woodcut Corner. So hard on the brakes. Rob getting closer and closer. His brakes looking pretty orange as well but here is the Aston and I reckon they missed the window because the pit window was closed Close. yes it's closed and the car's not in so they missed it penalty will come the Aston Martin arrives a lap late unbelievable they had all that time there's the sign there's the confirmation of it so yeah not only did they have the time but it was almost superfluous keeping the car out because it was losing time anyway against the leaders so Tom Alexander will get in but I'm afraid chaps you've come in a lap late 
Not sure what the penalty is, but it, I guess it's going to be pretty heavy. It's a very clearly defined regulation. Meanwhile, I'm worried about those glowing brake discs on the two now leading E-types, particularly those of James Cottingham, because they've been glowing bright red the full length of the lap, the past few laps. These didn't look that much better, to be honest, as they jostled for position down into Woodcut. Great to rejoin that battle. Has he got ahead? No, he hasn't. James Cottingham still leads now that the Wilmot car has pitted, or at least it will do when they come across the timing line. Look at those front brake discs on the E-type, on the leading E-type, I should say. So through the traffic then goes number 36, James Cottingham. What have we got left in the race? Just under seven minutes. So Rob Huff has done the really hard yards here, hasn't he? He's gone onto the back of the leading car. Now, what can he do uh, about finding a way past James? Cottingham, even if he's caught, certainly knows how to defend. There's also the traffic up the road. Look, because number 42, they're the Lotus Elite of uh, now Richard Bradley, sports car star, is the next one to be negotiated. That ex uh, Peter Jot, Harry Stiller, Peter Arundel, Lotus Elite. There it is, looking delectable in its Lotus livery. The uh, green and yellow comes up towards the line, but what's the gap going to be between the two E types? Nothing at all, virtually now. So they will put themselves into first and second before any potential penalties. Through they go, the gap half a second now between the pair. It's probably when, not if, half goes through. Yeah, the little elite just getting between them now. That will give James Cottingham some breathing space, but expect Rob Huff to close that down very quickly. He wastes no time getting past the elite, tightening his line just a little bit on the way out of Madwick. That will compromise his current speed now through the flat-out run of Fordwater. Say flat out, depends how much those tyres are screaming. Five minutes to go in this hour long race. Particularly the rear tyres on all of these cars get looked extremely hard. We just see sadly in the background the stricken car of our former race leader Gary Pearson. And half there through the traffic, has the inside again, the glowing brakes on the leading E type. James Cottingham still ahead as they all wag a wheel in the air. Back onto the power, they just put a lap on Santoroff there in number seven as the cars now accelerate down then towards Lavin. But you've got first and second then with a Damocletian investigation. The car that's third is 12 seconds back, but depending on any penalties coming these cars' way, might find itself benefiting out of all of that. Let us see. The car that's fifth didn't stop within the pit window, so there's trouble looming there as well. Quite a lot for the officials to sort out, either post-race or in the remaining five minutes as here now, out of the chicane, Rob Huff again tries to mount the challenge, but interesting, isn't it, the way that he was able to bring the gap down and down and down and down, lap after lap after lap, but now he's got a bit stuck. He's just under a second adrift of James Cottingham. They dive through on the inside of the traffic, that lovely long shot as the cars round Madwick, but Huffy can't quite get close enough yet, admittedly, to make a move. Well, James Cottingham, full of courage on the brakes there as he went up the inside past the back marker. Got a little bit twitchy at the back end of the car, nearly ran out of road, but got it turned beautifully, rotated fully and hard on the power, reopened that gap to half as they exited Majwick. Dario Franchitti now in, in nice, clean air in the short wheelbase Ferrari, fourth overall at the moment. Don't think he's in sight of his brother Marino, one position ahead, currently in the E-type in third. Yeah, his last lap was a 31.6, so he's still lapping quicker than the Cobra. There it is, that gap seven seconds. So I think Dario is going to be safe. Pat Lakey Edwards pushing on as ever he does, of course. Marino Frank hit his last lap was a personal best in third spot, number one uh, E type that he took over from Gregor Fiskin. So three and three quarter minutes are still to run. There is the number 65 Cobra. It's 4.2, not 4.7 litre Cabare in mind under the regulations for the pre 63 uh, GT race that we have. Right, there is Huff, his front brakes looking as though they would quite like a breather as well. And he's inching up once more onto the tail of James Cottingham as they come now up towards the completion of the lap. Cottingham doing a fantastic job out ahead. I don't know how he's managing to keep this pace up, given just how bright and red those brake discs are. Surely the pedal is going long, surely the brake fade is severe. But you'd never have guessed it looking at the way he's going. He's managing to keep none other than Rob Huff at bay, or at least he is for now. Huff decisive in the back marker traffic, straight up the inside into Ford Water. That was a hole created by James Cottingham. Rob Huff taking full advantage. Has the advantage now on momentum into no name. Cottingham going defensive. Huff up the inside. Cottingham not afraid to turn it. 
in and chop the nose off of the fitted Cooper behind. Fantastic. So Rob Huff now throwing everything at this. He's done the catching and he's got a bit bored being sat there behind James Cottingham. The traffic gave him an opportunity. He wasn't able to take advantage of it, but Cottingham now really feeling the pressure. He slides the car out of lap then. So the uh, E-types battling still tied together. 0.166 of a second was the margin at that last sector. And actually in a straight line, does Cottingham just get away a little bit? That car just seems to be able to stretch its legs ever so slightly. But the last of the late breakers, Rob Huff, look, will come back at him as they head into Woodcut. They're going to be able to squeeze just about two more laps out of this as there Cottingham comes through. But you can see how the gap has come down out of Woodcut now towards the chicane. And again, look, under braking, Rob Huff gets right up behind the back of the leading E-type then. So the gap much reduced. It was nine tenths at the start of the lap as they come through now to put 34 in the book. The gap is under half a second. Another back marker. They've got the traffic and they've got the fading light to contend with as a round magic they go. So Rob Huff knowing that he's running out of time in the race. They can possibly squeeze one more lap in at the end of this, but he's got to hustle on just in case. Seeing a general pattern emerge between these two drivers. Rob Huff seems to be a little quicker on corner entry, but James Cottingham, neater, tidier, gets it all sorted out sooner on the apex. He's a little bit quicker out, which is why we're seeing the gap between them extend as they go down the straights. Now, this was the part of the circuit a lap ago where he was very committed in his so again at St Mary's there, trying to get his nose up the inside, couldn't do it. Slides towards lap and then over rise over the brow again. Rob Huff's E-type barely in a straight line, more glowing brakes on the Cottingham car, more noticeable than on Rob Huff's second place. Number 12 E-type then as they accelerate out of lap corner onto Lavin straight down to Woodcut less than a minute to go so fingers crossed it will not need a flag this time we can squeeze one more lap out of it which will be bad news possibly for James Cottingham maybe good news for Rob Huff and again on that section of circuit the gap does widen a touch between the two of them but what about under braking here comes half a gap comes down and down and down and down and down and he's right on the tail of Cottingham is there a chance to challenge as they come into the chicane James just about gets the car on the right line defense from Huff who's always quick through here so 20 seconds on the clock now up towards the line they come it's James Cottingham just hanging on to the advantage as they power their way across the line and the gap as they start the last lap is 0.2 of a second and here comes Huff sideways under braking tries the outside line still can't do it no he had to break harder than he had anticipated which is why the tail snapped wide James Cottingham I think now finally having to nurse his brakes braking a little earlier a little softer a longer braking zone for Cottingham now, if he can pull just enough of a gap through this back side of the circuit, he might be able to defend down into Woodcut at the end of the straight. But Huffy tries to go around the outside on the marbles. Cottingham sees it coming, lets the car drift wide to close the door into the left hand of St Mary's. And let's see whether or not they're going to encounter any traffic on this lap as well. If Huff, if they are, there are back markers ahead. Now, don't forget, Huff tends to lose out in a straight line here, but he's so, so good on the brakes. If he's able to stay right on the back of Cottingham now, he builds up for a chance then. So, the flag will be out this time. It is the last lap of the Sterling Moss Memorial Trophy. It is James Cottingham versus Rob Huff. Cottingham looking in his mirrors. He does get away in a straight line, but there are back markers up the road. Is that going to help or hinder? Let's see as they come down to Woodcut. The light is fading. The gap is diminishing between the top two as well. Cottingham tries to get up the inside of Woodcut. Is the back marker going to see him coming? Yes, Rob Huff tries to commit. Which does he go? Rob dives up the inside. Cottingham has got through. Huff gets through as well. It's going to be a drag to the line, but James Cottingham has just done enough, has he? Yes, he has. It is going to be a Sterling Moss Memorial Trophy win for James Cottingham and Harvey Stanley ahead of Rob Huff and Richard Mines. What a battle. Absolutely stunning driving from both of them, but what a drive from James Cottingham. Set up, of course, by an outstanding first stint from Harvey Stanley. Phenomenal stuff, particularly in the challenging circumstances with that glowing brake disc. I mean, that pedal must have been pressing right to the floor. Very, very numb indeed. James managing that beautifully. Now, of course, what we don't yet have an answer to is any penalties. That's still being looked at by the officials. There are quite a lot to work through. So let's see, because the top two are 13 seconds ahead of 
Verino Franchitti and Gregor Fiskin in third place, Hans Hugenholtz and Dario Franchitti in fourth, but it depends what the penalty is. It's not necessarily given that it will be the same for each car, of course, because it's double what you were under on the short form on that pit stop. So we have to wait confirmation from the officials as to what the penalties are and what that does to the result. So provisionally, we say James Cottingham and Harvey Stanley are the winners. It would be a shame if they didn't keep the win because they really did, the pair of them, drive beautifully. Yeah, they really deserve it. That was absolutely outstanding motor racing and just flashing away on the timing screen now is what we expect to car five under investigation for a late pit stop. That, of course, is the Aid Wilmot, Tom Alexander, Aston Martin, which we saw pit just a little too late after the window had closed. Yeah, and if you pit after the window under the regs, by the way, it's a 30 second penalty, so that would cost that car. So we'll await confirmation uh, in due course once the officials have been able to go through all the data and uh, confirm the result. But provisionally, we say it's a win for James Cottingham and Harvey Stanley, which concludes, therefore, the track activity for today at the Goodwood Speed Week, presented by Mastercard. We're back on track at 10 past 8 in the morning, but we'll have a chance, first of all, to hear from our race winners at the end of uh, a really entertaining race. So as the cars make their way to the pit lane, Marino, Frank, Kitty and Gregor Fiskin provisionally in third place. But there with the two models of both PK ready for them are James Cottingham and Harvey Stanley. And James gets out of the car, Rob Huff. Likewise, uh, well done, they say to each other. They both, you can tell, really enjoyed that fight. Yeah, stunning drive from both of them, I have to say. But we still wait with bated breath. So we understand that the penalties being applied uh, aren't going to affect the results. So uh, it is, therefore, we understand from race control, going to remain the same order. James Cottingham, Harvey Stanley, ahead of Richard Mines and uh, Rob Huff. That's what we're being told. So uh, that's the good news that it won't affect what we had seen on track. Oh. Now let's go and uh, try and hear from our winning drivers because the drivers are there. Holly Pettit is down there as well, ready to have a word with the winners. Here we are down in the winner's area and we're going to catch up with James Cottingham. What an incredible race. <laughs> James, come on in, come on in. Congratulations, winner of an incredible race. What was that like? Uh, well, Rob kept me very honest at the end. So all I had in my head was one toy car driver in the mirror has got to keep it there. How did that come? in the end those brakes were red hot it's uh, it's our second race for the car since um full restoration we only built bought it last year from america and it's like as a race state so hats off to the boys uh, 10 minutes before the race we weren't running because we couldn't get it to start and we had problems so like you know a big thank you to all the guys that worked flat out for the last 20 minutes to get it to the grid so couldn't have given them a better result i guess that is job well done we've got to bring in harvey stanley as well congratulations well done. Well done, mate. What and was course, it like to well, watch the race drive. there in the end? Uh, the start was pretty hectic, and then uh, following Gary, obviously, I saw that unfold, which was <laughs> shook me up a bit, and then we got back on with it and gave James the hard bit to do. Well done, boys. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Well done, mate. So good. So delighted, Harvey Stanley and James Cottingham. And uh, you could tell that was a hard fight that both of them had. Interesting, wasn't it, the way that the race panned out. Harvey Stanley was applying the pressure, doing the chasing, and it was James that was the uh, hunted in that second stint by Rob Huff. But uh, Rob, as ever, showing his capability, hustling on in the E-Type. So let's have a look at results then of the Sterling Moss Memorial Trophy. And it is Harvey Stanley and James Cottingham who are victorious ahead of Richard Mines and Rob Huff. With third, go away of Gregor Fiskin and Marino Franchitti. Fourth, Hans Hugenholtz and Marino and uh, Dario Franchitti. Fifth, Mike Grant Peterkin and Pat Blakeney Edwards. And sixth, going the way of Jack Mayton and uh, sorry Nick Mayton and Jack Tetley. Others to pick out: the Youngs in 14th, and uh, the Ollie Bryant, Phil Keen E-Type coming home in seventh place. Well, uh, what a great way to end the day. The first ever Sir Sterling Moss Memorial Trophy. <sighs> Blimey, that was incident packed, wasn't it? <laughs> fruity, <laughs> fruity. Anyone thinks these guys don't get, uh, you know, the sheep stations out? That's an Australian term, mate. Yeah. It's serious because there was big contact in the race. Yeah. And um, thankfully, they all got yeah. out.
Yeah, safely. But, but you said there'll be definitely be tension in the paddock tonight. There could be. I reckon the gloves will be on, mate, or maybe gloves will be off. Yeah. But um, a lot of damage, unfortunately. These cars are beautiful. To so yeah, see that much damage sure. being done with a small misjudgment, um, nasty. Can we take a moment? I don't know where you guys were, but on the track earlier, when uh, Knopfler played and then the Duke did the speech, but the, when, the, when, when we played the VT, the, the tribute to Sir Sterling, it oh. was, you could hear a pin drop. It was the quietest mm. it's been. And I looked around, it's a really, really special moment. You, mm. I mean, you, you obviously knew it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was, um, well, first of all, there's no surprise that you know, the Duke of Richmond put that together incredibly well. Yeah. Uh, the grounds, as you say, were you could hear a pin drop. Um, Sir Sterling Moss was a fabric of this uh, track. Uh, he ended his career here with the injuries that he had in, in I think it was 62 and he just went on to continue to be a British icon uh, he was yeah that swagger um, and even you know someone like Sir Jackie Stewart I mean both here they are both knighted they're both you know, they transcended their sport and for Jackie to talk like he does about Sir Sterling like you know he's like a little oh, Sir Sterling mm. Moss was absolute real McCoy, and um, you know I learned some really good words off him, uh, which aren't repeatable. But uh, <laughs> he was a he was a, a gladiator, a warrior, um, and special, special guy. Real class act as well. But this, I mean, that no one has a bad word to say about him. No, and um, you know he was he was he had so much energy, mate. Like you know, even right up till the end, he was still going to functions. He was cruising around. He was in pop up, and and he had his little he had his like little pole with a little cute little seat that he'd sort of sit on because his back was completely second hand and he would just sort of sit on that and tell the stories and everyone was always around him you know you just had that sort of you know the presence that he had was yeah. was phenomenal yeah all right on to tomorrow what have we got planned <laughs> rory what are you up to Tomorrow, I'm, I think, first of all, I'm looking forward to adding to my very impressive collection of uh, <laughs> like Glastonbury over there. Yeah. <laughs> Access all areas over here. It's all kicking off. But yeah, I think for me, it's all about kind of the Bentley show tomorrow. It's going to be past, present and future of Bentley. So looking at the old Bentley blower and also they've got this incredible EXE 100 concept Bentley from the future with these enormous butterfly style doors and a lot of high tech components that are just not in any car that we see today, all electric. You driven it yet? Or have you, you no saw? one's driven it, no one's driven it. It's completely like concept based. So I, I'm looking forward to actually getting up close and personal with it and, and seeing what the technology is all about and how it can actually benefit the next generation of cars that are coming out in the next sort of 20, 30 years. Cause yeah. that's how advanced this thing is. See, I'm, what, Sean, I hear rumors of a jetpack. <laughs> Yeah, I you wish they would. We were promised jetpacks. <laughs> Where are they? You I have them you, tomorrow. I wish it wasn't true. I had jet engines attached to my arms <laughs> in some sort of Iron Man meets Neil Armstrong vibe. Yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> You will see what happened and uh, whether I was good or utterly terrible. I'm still with us. So. I'm still with you. I'm in one piece. <laughs> They're real arms. Yeah. <laughs> so it can't be, it wasn't it can't too be that bad. bad. It's all right. Heels, uh, and, heels and jet packs. Oh, yeah. Oh, do it in style. Of course, well, man. Good, yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Take him off the team. That's very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Cracking day in Prospect. We start streaming live at 10. We're on ITV tomorrow, not ITV4 from 2. Uh, make sure you're in pole position on your sofa and we will see you then. Good night.
Jarvis Mini that bounced into the barriers at the chicane and was ultimately collected by Olivier Hart's Alpha Romeo. Qualifying also entertaining for the Sterling Moss Memorial Trophy as the session cycled through both drivers and it was E-types to the fore in readiness for the final race of the day. The Whitson Trophy was also a good fight between the Lola T70s and the Ford GT40s. Mike Whittaker coming out on top. The Glover Trophy was a race, again, with plenty of drama and plenty of entertainment. Simon Diffin, for example, working hard behind the wheel. We had our Jaguar fight on track with David Gandhi in the XK120.